dear colleagues, dear colleagues and friends, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's my huge pleasure in a difficult time to officially open the uh, Balkan Endovascular course 2021. We started yesterday already with uh, very, very important topics. And uh, it's uh, really my pleasure and honor in this time to have the possibility to be once again together. What I mean together? The uh, International Society of Endovascular Specialists and also our local endovascular society is unifying the efforts of people with different specialties. The multidisciplinary collaboration is the main target of uh, this society. And uh, it was uh, our idea since the beginning, together with uh, Professor Velchev and uh, Professor Chervenkov, when we uh, were organizing our local endovascular society, to sit together and to work together in order to improve the prognosis of patients with very complex vascular and cardiovascular diseases. In fact, our course is part of this strategy. And this is the main target. The main target is to spread information, to spread uh, methods of treatment, new modalities, to have uh, a hands-on session, live cases like yesterday, uh, very interesting cases. And uh, today, Today is a similar program and also tomorrow. Once again, I will uh, remind you that uh, all, the, all the sessions and also the live cases are, uh, uh, have a streaming in the uh, page of the, of the Congress, backmeeting.com, without registration, without payment, free of charge. So please feel free to spread uh, this amount, uh, your friends, uh, your colleagues, in order uh, more people to have the possibility to look at the presentations in this hybrid uh, situation Congress. Uh, I would like to give uh, the word uh, uh, to uh, Professor Jack Busquet, who is the founder. He is, uh, in fact, he is the pioneer of building the Society of Endovascular uh, Specialists. Jack, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have some slides for you today, and I must take the slides, please, Laba. Can you put the slide on? Are you ready? Okay. It's a pleasure to be again with you. I must. Uh, give my admiration of you and also Victor next month in uh, Bucharest to have the courage to do this uh, meeting again with all the difficulties we had in the world. And you show a good spirit and you will work for next year. Next year, everybody will be again with you. So it's a pleasure to celebrate the cooperation between our society and the back in Sofia of Dr. Petrov. We met Dr. Dietrich together like 15 years ago, and uh, we had a, a good time together. The next uh, slide, please, if this is working. Right. Dr. Dietrich, maybe all of you know this uh, gentleman. He was an innovative surgeon with an endovascular vision, and he was an international master. He did the inauguration of your clinic, Ivo. You remember? Exactly. Unfortunately, he was uh, defeated by uh, brain cancer, probably in use by the radio so be very careful of you, women and men, protect yourself in the room. This society is a marvelous story because it was created in my place as early as October 1992. 
and uh, with the presence of many of the pioneers. And it was immediately successful, and uh, we had a very good time, and a very good uh, uh, diffusion of this spirit, international spirit, and co cooperative spirit, as you told. This is uh, my first meeting in my place, together with the Arizona Arts Institute. We were so young, so brave, so good, and we bring all that to you now. Some young guys in 2008 in Phoenix, Arizona, you see some, some friends that you recognize easy. The president from Edward Dietrich to Crasher and now Alan Lumsen, president of the Houston Methodist uh, vascular, cardiovascular surgery. You know maybe this guy from his work, Alan Lumsen, especially on robotics, especially on uh, very good modern technical, surgical, and radiological technique, Alain Lundsen. So, a nice panel of uh, people, all friends, connected with the members. Rodney, Julio, that maybe you remember, you, maybe you remember his name, <laughs> and the goals especially oriented to the younger generation. It was a multi-international, multi multi-countries diffusion. And uh, at that time, India, Cliff Buckley was president. He unfortunately died also. So it was a big loss for us. He fell down from his bed, a very sad death, and he didn't uh, subsist. We miss him very much too. This is Dr. Kana. Ivo and Victor have been there several times. No good to be there right now. We wait for next year. And uh, we had some Lifetime Achievement Award. I think it was too early for me to be honored, but uh, by the way, I did accept it anyway. And uh, in uh, 2015 in Paris, you were there, friends? Yes. We celebrate the last meeting of Dr. Dietrich. It was, it, he was still in good shape, and me too. This is the meeting. The journal, I incite you to, to be a member of the journal. It's a high-level journal recognized by every people involved in the, as an endovascular specialist with a very strong uh, reviewer and uh, one of the three best journals of endovascular technique. So membership is still open, mostly uh, multidisciplinary, as you told. And in conclusion, remember the spirit that brings us today together, the multidisciplinary specificity. Uh, Victor is a cardiac surgeon. You are a cardiologist, and I am a cardiovascular surgeon. And you are a vascular specialist. And we are at the international level. Thank you very much. Jack, Victor, please. Uh, Professor Kostaki is the co-chairman of the local Balkan chapter of uh, our society. Thank you for your invitation, uh, Ivo. It's always a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Sofia, and I want to congratulate you for the organization and for, for um, having such a great uh, meeting in such a difficult time. And uh, everything is uh, thank, uh, thanks to the ISCVS, 
which is uh, the only international society that brings uh, people together, that brings, as Dr. Busquet says, brings together interventional cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, cardiovascular surgeons, vascular surgeons, and um, interventional radiologists. Dr. Dietrich was a successful cardiovascular surgeon, and uh, he reinvented and uh, he was an absolute pioneer in everything that's uh, endovascular. And uh, this society is about friendship and solidarity. And uh, solidarity, I think, is the most important principle uh, to bring us together and to make us survive and be better in these difficult times. Thank you for uh, inviting me here, Ivo. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> Professor Velchev. welcome you to Sofia on our important meeting and uh, also uh, those who will share the screen with us. Welcome. We are happy that we are able to gather together in these difficult times and uh, I guess if you uh, choose a style of music what you get is jazz. And if you choose uh, different specialities I hope what we get is an excellence. So I hope for a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Professor Chervenkov. I would like also to welcome everybody to, <clears throat> uh, to this uh, 2021 BEC meeting. Um, <clears throat> our Society of Vascular and Endovascular uh, Surgery is a uh, co-partner of uh, the organization committee, and I believe this uh, BEC meeting will be very successful as always. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you as you see, uh, we were the speakers uh, from uh, uh, several different specialties, and uh, uh, I mentioned already. In fact, here in the room and during the the program, uh, I have calculated that people from seven specialties will speak, will present, and will bring to the to this uh, very important course. So it's my huge pleasure to be once again together, physically and online. This is the time. So we have to survive and we have to um, do all our best to help our very, very complex patients and very, very complex cases. Thank you once again. Stay safe and good luck. Thank you. The Congress, the Congress is open. So we are starting with uh, the first uh, session. It's uh, dedicated uh, to one of the biggest killers of uh, our days, societies all over the world, and this is stroke. And we have here, as panelists, locally, physically, one of the most prominent pioneers of the endovascular treatment of, uh, of stroke. So it's my pleasure to have uh, Professor Iris Grunwald and Professor Klaus Matthias as uh, co-moderators. So, floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Yes, dear colleagues, we want to go into the scientific program and I ask Veselin Jergiev to give his talk about fibrinolytic therapy, the Bulgarian experience. Good morning. I'm Veselin Gurgiev from St. Anna Hospital, Sofia. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'll present you our experience in intravenous thrombolysis in the biggest stroke center in Bulgaria, St. Anna, Sofia. Intravenous thrombolysis is still the, the only proven specific medical treatment for ischemic stroke. This kind of treatment has been approved in 1996 in USA in 2002 in Europe and in 2005 in Bulgaria. Is it true? For the answer, we turn to our result after treatment with or without thrombolysis in the last five years. The assessment is made by NIC score. We can see that the percentage of people that went home walking after thrombolysis is much higher from the other group. 
The number of bedridden patients at discharge is much higher in the group treated without IVT. The mortality rate remains the same in both groups. So, IV thrombolysis remains the only proven medical treatment for reducing disability caused by acute ischemic stroke. Here, we can see the number of patients that received IVT in Bulgaria. For the last two years, around 1,000 thrombolysis were made per year. On the next slide, we have shown the percentage of the thrombolyzed patient from all ischemic strokes in Bulgaria for the last five years. It's a good sign that the percentage is steadily rising through the years, but now is little over two percentage. It is still too low, especially compared to the European average of 70 percentage. The European Stroke Organization recommends at least five percentage of all strokes to receive IVT. So why the most efficient medical treatment for ischemic stroke is so rare? We have three major limitations for performing this kind of treatment. First, and one of the major is the narrow time window. We can treat the patient with IVT only in the first 14 and a half hours from symptoms onset. Second, there are, there are a lot of exclusion criteria for this treatment. And third, and the most important, is the need of well-organized stroke center operating 24-7. Why the time is so, is so important and why the treatment of acute ischemic stroke is based on the paradigm time is brain? As you can see, only one of four and a half men will have fully recovery when they receive IV thrombolysis in the first 90 minutes from symptoms onset, one of nine between 19 minutes and three hours, and only one of 14 will be in good health if it thrombolyzes between third and the fourth and a half hour. Therefore, if we want better results, we have to act fast. Plenty of contraindications have to be excluded as soon as possible. The stroke physician has to decide to do or not to do based on the information from the CT, blood work, medical history, and neurological examination data. Only then he will know if he can do it. That's why it's critical to have a well-organized stroke team with the support of the emergency room, imaging department, and clinical laboratory. Here you can see our stamp for every medical documentation on acute ischemic stroke patient potentially eligible for IVT. When you are imaging, when you are managing with a life-threatening disease, it always is crucial to have the support of other specialties. And even things are not going according to the plan, you need the endovascular therapist, the intensive care physician, and physiotherapist. What have we succeed in our stroke center with our team? We try to stop the time, and each year we do it better. For the last year, our average door to needle time is 35 minutes. Over 80% of ischemic stroke patients receive IV thrombolysis in the first hour. The other 20% of patients needed additional examination like CT angiography, CT perfusion, repeating of the blood test results, etc. On this graph, we are showing all, all of the strokes and IV thrombolysis managed in our department for the last year. Uh, excuse me. Here you can see the number of IV thrombolysis and strokes. On the top is the percentage of acute ischemic stroke patients received IVT. Even in pandemic times, the COVID-19 era, in our hospital, we are trying to give the best possible chance for better life to every patient. As you can see, the percentage of, of IVT is even greater in 2020. So what is our, what is our place in Bulgaria? In 2020, over 42,000 patients with stroke were hospitalized throughout the country and just little over 2% were admitted in St. Anna Sofia. This put us in fourth place according to the number of treated strokes. 
But in spite of that, every third IV thrombosis has been done in our center, making us the leaders. When we look at the same parameters just for Svalsvia, during the same year, 5,752 strokes were registered. 18% from which were treated in Saitana. And as you can see, we have done 70% of all IV thrombolysis in the city. While we are happy to be in this place, first, we are constantly trying to, Im to improve ourselves, and second, to rise the overall IVT percentage in Bulgaria. We are welcoming and encouraging every site ready for the challenge of being a stroke center. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And congratulations for this impressive data. Uh, I've seen that the number of lysis declined a little bit in the year 2000. Is that due to COVID-19 or is that that you started to do more thrombectomies and not only uh, lysis? No. Uh, during the COVID and the whole number of strokes were going down and uh, so, so it's the influence of the pandemic. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? You. I would have one more question. What is your process for the patients with unknown time window? Wake up strokes. Um, what is your process there? Do you decide based on imaging? Yes. Uh, most uh, most of the time, uh, we're trying to perform a CT perfusion, or if when is this is impossible, um, CT is enough if, if we don't see uh, the marked ischemic zone, um, we try. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. this impressive data and the huge number of patients you are treating. That's very impressive. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any questions from the audience? If not, then um, I would ask our next speaker um, to come. It is um, uh, Larisa Ivanov, and he's going to talk about a topic very much discussed at the moment, um, bridging therapy versus mechanical thrombectomy. Thank you. We're excited to hear your talk. Dear faculty, honorable faculty, dear colleagues, my name is Lachezar Ivanov. I am a part of the Neuro International team in St. Anne Hospital. Oh, excuse me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, to Professor Petrov for arranging such spectacular events where we can share our, our experience through the years. Uh, so, uh, Mechanical thrombectomy in Bulgaria, bridging versus direct mechanical thrombectomy. Importance of stroke. Stroke is a social problem. It leads to severe invalidization. It's the third cause uh, in the population of developing countries, developed countries. Due to this social importance, in last decades, we are becoming witnesses of briefly increase of interne interventional procedures for treating of strokes. Uh, what is the situation in Bulgaria? Uh, we saw the, the number of strokes. It's quite persistent, uh, excluding last year, of course. Uh, the number of fibrinolysis uh, is, is increasing uh, during the years. Uh, as uh, the number of uh, mechanical thrombectomies. Uh, last year, we saw 20% decrease of, uh, of number of strokes. We, we have commented that. Uh, it's because COVID, maybe. Uh, but the decrease of uh, MTs is uh, about 6%. Uh, in St. Anne Hospital, we haven't registered any decrease last year. Materials from the beginning of February, 
2017. Uh, till now, 99 patients have been enrolled. 64% males, uh, 11 patients with uh, strokes in vertebral basilar system, 36 internal carotid artery, 50 middle cerebral artery, 80%, 18% tandem occlusions. This is the next, the next uh, presentation. We, we can comment it. Average NIC score, 18 points. Uh, what is the situation in, in the world? Uh, large meta-analysis comparing uh, different methods of recanalization uh, from, sp excuse me, for spontaneous recanalization is 24%. Uh, with mechanical thrombectomy, we can achieve 90% uh, recanalization. The other methods uh, are between these these numbers. Our experience, 30% uh, recanalization with uh, intravenous thromb thrombolysis, intraarterial 67%, with bridging therapy 100%, and direct thrombectomy 19%. Uh, timing. What is the situation in the world? Uh, big, uh, big trail uh, published in annual neurology uh, journal. Uh, oh, 20, uh, two, 2,000 patients were enrolled. Increased time of intravenous thrombolysis, thrombolysis to start of, uh, of endovascular thrombectomy is associated with worse functional, functional outcome at 19 days, uh, lower ch chance of uh, reperfusion, and increased probability of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. Our experience, door to growing time in bridging therapy two hours, the direct thrombectomy, one hour. Same rate of mortality, but a little bit uh, better results in direct thrombectomy. Uh, mechanical thrombectomy is approved, rescue option in lack of successive, successive fibrinolysis. First choice, met, first choice method of reperfusion therapy is still disputable. Uh, we need more data from multi multicentric randomized trials. Shortening of time to intervention is one of the main goals because time is brain. Really, questions pending, we, we have to find the answers. Thank you. Uh, and Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Question to you. Um, do you always try to do thrombolysis first or in patients where you can go directly to the cath lab do you then and you open the vessel, do you then stop thrombolysis if thrombolysis has not run through? Uh, what is your yes, approach? Yes, two-thirds two, two -third of, uh, of our uh, cases are bridging therapy. We, yes. The neurologist first start or start uh, with thrombolytic, and mm -hmm. uh, when they see no result, they transfer the, the patient. They don't uh, wait for the, the full dose of, of fibrin fibrinolytic. So it is giving thrombolysis and then immediately going on to thrombectomy? Yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That is, uh, that is an excellent approach because yeah. sometimes you will see right at the beginning some centers were waiting whether or not thrombolysis mm -hmm. would brain. work, we, so we this is an excellent approach going can't, directly can't there. It. I saw the high amount of time.
tandem occlusions that yes. you have in there, so that will already that lead to your issue. next topic, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are no other questions, um, I would ask you to tell us about your experience with tandem occlusions. Of course, with pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next. Thanks. Uh, tandem occlusions. Tandem occlusions is defined uh, by acute ischemic stroke. Uh, acute ischemic stroke with concomitant occlusive disease of the extracranial artery and concerned about 10% in the world. Endovascular treatment has shown its efficacy uh, by, a large vessel, by a large vessel occlusion, uh, but there is no consensus on on, on endovascular management of the extracranial carotid artery in tandem occlusion. Only few of them were included in previous randomized trials who evaluated mechanical thrombectomy uh, and were often listed in non-inclusion criteria. Materials, we saw this slide, 99%, 18% tandem occlusions. Case one, uh, 50, 58 years old male with left hemiparesis and left neglect syndrome, 20 points nix. We can see uh, the total occlusion of internal carotid artery, uh, break through the occlusion, this after dilation, and uh, we can see the, the thrombosis of middle uh, cerebral artery. After tr thrombectomy, side view, but we had reocclusion of uh, carotid artery, uh, so we implanted stent. Final result, side view. Case two, 35 years old male with quadriparesis and variable consciousness. Uh, Nick score 23 points. Uh, we can see uh, dissection of, of a right vertebral artery with uh, distal embolization, uh, distal access through dissection, uh, thrombosis of uh, right P1, thrombectomy, patient was discharged at six day without any neurological deficiency. Uh, endovascular therapy is the only way to treat tandem occlusions. It's effective and safe method. Results are depending, uh, depends on timing. And thank you for all your attention, some autumn flowers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, tandem um, occlusion is always a tricky topic because um, uh, if you have to place a stent, often the patients are not on any blood thinners, on any, any antiplatelet therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, so always the question, does one immediately place a stent, balloon angioplasty as well? Um, can you tell me about um, what is your um, antiplatelet regime and also your blood pressure management after the procedure? Uh, we, we start with uh, double anti antiplate therapy uh, for, for one month and mm -hmm. now uh, monotherapy we, we continue. Uh, and the second question... The blood pressure the blood, management. The, the blood pressure management. Mm -hmm. uh, our experience shows that uh, after the procedure, after recanalization, uh, the, blood, the blood pressure uh, often normalize. Often normalize. Uh, but uh, I'm a cardiologist and I, I'm not, I, I don't have uh, any uh, problems with uh, managing blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not a problem for our team. Mm -hmm. 
So um, what we usually do is after opening of the vessel in order to prevent reperfusion injury as well, reperfusion bleed, we sometimes then lower the blood pressure in addition. Are we? Um, because of the vasovagal reactions, mm -hmm. sometimes you already are lower, but if not... Yes, yes we, um, we, I, I, now I can't understand what, uh, what is the question. We avoid uh, dropping down the... the blood pressure, even we, uh, we don't use uh, anesthesia, anesthesia mm -hmm. uh, for that reason. Yes. We, we uh, treat patients with uh, only local, local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. a very similar management where at the beginning when the vessel is occluded, mm -hmm. we also oh. leave the blood pressure high. We sometimes push the blood pressure even higher if the blood pressure is sort of, say, 160. I would not lower a blood pressure um, if it's not above 220. And then the moment the vessel is open, we will lower the blood pressure, sometimes quite aggressively, um, to avoid the reperfusion hemorrhage. No, we, we, that, mm -hmm? uh, we, we saw several cases of, uh, of uh, bradycardia Yes. Uh, in such, in such yes. cases, but uh, dropping down the, the, the blood pressure is, is not so often. Mm -hmm. Klaus, how is it? In yes, bradycardia is due to the stimulation of the carotid body normally. Mm -hmm. And we do the same, we keep the blood pressure high up in the range of 160 systolic pressure or above uh, before we open the artery to have more collateral blood flow to the tissue in danger. And afterwards, I go down to 100 to 120 uh, systolic pressure because the patient isn't the bad. Uh, he will not have a problem that the blood pressure is too low. Uh, and we have that uh, risk reduced that we get some hemorrhage, some brain hemorrhage later on. So that is the same. Yes, more or less this. And from method. the management, as you yeah. were saying, if we have to put a stent in the acute phase, we, would, we have IV aspirin available as antiplatelet, and it takes about 10 minutes to work if you give it IV. Mm -hmm. So usually we would try giving IV aspirin before the intervention, even if the patient has had thrombolysis. I suppose that's what you were yes, mentioning yes, before, we, yes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very important topic. The yeah. important thing is tandem occlusion is not seldom. It is quite often, it is a reality. Yes. Yes, yep, indeed, this see, is one, see, one mm -hmm. percent of, fifth, of yes. five. Yes, exactly. it's also an, a complication of carotid artery disease. So you have a tight stenosis, perhaps not detected. Then you get an occlusion, and some of the material ends embolized in the brain arteries. Yeah. Uh, Iris, uh, could I ask you a question? Yes. It's uh, more for you, because you mentioned already the uh, IV aspirin. Yes. Uh, in several instances of label, we have used the aspirin intra-arterially with impressive results. Yes. And uh, even uh, since uh, several weeks, we, had, uh, we had, had a case of a colleague of ours having a stroke during, during the job on the work, workplace. So uh, we, we did, uh, did uh, intra-arterially fibrinolysis and uh, small doses of uh, intra-arterial aspirin, and uh, the result was, was impressive. Mm -hmm. I, would be cautious what, what with, yeah. I would be cautious with using intra-arterial aspirin because you get the aspirin in a pulver form, you shake it, you try and dissolve it, but actually if you look at it, there are very small particles still there. And um, if you then look at the WI, um, there is a very big risk of these particles also causing blockage. The question is, is it sufficient um, to receive an antiplatelet function? That you can test, and with the IV, as we're managing to lower it, um, that is why I would be very cautious with using intra aspirin. I'm not saying it didn't work, but I would be cautious, um, and uh, I would then go for other uh, things. So um, we are pre-treat pre So um, if aspirin. the patient comes in and I know already that it's a carotid occlusion or the moment I see it, I will tell the team, please draw up 500 milligram IV aspirin and we give the aspirin on the table 
so that within uh, that uh, after that the stent is already in. So if it's extracranial, I would not wait for antiplatelet therapy to for the 10 minutes to have worked for intracranial. Um, I am more cautious because we know how quickly intracranial vessels can block. Um, there I would check. Um, sometimes we would also use um, clopidogrel, which you then have to crush, difficult, put through the yeah. nasogastric tube. If you go via that approach, it takes about three hours for the um, platelet function to be down. So right. we have stats um, opening the vessel, keeping it open before placing the intracranial stent for three hours before we then placed it. Please tell us, uh, in this context, uh, uh, there is a huge discussion about heparin. Heparin not at all. Heparin only in the saline for, uh, uh, for in, into the saline to, to purge yes. the, the, the devices or heparin full doses for full heparin, heparinization. There are different opinions, uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, proofs or no proofs. What is your protocol? Mm -hmm. So you will find very strong opinions, but very little evidence there. Exactly, yeah, this so, is the problem. So um, what um, uh, I find in our cases is that it is sufficient to have heparin in the flushes. So we use uh, 5,000 units of heparin in one liter bag. And um, if I do see clotting and clotting occurs, that is when we react and that is where we give additional heparin to the patient. You can do it under ACT control or otherwise you give 5,000 for um, uh, average 5,000 looking at the weight. Um, but otherwise we hardly see clotting. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, so I think it is sufficient to just have it in the flushes, but be prepared and always diligent. One big help or tool is if each syringe, um, uh, I do not dispose them where I cannot see what is there. I want to see if there's clot forming. So each syringe after we aspirate it is dispelled on a white gauze. And if there are any pieces in there, mm -hmm. that is react heparin. Yeah, great, Can thank you. Small comment? Yes, please. Yes. I uh, agree very much with you, Professor Petrov, and also with Iris. Intravenous aspirin is great. We use it, unfortunately, in Bulgaria. It's not everywhere readily available. Yes. And that is why we also, also in not only in stroke, but also in yes. um, other procedures, we have to use clopidogrel or brilic uh, yes. with aspirin preoperatively, which uh, makes it difficult sometimes if we're in an emergency situation, we need to use uh, IV antiplatelets. It's a problematic situation, but yes. uh, IV antiplatelets obviously save lives. So I think that it's, uh, the, the important thing is to have it readily. Uh, in Bulgaria, it's not available um, in, yes. in our hospitals. So this is a yes. problem for us, obviously, in many patients. That's why I think also the colleagues uh, in most cases are using uh, clopidogrel or aspirin or if the patient is resistant, Brilic with, uh, with aspirin uh, yes. through the nasogastro yes. tube. The, yeah. the problem with Reopro, Apsizumab, GP2B3A yeah. inhibitors, yeah. is that um, if you start giving it, so sometimes yeah. we think, oh, let's just give a little bit, actually yeah. that has a paradoxical yeah. effect yeah, sure. doing that, so you have to give, if you decide to go yeah. that way, you'd have to go the whole dose, and yeah. obviously in patients with an acute stroke, probably thrombolysis, yeah. you would want to Absolutely. avoid that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, I want only to thank you again for your presentations. Yes, thank very you. informative. And we go on in the program. And so it is now my pleasure, yes, <laughs> to ask my co moderator <laughs> to give a talk. <laughs> No, actually, um, I'm going oh, to, I'm, I'm Anna, really right pleased to, to be oh, yeah, that um, is, uh... <laughs> introducing Dr. Anna Podlasek from the University of Nottingham. And um, she is going to present um, the data and the analysis that you did, the meta-analysis on um, whether we should use balloon-guided catheter um, in, uh, versus non-balloon-guided catheter in mechanical thrombectomy. Very big debate about interventionless balloon, yes or no? <laughs> yes, this is a big topic. So first of all, welcome everyone. And big thank you to uh, Professor Petrov for uh, bringing us back together again, all of us uh, in, this, in Sofia. And it's good to be back in Sofia. So um, the work, the meta-analysis that we did is on balloon guide catheters, but it was very humbling to observe the whole revolution in this endovascular stroke treatment that happened since 2015. Uh, there is a lot of 
uh, small questions in this big equation of how to achieve a good outcome and successful reperfusion. And we have a multiple techniques that can help us to revascularize the vessels. There are three main techniques that um, I want us to be aware of. So the first one is the stent retriever. When we put a retrievable stent into the vessel, the clot is engaged in there and then we retrieve it mechanically. The other technique is aspiration when we just go with a little vacuum cleaner to the vessel and we just take the clot out. And then there is something which is initially was called cell umbra technique, but it's also called combined technique, and there are a lot of variation uh, as a protect and a lot of variation in this technique, which there are both uses of aspiration and stent retriever. So on top of those three ways of taking the clot out, the next addition to our equation is the balloon guide catheter, um, which is uh, just a small balloon that is uh, pumped up in the moment that we are taking the clot out. It is just for a couple of seconds, and uh, it is hypothesized that it offers a proximal flow arrest if placed in the internal carotid artery. And it's supposed to decrease the chance of clot disruption and making sure that all the particles are coming back to us, to the catheter, and uh, we are getting all of this. Um, it works perfectly in the models, but in the human studies, it has inconsistent evidence. Some studies say it's better, some say that there is no difference. Obviously, there are certain limitations uh, with this big guiding catheter. Uh, it's much harder to navigate uh, through vessels so with this uh, big catheter and not all of the devices are compatible. And also now when the radial axis is gaining uh, a lot of interest in mechanical thrombectomy, balloon guide catheter use is quite limited due to the size. However, there are also appearing new players on the market that could enable that. So what we did is that we had a proper look into the literature to see what is currently known. And not only on the balloon guide catheters, but in the context of the technique as a first line technique that was used in the particular procedure. So we've reviewed um, quite uh, almost 9,000 studies. That was a long, long time that we sat in front of the computer. But in the end, we found 16 studies. None of them was randomized, so they were all uh, observational studies or registries. And um, out of 5,500 patients, we looked at those who had procedure with balloon or without balloon, uh, with stent retriever first approach, combined approach, or aspiration. And um, unfortunately, the bias in the study is that the vast majority of this uh, observational study had a moderate bias uh, due to the non-randomized nature. And uh, this is the biggest summary. So whenever you can see the arrow, it means that, yay, we have statistical significance, so uh, the evidence can be trusted. Um, wherever you can see NA, it means that there was no enough data to tell anything. And with minuses, uh, there is no statistical significance. So we can see that overall, when we are looking at balloon guide catheter, it gives us everything for us to achieve better clinical outcomes and less mortality. So from the procedural point of view, we have a higher fast effect, we have higher successful reperfusion rate, which is ticket to B23, and shorter procedural time, shorter number of passes, and shorter distal or new territory emboli. And we can see that this uh, is mainly driven by the stand retrievers. And the evidence in, combined asp in uh, contact aspiration and combined technique is not that, uh, not that obvious yet. So just looking a little bit uh, in more details in the successful reperfusion, we can see that a standard reverse uh, gives us a clear, clear benefit as well as aspiration. But for the combined technique, uh, we don't have yet the evidence. It is the question, does it, does it work or is it just not simply powered enough? Uh, because the numbers for the combined technique is a little bit lower than the others. Also, the first pass effect, which was um, defined as a ticket to be to free with the first pass achieved, uh, is also better with the uh, balloon gate catheter. It goes the same also, so it's good to see that those procedural features are translating into the long-term clinical outcomes. It was assessed always at three months, uh, so good clinical outcomes, functional independence. 
and there are also lower rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages and uh, lower mortality. So, as I mentioned previously, there are certain limitations to the interpretation of this data. So, uh, the studies are mainly non-randomized non studies. We are still waiting for the first study to really randomize balloon versus non-balloon guide catheters. And there were a little bit of difference in the baseline statistics, um, a little bit of different diseases. Um, there's also a big question in this could be where the clot was. Was it a tandem occlusion? Was it not a tandem occlusion? And the re results were not reported by the SODA analysis for that was impossible. And also, uh, not a lot of study commented upon where the balloon was placed and how well was it inflated. And there is impossible assessment of distal embolization. So, in conclusion, as far as we are at this stage, balloon guide catheters achieve shorter procedural time, and all of this, it uh, goes to the better clinical outcome. Thank you for your attention, and any questions? Does the morphology of the thrombus on your preoperative CT or MRI play a role in your choice whether you would use a, a balloon guided catheter or not? For example, especially in, in, in bridging therapy, it's known that if you have a red thrombus, you have a dense media sign, and you have thrombolysis first, and then you start doing thrombectomy, it's known that the thrombus is uh, smashing into small pieces, and then if you don't have a balloon, the risk is higher, did you? Do you, did that, that play a role in your... That is an excellent question. I think it is the new topic um, to go towards, I'll call it precision medicine in patients, mm. to not, so that we can at the beginning already choose the right technique and the right um, device. Um, as a very simplified way, it seems that if you have a hyperdense MCA, mm. that this is a clot that is more thrombus-rich, yeah. uh, so more red thrombus. Yeah. And with the red thrombus, it is also then that is more likely that you will be able to get it out in one go, but also that is more likely that you'll have more distal emboli and things that will yeah, flow in the periphery. Um, whereas with the white clot, with the white thrombus, it is more sticky, more um, gooey, um, it will more stay together. Um, so, um, I, uh, I think, uh, and uh, I know that the group in Buffalo at Nancy Dickey, they were also looking at a new feature. They are looking at um, uh, the contrast-enhanced angio in an early and in a late phase. And if there's already some contrast going into the vessel, they see that the vessel is, uh, that the thrombus is more permeable, so more towards red thrombus. So, um, <coughs> If I had the choice, I would, so uh, first of all, I do believe that using the balloon guide will achieve better results using a balloon catheter. So ideally, one would use it in most cases. If I didn't have the choice, I would use it in the red clot, <laughs> where I would yeah. think that it is much more likely um, that something is going to uh, lodge off, yes. But yeah. In the future, that is going to be a really good topic of research, um, also with MR, what is the clot composition. Um, I don't know if you've seen it as well with COVID, the clots were quite different, yeah, very different composition of clot in those patients, very sticky, very difficult to get out in one go. Sometimes we now use sort of tweezer devices to pull it out. Um, so, yes. Also, Thank like you. you, I use balloon in all cases. And a balloon, I would say, so um, I would be uh, a bit cautious because one thing we have to consider is many of those studies when there was comparison were done by very, very experienced centers like the center in Essen, René Chapeau, um, yeah, so very big volume centers, um, <clears throat> gods of intervention. <laughs> and um, uh, sometimes in the beginning, it is more difficult getting an eight French guide up. So I think we will need to make a decision on what does does the arch look like? Absolutely. If we do not manage to succeed and get into the vessel, it is no use sure. yeah, trying with that. I think we need a sensible approach. And, um, and Anna, if I could ask you another question that is about, um, do you think that new techniques, like you were showing the Salambra technique, where you can bring a five or six French aspiration catheter um, right up to the thrombus, do you think, um, did you find anything on that? Do you think that will change 
the way we perceive it? So uh, at the moment, there's no evidence for combined technique and use of balloon guide catheters, most probably mm -hmm. due to the low numbers. Um, but there are planned uh, randomized trials in this aspect to have a look whether the inflation of the balloon uh, will work or not will um, lead one in Nottingham. So hopefully we'll have some uh, evidence in over the next one or two years. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and you, Iris, have already pointed out there might be some problems. Yes, first type 3 or the gauges to bring up the device. Then I only want to mention, yes, you have to place the balloon in the internal carotid artery, not in the common, because when it's in the common, you do aspiration. Absolutely. You get only the blood from the external carotid artery. That's also important. And when you have a very elongated nice case, no? carotid yes, artery, uh, especially internal be, carotid artery, it's not so easy ten, ten. to place the balloon. So when it's not possible technically, so, then you have to go on uh, without the balloon protection. Yeah, but uh, it's really very helpful to have the balloon because you have then easily an under pressure. The patient might also react because when you pull out too much blood in a too short time, yeah, then he has no blood left in his brain. And also that is uh, something which you have to consider. Yeah? So, uh, so don't be too aggressive with too much blood pulling out. Okay. Perfect. So, I think the life case. Ah, this is just some of those things. Dr. Alowski, Dr. Petrov. Hello, Nikki. <laughs> Could we continue the discussion in English? <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> and it's possible to, to show my slides for this case? Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Ivanov will show a short presentation of the case yes. that uh, is being prepared. And after, and after that, I will show my, my case. I think they're already... Hmm? my solution. <laughs> they're already almost in position, I will see, so, yeah. Nice. Hi, do Hi Dr. Nelioski. Uh, live session, case number one. Presentation. Uh, uh, microphone. 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 Ah. Please. Yes. Fifty years old female patient without concomitant conditions. Con conditions. Uh, 2018 survived spontaneous uh, subarachnoidal hemorrhage. Small blister-like aneurysm was found on internal carotid artery. Next year, uh, it was followed through the repetitive imaging. Uh, in the last imaging, a slight dimension increase uh, was registered. Uh, Last month, she received small rebleed with light headache. Uh, we took decision for intervention uh, after vascular spasm resolution. Uh, situ angle images, uh, small aneurysm, uh, different angle views. And uh, DSA. So, Dr. Olewski is, is next. Okay. Hi, guys from the Audis. Uh, I'm Dr. Olewski from St. Anna Hospital. By me is uh, Mikhail Petrov from uh, Pyrogov, and from neurology department is uh, Teddy Sikalarova. Uh, I can show you my work from CAT lab till now. We are from with the right femoral approach with six French distal access catheter, uh, envoy distal access catheter. We do 3D angiography, and after that we are with a with a penon and a vigo into the middle cerebral artery. I can discuss about the solution to treat this aneurysm. 
first of all, it's uh, maybe just coiling. Second one, it's uh, balloon remodeling or stent lamp remodeling technique. But if you see in the on 3D images, we see that this aneurysm actually is a bike aneurysm, and from the fungus of aneurysm, it started the uh, PCOM. And for this reason, we decide to put the flow diverter. I'm now going to the uh, M1 segment with uh, phenol, and after that, we, we will use flow diverter pipeline, shield technique, Four, four, four point five. Four point five. Four point five to sixteen. Small open. Now I I wait for to to washing the the system and mm -hmm. now we are ready to to put the flow diverter. Can you tell us whether what antiplatelet regime you use and whether you test for efficiency? Yes. Of course that we are test. Uh, we t uh, the patient is on the clopidogrel and aspirin, and in regular we tested every patient before the placement of stand. Because that we we all know that we have a. a 20% of resistance of the top of the well. Now, here is the stand. It is the resheetable stand. We can resheet it if we need to have a better placement of the stand. Now I think that it's much, much better, but it's not still open. It. I will wait a couple of seconds and to do massage of the stand. Come on. Now, I think that it's open. Now it's much, much better. The stand is a little bit longer. Okay, now it's fully open. Okay, I will place it now. Okay, it's open. Okay. 
Here is the capture curl of the stand. Sorry. For any case, it's okay to stay with a microcatheter in below to the stand because if you need to put telescopic uh, uh, way second device it's okay to have a approach control and here okay we can do we will do uh 3d angiography i can show you the flag, oh, it's, here is the stand. Okay, let's do the 3D. If there are any questions from, from the audience, we are able to, to answer, please welcome. Who is the fellow? more to not put any coils in beforehand uh, did you want to preserve the PCOM or um, what was the rationale did you say you explained it earlier on uh, actually uh, the, from the from the fundus of the algorithm it's become PICOM and if we put the coils we will occlude PICOM okay this is the reason main <laughs> reason why we, we why we choose flow diverter Fantastic. And probably could you explain to the audience um, uh, now the different grading? It's not like the Raymond Roy scale for an aneurysm to be occluded with coils. We expect not to see anything with flow diverters. This is different. Um, how is your follow-up? Do you do MR imaging regarding looking if the aneurysm occludes over time? To the for the first year, we prefer uh, to do trix tri tri protocol or with MRI angiography, and on the first year we do we do conventional angiography. Of course, the uh, conventional angiography is the best way to to see the shrinking of the aneurysm and to see the flow into the uh, parent vessel. But for the first follow-up, we prefer to do uh, MRI. Yes, MRI with contrast is the best um, way of doing that here because um, it is the only way to see if there's real shrinkage in the DSA angio. We are often misled. There's thrombus formation, some thrombus formation inside. Um, uh, and again, it is very important in the MR. We often see the arterial phase. So with the aneurysms that we treat with a flow diverter, what we want to avoid is that there's still a jet inflow because sometimes, especially in the large aneurysms, the only thing that holds the aneurysm together, there isn't even an elastica wall anymore, but it is just the thrombus. So if you now shift the flow that goes in, suddenly, because of the pressure, the thrombus disappears, and then we have this terrible complication of a late rupture, a day later, two days later. So what we have to avoid in the arterial phase to see if there's a jet inflow where we can see it, and we're actually looking at those, ane uh, those aneurysms not in the conventional way, but in the venous phase. And the best follow-up to really see if there's something is with the MR in these cases, okay. whereas the other gold standard in our conventional aneurysms would be the DSA. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Awesome. So it means we do not need to be worried if we still see aneurysm. Of course. Uh, in regular, we, we no. put a uh, couple of curls in giant uh, aneurysm uh, to avoid delayed rupture. But in, any, uh, in this case, it's not necessary to put something because the aneurysm uh, is small, but she has a second bleeding before to, to three weeks, I think. And this is the main reason for the treatment. 
would you ever consider coiling first and then putting an additional um, uh, flow diverter or stent? Of course, that in the acid phase, I would prefer to do it, uh, to do uh, mm -hmm. um, only coiling, and after that to, to discuss about the uh, treatment with fog diverter or something else. But first choice policy uh, for our case is uh, uh, coiling. And would you tell the audience something about the technique of deploying the flow diverter, push and pull technique? You were talking about massaging, um, so it's completely different to deploying a conventional intracranial stent. Would you tell us something about that technique? Uh, this technique is to, to, to have a good... Uh, Actually, uh, on the uh, control 3D angio, we will see the stagnation on, on the aneurysm. Uh, if it's possible to see, uh, this is the, uh, the, the massage of the, of the stents we do to, to have a, uh, bi a little bit bigger density of the, of the stent uh, uh, below to the aneurysm. And this is the reason to do it. Uh, how can I say, massage of the stand to, to, to have a, a good opening and to have a little bit big, more density of the struts to the aneurysm. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why I do the massage of the stand. Thank you. And I would be very interested to see a venous phase. Sorry, I don't uh, but hear. Today, an in, I would be very interested to see an injection which shows ah. us the venous phase, where hopefully we will see stagnation already of contrast. I see on 3D because no. I, 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 I'm already out from the uh, uh, intracranial approach. Sorry. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Perfect. Very, very nice case. Um, is this the only aneurysm? And um, what triggered the treatment now? No, she, she will be wait. Uh, it, uh, she will be. Uh, she will go in ICU for yes. 24 hours, and after that in the our neurosurgical uh, department. Fantastic. And um, at the beginning, you showed us that the aneurysm. Um, was uh, two by two, when it first ruptured, it was about two by two millimeters, and it had then been seen as three by three millimeters. Is that what triggered the decision to now go for treatment, the change? Do you treat aneurysms when they change their shape? Uh, Is that yes, a trigger? Yes, but in this, in this particular case, the... Uh, the, 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 the uh, she she have a, a new bleeding before three three weeks. Oh, this I is see. the main reason for the treatment. In in regular, I don't treat small aneurysm. I I I, I, I follow up the patient, and if we have a grind of the aneurysm, and after that we decide to to treat it. Great. Thank you very much. We can probably then in the aneurysm session also talk about which aneurysms are more likely to rupture and vessel wall imaging. But I think this was a really good case. You did the procedure in general anesthesia, which, yes. which I personally believe is very important for any intracranial complex procedures. Um, because if something happened, we do want the patient to stay still here um, and to not lose access. Um, you also had the possibility, if you had needed to go distally or if there had been an occlusion, um, to still keep the access. I think that's the main point in these procedures, um, so that we would be able to pass the stent again to deal with anything that happens more distally, or in some cases, if a second flow diverter would need to be placed. Excellent, very nice. Iris, yes? sorry. Uh, now we will have uh, an, uh, another one case yes. uh, after one hour, and yes. I will show the uh, uh, recognized aneurysm uh, that it's treated before uh, oh, it's two years, two years. Yeah. and now we will plan to, to put the whole device. They want to show it now? No, another case. In one hour. Okay. In one hour. Okay. And 
we can discuss the next question after one hour. But, well, thank you very much. It would be interesting. Okay, <laughs> thank you bye. very much. Well done. Bye. <laughs>、yeah, so. um, how to save time is the next topic. Yes,、yeah, so、it is Anna or you. you. How to save you. time. Okay, so now I can announce my co moderator.、Thank、and she changed、much. the title of her talk. It's not bridging therapy. We already heard a presentation about that theme, but she will talk how to save time because time matters so very much in a huge stroke. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, we changed the type, title、um, to, to not have two similar topics in here. Um, I think, especially,、um, first of all, thank you so much for again organizing this meeting. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here.、Um, I think this is one of the most important meetings because we really have the possibility to learn from each other, from the different、uh, specialities. There are very few meetings like this. And,、um, I thought,、uh, uh, as we're all together, it would be good to also share our experience on how we can save time because we know time is brain、um, and work together as a team. And、um, I have recently just changed my、um, uh, post.、I've, we're now setting up a stroke thrombectomy service in Scotland, where there are also quite big distances. So patients are coming from as far as the Shetland Islands, they're flown over. Thank you very much. Just to have an impression on the centre. Thank you very much. So, what is different in our setups is that, for example, the last centre that we set up was done in a pure cardiology centre. So, it was not the typical neuroradiologists that are performing the procedure, but we did that together by teaching our、um, interventional cardiology team how to perform thrombectomies. Um, and set up the service. Here now we're doing it、um, in a team of interventional radiologists、um, where there was previously no neuroradiological service available.、Um, I do have a conflict,、uh, these are my disclosures, and the most relevant、um, conflict of interest is that I'm co founder of Brainomics, an AI, AI company that automatically detects stroke and is a decision guidance tool, which I will mention in here. Um, now, if we look at the pathway, so basically every hospital, whether they have a thrombectomy service or not, will have, the patients will have to follow this pathway. And what we need to look at is whether in, where in each step we can save time. Now, if we start with the pre hospital phase here, so we have pre hospital phase, patient has to be evaluated, we need the imaging, primary treatment, thrombectomy, and then also rehabilitation, supportive treatment, intensive care unit, blood pressure management. Now,、um, in the pre hospital phase, you can already save a lot of time. If you're setting up a service, consider already contact with the paramedics so that they pre alert you. So, what we have done is our, pra our paramedics will pre alert, they have a decked phone, not a decked phone because we don't have good network coverage everywhere. They will reach the stroke physician, and the stroke physician will ask, and they say, We think it is a stroke. And if they think this patient is a stroke,、um, we will ask them 
a, a school, which is the LAM school, Los Angeles Motor School, which is a very simple school which you can do over the phone. We have just introduced that score, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, just been published in the whole of the federal state of the Saarland with all paramedics, and we found a 70% sensitivity and specificity for detecting large vessel occlusion. So very important not for detecting stroke, not like with the FAST score, for large vessel occlusion. So first of all, um, there's this pre-screening by the paramedics, and we are now, um, as in uh, next thing in November, hoping that we'll also start with video conferencing with a dedicated um, uh, software um, uh, stroke communication tool where we can immediately see the patient do the examination as well. Um, this has shown in uh, previous publications to significantly reduce door-to-needle times. And um, the advantage is that here also the whole um, stroke team will immediately see where the patient is. They can contact, they can see on the map, for example, where the patient is moving, when will they arrive in the hospital. And you can also combine it with the images so that all the relevant information is inside. So um, with Pulsara, for example, you can also take screenshots of it. You can also put the um, contact details of a patient in if it's about consenting, getting more information. And you have different layers where you can get, okay, now it's confirmed it's a large vessel occlusion, now we get the thrombectomy team involved. So you have different layers. Also with us, we immediately get the result of the COVID test because up to now we have to treat everyone as COVID positive and it's quite uh, good to know, know the patient has not been tested positive and we don't need to don. Um, Another um, a part what we do is the moment um, uh, the patient comes um, is considered a stroke, we bypass A&E. And actually it has been shown that you can save the most times by bypassing these patients and do not let them go via A&E. So these patients are directed directly to the CT scanner. The CT team is pre-alerted and they are met at the scanner by the stroke team. Only the stroke patients or those that we think are a stroke. If the NIHS score is high, then automatically we have a pre-alert to the interventional team and to the um, anesthetist. The anesthetist will in the meantime see if there would be a bed available. You have a possibility with the NIHSS uh, NIH score to sort of triage how many patients you will have to cope with. The higher you put the score, the more likely it is that this is a large vessel occlusion patient. So if you have a score of 10 out of four patients, only one will have a large vessel occlusion. If you have a score of 20 out of four patients, three of them will have a large vessel occlusion. So you can choose more or less yourself whether you have how many false alerts you have. We have chosen a score at the moment of 10. And um, once we get more into it, we will reduce the score to six and that will then automatically already trigger the alert um, to the anesthetist and to the interventional team, and also the preparations in the cath lab, and we get phoned back, say there's this patient on the table right now, it's going to take this time, or we need to move to a different angio, and um, the team um, is already in alert to then be stood down in case the CT angio shows there is no large vessel occlusion. Point of care laboratories, blood examinations at the CT scanner, at the, uh, at the place of imaging, have been shown to halve door to therapy times in acute stroke in a study by Professor Silke Walter from the Saarland. And um, now the next question is what about artificial intelligence? How can that um, uh, help us in the image interpretation? Now, um, bear in mind that in our service, um, we now have sev several small hospitals where you will not have a neuroradiologist available, you will probably not even have a radiologist available all the time. So the question is, how do you find those patients, which are the patients to be transferred to the thrombectomy site, without having to be called for each patient, and without having to then dial in, look at the images, or do um, the decision? 
So um, this is where artificial intelligence software can help. Um, uh, there are some reports that it also reduces the door to go and puncture time here. A report from um, uh, uh, the University Hospital in Lübeck in the north of Germany or um, Semmelweis University in Budapest um, have introduced the software and uh, they also found higher rates of uh, thrombolysis, of thrombectomy and uh, shorter times. But I think the main advantage here for the software is that you have a standardized reporting um, of how much damage there already is on the brain. And I have moved completely away from a time window. When I'm asking about the patient, I do not even ask when was the onset of the stroke. I don't care. Because I've had patients who've come to me after one hour, they have no collaterals, there was already no brain left in these patients. Then there are patients after six hours, and there is still all the brain left because they have good collaterals. So I think the concept of the time window is out. We are now going towards a physiological time window, a brain um, window, and it's about the individual patient. I do think that the structured reporting helps us because very often you will find that if you see something, you think, okay, everything is affected, so you tend to overreact um, or you miss it. The structure forces you to look at the different areas in a structured way. Now, um, again, in the middle of the night, um, I'm not very good at looking at those images saying, what is this? I want the software. And I'm, uh, uh, when um, the physicians call me, and in order to survive um, uh, such a big service, because, yeah, there are quite a few patients that will come and quite a few requests, usually you will find in centers that are not used to thrombectomy that you have nine requests for one thrombectomy. And with training, you will get down to three or four requests to one real case. So it's not the 50 cases you'll have to deal with from a center, it's the 500 requests that you have to deal with. And with that, a software is very helpful. So in my previous center, we set the threshold, and I said, if the aspect score is below six, I do not want to see the patient, except if the patient is really young and there's a different situation. If the patient has no collaterals, I do not want to see the patient and that is because the transfer time was so long that I knew those patients would it, wouldn't make it. In our center, different scenario because we can start straight away. Um, the other thing is the detection of the vessel occlusion. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, I think, is uh, very important because getting someone to interpret the CT angios, especially out of hours, sometimes it needs bringing someone in to do a CT angio during the night, um, so um, there it helps as well. And um, what we have now uh, done is um, we have started looking at the hyperdense vessel, and this is now for the first time that the software can already do it. Um, and we would accept a patient to come on the basis of a hyperdense vessel identified here um, as a very likely case for an occlusion. Now, perfusion images. You will have heard um, that very often it's CT, CT angio, CT perfusion. We used to do the same, we've stopped doing it. So, um, whereas most centers with the dawn study and the extended time window have now started all adding perfusion, we've gone exactly the opposite way. Why? I'm still interested in the core infarct volume, but we can see the core infarct volume on the plain CT. Now, when you look at the dawn study, that also made the decision based on the core infarct volume, which was derived by the perfusion images. So if I can get that volume without needing a perfusion, I prefer that option. And um, there is also a big study that was done at uh, MY University where they look at the ischemic core volume. They looked at 479 patients um, that were all completely recanalized to TIMI 2 c or 3 and they um, compared it at the time to the RAPID software that was also used in the DAWN study to see 
is there a difference in the patients if we choose them from plain CT or if we choose them from perfusion CT? And um, there was no difference. Um, you could estimate the ischemic score volumes with a similar performance than in the CT perfusion. Here's an example. So it then shows you where the, infa the core infarct volume is, counts it together. And that is what I based my decision on, not just the infarct volume, but also the location where, it, where the... Um, deficit is where the dead area is. Now benefit can be faster, um, less radiation, and I can always repeat a perfusion scan either in our center or even on the ANGEO um, doing a DINA imaging. Trombectomy, is there any time we can save in thrombectomy? Here, you may have heard me talk about um, simulators before. Um, the simulators have now completely changed um, from being expensive toys to um, real medical devices where you can put patient data, CT angio, onto the simulator, you can practice the procedure, um, you have the same haptic feedback, you can do different devices, you can change the angulations. It's the perfect place to do team training with your team so that everyone understands their role. It's also a perfect rehearsal for learning um, the different steps of a procedure, but unfortunately you cannot inject do any injections, you cannot use all the real devices. Um, and the flushing is a main part of the training in thrombectomy. And that, I have to say, is the main reason why I decided to move to Scotland, um, because what um, they have developed there is a teal cadaveric model. So what you're seeing here is a human cadaver. It is the only place in the world where they have found a way of embalming the bodies, um, they are put into a special solution for over a year, which gets all the vessels, the blood out of the vessels, so the vessels are open, the cadavers are not stiff, yeah, you have um, the whole range of movement. Um, uh, we've just used it for um, placing a new heart valve, so you can even see the valves um, uh, moving. And it is, in my opinion, the most realistic way that we currently have on the market for, for doing and practicing actual um, procedures in here. You can use the real devices, you can do coiling of aneurysms, you can do thrombectomies, you can place intracranial stents, you can use the same flushing, the same devices, and that can give you the real experience before going there. So do we really need to learn on a patient? We cannot plan the procedure. No, um, is this the future? I believe this is the, the future for learning different kinds of procedures um, in the real patient. Um, and um, the first patients they gave me were two 98-year-old patients. It even works in a 98-year-old. It was as challenging. You can have the same complications as we could have with perforations, um, with dissections. The same things can happen. Um, uh, but, uh, and you can sort of choose for courses. We'd usually then take a younger patient. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, uh, one has to see it to realize what, cap what it is capable of. The other thing that I think is very useful is having occasional team trainings, um, where, for example, you can also film the team, where you see how everyone is reacting. It is just a refresher, where you then later on analyze what was done on the team, because in the procedure, everyone thinks, yes, we're doing the right thing. Um, after the procedure, everything is forgotten. You were so pleased how the patient is, you're worried about the patient. When you then go through the film, there are a lot of things where you can save, shave off time. Um, other thing um, is the one-stop shop. Uh, these images are courtesy to uh, Siemens. It is the possibility of doing a CT, um, a CT angio, and also a CT perfusion um, on the angio, on the angiographic table um, itself. Um, very, very useful if you need um, uh, to see how long do we continue. Difficult procedure, patient is already in a late time when they arrived with us, you don't know how long to continue, learning how to stop, also very challenging. Um, perfusion scan, how much brain are we still fighting for, how much is dead, helps you very much in the decision. You can also see if there are some areas that are at risk of hyperperfusion injury, that will change your blood pressure management. Here you can see how good the images have become, conventional CT versus the Dyna CT, um, so big difference here. Continuous auditing of times, absolutely essential. And um, then 
the ultimate thing, of course, for saving time, the mobile stroke ambulance, um, originally invented by Professor Fassbender in uh, Germany. Um, here, this is our UK mobile stroke ambulance inside a CT scanner with point of care laboratory inside, of course, with artificial intelligence. So I'm not on the ambulance anymore. I've taken myself off. We have telemedicine and um, the software to do the analysis. Um, so the ambulance um, can now run um, paramedic led. We still have a doctor on there, um, but um, that uh, uh, is, of course, for triaging of patients, especially now um, that there's also dwindling evidence for IV thrombolysis first. It is a way of selecting patients to bypass a center that is not thrombectomy capable and going directly to the thrombectomy capable center. There is sound with it. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? So you, thank you. have taught everybody how to behave to be yeah. fast enough. <laughs> Yeah, to it's, rescue it, brain cells. It's yeah. a shaving off minute by minute, yeah. and um, <clears throat> with um, and especially those simulated sessions. Trick is you need to move away from the hospital. It is not possible to do those training sessions in the hospital because someone is always bleeped. Yeah, you have to get away. Um, another trick is to change roles. Let um, your cath lab nurse take over the role of the operator and vice versa, to then critically question why each step of the procedure is done. So, for example, we do all, um, uh, not all, but most of the procedures under general anesthesia, mainly also because we've got a new team. We want the best working environment um, for this with a patient that is not moving. Um, and um, I think it also speeds up the actual intervention and um, time to intubate the patient. Or Actually, the time we're aiming for is eight minutes from CT to arterial puncture. That means working in parallel. So the patient is intubated in a fast, rapid intubation technique, no fluffing around, no arterial line. Yeah, just put the tubes in. Blood pressure um, of the patient pushed up if it's not too high, otherwise not lowered. And then immediately, whilst the patient, whilst they're still preparing the patient and the access, we're already preparing the groin, we're preparing the devices to go in in parallel. Um, and uh, so I think what you should aim for, aim for um, 10 minutes from decision to arterial puncture and try and shave off every minute. We are now not managing 10 minutes yet, but hopefully then next year, um, by then, we can improve the progress, take the team away, change roles, and practice the procedure. Good? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, and you can analyze in your uh, hospital all the steps. So uh, we, when we started that many years ago, yes, we documented all the times we needed until the patient was, yes on the table for thrombectomy, yes? And then you can improve it. Why did we need there five minutes or 10 minutes or even more, yes? So uh, and I think don't forget, one minute means nearly two million brain cells <laughs> yeah, which and, will die. And per six minutes delay, the patient has 1% lesser chance of a good outcome. Yeah. So, um, and uh, the patients aren't screaming, there's no blood squirting, so usually People do not see the sense of urgency, so you really need to bring that home. And the communication with the paramedics is crucial. 
And um, I think it will become even more important, I don't know if the um, OASA study that looked at bypassing centers in uh, Catalonia has already been published, but um, again, um, it seems that patients who were directly trans, because our fear was always, are we withholding thrombolysis from patients who may not have a large stroke when we go directly to a thrombectomy-capable center? And um, it seems in that study it was not the case. So with the dwindling evidence for the need for thrombolysis, and especially in those patients that with the scores are considered high risks for a large vessel occlusion, high LAMP score, yeah, high RACE score, high, yeah, uh, high NIHSS score, in those patients I think it makes sense bypassing, going to a different center first, getting a CT there, CT angio, getting that interpreted, probably getting thrombolysis, bypass that center, even if it's two hours journey, come directly to the thrombectomy capable center where the patients could um, get the, um, the therapy. What we also did, we offered from the hospital annually uh, for the normal public outside, yes, an information session, yes, because some of you are certainly cardiologists also, and when you have an acute myocardial infarction, that's much more dramatic clinically, so the people are, yes, reacting spontaneously, whereas when somebody is not speaking properly anymore or cannot move his arm, yes, that doesn't look so dramatic, so there is often time lost because uh, also the public does not react, so, so the family members or others. Is that a stroke or what is it? Or why don't you move? Yes, and so I think it's also important to go to the radio, to the TV, to the newspapers and uh, inform the people on a continuous basis. So if there are no further questions, then I think um, we should go have the coffee break get our strengths back, do some socializing, and be back in half an hour at 11.30. Thank you. Thank you.
gar nicht. Ich glaube, du musst es. Schön. Ja, so. Please have a seat. We want to continue our session. And yes, we have as the next presentation how and when of stroke patient triage literature review and practical application. And I am you are the speaker. Dr. Tsiatarski? Oh. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We're yeah. looking forward to your presentation. Yeah. That is a really and important I'll... part. Are you also accepting patients from other hospitals? Uh, no, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so, uh, honored panelists um, and moderators, uh, dear colleagues, my name is Orlin Zatarski. I'm a resident radiologist from Ajibad M City Clinic, Takuda Hospital in Sofia. And uh, my talk today is going to be about how and when of stroke patient triage, so some, a short review of the literature and some uh, practical applications. So uh, the layout of today's lecture, we're going to start talking about uh, the time from symptom onset, uh, some imaging criteria, the location of the large vessel occlusion, and stroke severity. So starting from uh, the time of symptom onset, of course, we divide stroke into two main categories. We divide them into the early time window, for now at least, and a late time window. So the early time window is uh, up to six hours. Of course, there's a lot of data supporting the use of thrombectomy within the zero to six uh, hour time frame. Uh, of course, this is versus uh, medical therapy. And uh, when I say good outcome, of course, I'm talking about the modified Rankin scale, zero to two. Uh, you can see Mr. Clean, Extend IA, Swift Prime, a number of trials showing the benefit of thrombectomy within this time, uh, time frame. Of course, Revascat and Escape take things a little bit further. We'll start talking about that right now, uh, eight hours and 12 hours. So what about the later time window? Um, we have two groundbreaking trials that started appearing around 2018 uh, talking about beyond the six hour time frame that we've set. We have Diffuse 3 taking, uh, taking matters up to 16 hours, again with, with uh, really good scores, and Dawn uh, up to 24 hours with, with good results. And we call this a late time window paradox. And it was only when we started incorporating more advanced imaging techniques, such as CG perfusion, MR perfusion, that we started being able to explain why this happens. We have the early Hermes collaboration that comes up with, with the phrase, uh, time equals brain. And that's great. We love that phrase. It's our favorite thing to say. Uh, however, due to these advanced imaging techniques, we can start talking about a little bit of a paradigm shift. And can we start talking about collaterals equals brain? So the RCTs are great, uh, but what do the registries tell us? And this is important because RCTs are just that. They're controlled trials. Um, the benefits are the registries that I'm going to talk about, for example, TREC and NASA. There are a couple of others, but we'll talk about these two. Um, they have no specific restriction in time and no specific imaging criteria, which is what all these RCTs use. And it turns out that they have results that are really similar to the RCTs, 48 and 42 percent of good clinical outcome, again, based on uh, the modified Rankin scale. Uh, what was interesting and in support of the late time window was that 33% of registered patients had thromectomy above, so later than six hours from onset. And what we saw as an analysis was that the safety and efficacy of thrombectomy uh, was equal to that of the zero to six hour time frame. Okay, uh, imaging criteria. Why, why do we do imaging criteria? What's the purpose? It's really simple. It's uh, the exclusion of patients, not the inclusion, the exclusion of patients. And there are really two types of patients that we try to exclude from thrombectomy. And they are patients that are unlikely to benefit or patients for whom thrombectomy may be harmful. So talking about the early time frame window, uh, there's no superiority of imaging modality used. So we can have our non-contrast CT. We love our aspects, 6 to 10. There is a tendency to move towards a dichotomization of the aspect score. So no longer do we need to say aspect 7 or aspect 8 because the patient is going to go to thrombectomy anyway. So we draw the line at 6 and we start saying yes aspects or no aspects. Uh, the MR diffusion, aspects 5 to 10. Uh, the multiphase CT and geography with collateral imaging. Of course, a moderate to good score for collaterals is what we're going for. Uh, the last part, the advanced imaging, isn't really necessary in the early time frame uh, window, but we are looking for a small core, so less than 50 to 70 milliliters and significant penumbra to core mismatch. 
So the late time window, unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have the ability to use artificial intelligence so far. Um, and I uh, had a talk with my department maybe two or three weeks back uh, exactly about e-stroke and, um, and the benefits of that. However, for us, for now, um, we still go by the Dawn and the Fuse criteria uh, with the CT perfusion and the, and the MR diffusion perfusion. Um, the problem with Dawn and Diffuse, however, they're highly restrictive. So uh, me, it means we have limited generalizability. And that means that they can't be applied to every single patient that comes to our stroke unit. And what's the problem with that? And I'll give you an example from a single center study. Uh, we have elbow patients that have good clinical outcomes after thrombectomy. However, the single center showed that 70% of them were Dawn and Diffuse ineligible which means that patients who had a good clinical outcome and benefited from thrombectomy might not have received the treatment if we were strictly following Dawn and Diffuse criteria. So um, this is sort of going towards the future, uh, maybe possibly with a lot, a lot of question marks. And this is the visionaries. So uh, CT MRI aspects three to five. Can we talk about that? Uh, it all started with ECAS 2 where, where we showed that um, IVT functional outcome was not dependent on baseline aspects. And then we had Diffuse 3, which had um, an analysis showing that the thrombectomy had the same effect for aspects less than 8 and more than 8. What about core volumes that are more than 50 to 70 milliliters? The latest Hermes collaboration of all of these showed individual good clinical outcomes at 90 days with aspects 5 to 7. What about aspects 0 to 4 and infarcts of more than 30% of MCA territory? So this is what we have to, we have to follow uh, in order to draw some sort of line to where we are ready to go with thrombectomy because symptomatic ICH is a huge risk, especially with, with these numbers. So uh, about the location of the large vessel occlusion, there's lots of clinical data supporting large vessel occlusion, uh, intracranial, uh, extracranial ICA, M1 and M2. These are obvious. M3, we don't have so much data yet. It's still, it remains unclear. Same thing goes for the anterior cerebral artery. And this is where, this is what we need to do. We need to do risk assessment. Some of it might be uh, preoperative, some might be intraoperative, uh, but looking at vessel perforations, vasospasm, way, the way we manage vasospasm. Okay, uh, really shortly about stroke severity, because it's more of a neurological than a radiological topic. Um, how much disability is disabling? Of course, the NHSS score, when we first started out, we wanted uh, to have preserved patients. So Mr. Clean started with a really low NHSS score of two. Um, escape and extend had no threshold, but required, quote unquote, disabling symptoms. And what we practically use is an NHSS more than six, of course, uh, according to Swift, Primer, Vascat, and Diffuse. And now I've written here change slide because we're going to change topic a little bit and we're gonna start talking about the moral of the story. So we have to keep in mind that we're treating patients. We're not treating numbers. We're not treating images. Um, so what nobody really talks about, the American Stroke Association says that patients most likely to benefit from thrombectomy have a pre-morbid MRS of zero to two. Okay, does that mean that MRS three to five is not good enough and they shouldn't receive treatment? Um, Perlman did an interesting analysis. He went after stroke survivors and patients in um, patients in nursing homes uh, that had notable pre-morbid impairment. And he, and he asked them how they felt about their diseases. And I quote this, um, states worse than death. So uh, the patients had, um, were in opposition of life prolonging treatment. They did not want, if something should happen, they did not want treatment to occur. So uh, does this mean that we should alter the guidelines in some way? Should there be a pre and post um, quality of life assessment? So uh, we bounce on the question of science versus holistic medicine. <laughs> so uh, back to the future. Um, the questions that, are, uh, that we have to sort of look forward to answering, hopefully in the near future, what's the lowest aspects that we can, we can safely start and, uh, to implement thrombectomy? What about the largest core volume? The ACA and the bezel are artery. They still remain unclear in terms of mechanical thrombectomy. Should we do general anesthesia or sedation? Is there really a space for discussion there. What about pediatric stroke patients? We don't talk about them at all. And uh, the final topic is, uh, it's pretty interesting, neuroprotection before or after mechanical thrombectomy. Um, we've started to show really slowly through new studies that um, there is a thing called 
uh, there is a, such a thing as neural regeneration. So that sort of puts a question on what we calculate as a core volume. Is that really a core volume? Is there reversible tissue in what we conventionally call dead brain? So I've laid out the current recommendations in a, in a little bit of an easier format to read. Um, in terms of imaging, in the six-hour time frame with moderate to good collaterals, small core, and significant mismatch, of course, we do a thrombectomy. In under six hours, but lower than six CT aspects, it may be, or a core volume more than 70, it may be reasonable to do a thrombectomy. Six to 24 hours, so late, late time window of an ICA or M1 who meet Don and Diffuse, of course, this is a yes. And six to 24 hours, what without Don and Diffuse, like I said, with a single center study, it may be reasonable. Uh, time from onset in select patients up to 16 hours and up to 24 hours. Um, it's good to keep in mind that one is from uh, features onset and last known well, whether, uh, and up to 24 hours, we're talking about only the last known well. So wake up strokes do not, uh, do not factor there. Uh, the location of the large vessel occlusion, ICA, M1 and M2, of course. Uh, M3 to be considered on a base to, uh, case to case. And the stroke severity, uh, NHSS greater than six in anterior circulation, we can go ahead with the, with the thrombectomy. With less than six, with disabling symptoms, I quote, uh, such as isolated aphasia, we might be able to do. Um, it may be reasonable to do a thrombectomy. And the last recommendation concerning age, elderly patients, it's actually not contraindicatory for thrombectomy and based on a couple of studies, actually. Uh, what remains unknown, however, is patients with an MRS greater than one in this, in this age group. And that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this critical inter uh, uh, part. I think it is so important to show we are not treating numbers, but there's a patient behind yeah, it. Exactly. And we really do tend to just take all the patients together and then come up with a conclusion that should meet every patient. Of course. And um, uh, we also we just had a, a case where the patient has a modified ranking score of four, is 50 years old. Theoretically, that patient is excluded. Yeah. If you ask further, the patient has just fallen, had a fracture of their leg, <laughs> thus has a modified <laughs> ranking exactly, score. Exactly, yeah. Also, who are we to judge if someone is disabled yeah, and is not able to care after themselves? Is it not worth treating that patient? So I, I think exactly. we have to be very critical. And um, I love the list of questions, questions, questions yeah. that you'd put. I will add one more, and that is eloquent area. Ah, yes, so yes. we tend, uh, yeah, so um, we tend to look um, sort of which area of the brain is affected. The hand area we can see. Do you yeah. think that will be important? Absolutely, in the absolutely. Future? That can be. That can, that's really important. Um, there are scores um, for other pathologies that include the eloquent area, whether it's affected or not. So it's something that could be incorporated into into stroke yeah. uh, triage. Yes, uh, of course. And, and I will add one more part when you were um, mentioning that in, was it 18% where the patients would not have been eligible? 70%. 70%. Oh, 70, 70, it's a, yeah, it's uh, a single center. Yeah, yes, single. So very interesting because we always tend to take the imaging result of a perfusion as the holy grail. As exactly. in radiology, we know never trust any images you haven't forged yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, the problem is that perfusion imaging, um, so the Buffalo group say within the first four hours, I will be more conservative, say in the first two hours, does not work. Exactly. So um, if you, and in wake up strokes, you do not know how old it is. And we would have excluded so many patients from treatment if we had followed the perfusion image. If you show, and I think That's that exactly is meant, exactly yes. um, reflected here. So in those cases, I think it is really important to take the combination with the um, dead aspects area yeah. Um, yeah. together. Yes. Yeah. Uh, superb presentation. Really loved it. Thank Let's you. look at the individual. Let's look at collaterals. Collaterals. Yeah. I think the new, you said the slogan. <laughs> <laughs> collaterals. The collaterals is brain. Yeah. Oh, brain. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> And now it's my absolute pleasure to announce, uh, announce Ivo Petrov. Um, Ivo, you're going to talk about the collaboration between neurologists and invasive cardiologists for endovascular treatment. That's how we met. I admire your passion, how you set it up. I think the future, we cannot continue working in silos. It's working together. Please give okay. us your presentation.
Thank you very much for your nice introduction. Uh, my topic is probably a little more controversial, or even more controversial. But uh, nevertheless, it's very important that we are together, that we are sitting together, and uh, it's uh, in interest of everybody, patients and also specialists. After the uh, creation of uh, UC Ted Dietrich, who really participated into the opening of our, of our uh, uh, the facility, of our uh, clinic, stroke is a devastating situation and uh, uh, it doesn't matter at which level of the vasculature, uh, it's causing death. In Bulgaria, the problem is enormous. So more than 65% of the, of the death in Bulgaria are caused by cardiovascular cause, cardiovascular disease and the stroke the proportion of stroke here, it's very well seen that is uh, uh, almost 25% of this death is caused by stroke. So definitely the early reperfusion is very, very important. And uh, uh, in, in, that, in that target, in that uh, mission, the uh, thrombin, uh, in fact, the endovascular treatment, the catheter-based treatment uh, uh, on different modalities, aspiration, stent rivers, uh, uh, supraselective fibrinolysis is helping us. And uh, what uh, we have done in uh, the last uh, uh, several years, more than 1,000 carotid and uh, intracranial intervention. So, uh, let's speak about uh, the heart and the, and the brain. They are different organs, no, no, no doubt, but similar challenges regarding the uh, uh, vascular, vascular problem on the level of the heart and, and the brain. Large, ve large vessel occ occlusion, it was very well shown that it's uh, probably the biggest uh, enemy uh, of survival. And because of that, uh, so many, many uh, technology involved uh, uh, to be, uh, to, to in fact, to improve uh, the result of catheter-based uh, treatment. There are not six, there are many more trials showing one and the same. It's very interesting, uh, performed, you see, in Spain, in Canada, in Australia, in USA. So they, there is no bias. There is no national bias. Uh, it's more than clear that the large vessel occlusion, large brain vessel occlusion, uh, can be devastating condition. And uh, like uh, shown before, uh, Hermes uh, has shown how important it is to open this large vessel occlusion on the brain in order to improve survival. And uh, it's a huge burden, uh, not only medical, but also financial. And uh, uh, like you commented, just commented, uh, time, core, penumbra, collaterals, everything counts. But it's uh, absolutely true in these uh, more than 10 trials, uh, randomized uh, trials, uh, it was very well shown that the endovascular catheter-based intervention is probably one of the most beneficial intervention in the history of medicine. We need only three patients with stroke to be treated in order uh, to be treated by catheter-based intervention in order to save one life. And because of that, the guidelines changed so fast during the last three years. And uh, in fact, the, the, the window for thrombectomy up to even 24 hours now open. And because of that, it's considered unethical to uh, not to perform a catheter-based treatment of patients independently if he received before systematic uh, thrombolysis or not. And because of that, it's uh, this, uh, even in the COVID-19 era, the catheter-based treatment, the endovascular intervention is still the number one choice even for patients that are COVID-19 positive into the guideline. What is the next step? The next step in order to, to complete uh, the, uh, the, mantra, uh, the mantra that time is brain, we have to shorten the time. So we have to uh, skip uh, several steps. And uh, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, tricks to uh, skip uh, several steps is to use cardiologists, interventional cardiologists on the floor, on stage, to help the programs. 
So uh, the, uh, the early experience of cardiologists were published in 2009 regarding endovascular intervention of stroke. There was the Prague 16, uh, uh, Peter Vidimsky trial performed in Czech Republic. 30% of, uh, of the guys who performed this positive trial were interventional cardiologists. And uh, it was very well shown that uh, after uh, uh, in, uh, utilizing well-trained cardiologists uh, to participate, the results are very similar to the other uh, special, uh, specialists. And uh, absolutely by purpose, the European Society Council on Stroke, uh, in fact, recommended uh, uh, to, to have training, training, it's very important, certification and participation of, of cardiologists into the, uh, into the, not only into the trials, but all, also into the daily work of uh, regarding catheter-based treatment. You see, uh, by purpose, I put this slide that uh, is stating that in patients un under consideration for mechanical thrombectomy, observation after IV alteplas to assess for clinical response should not be performed. So it, uh, it's doing harm. To wait is doing harm. Uh, we uh, published uh, several times uh, uh, our uh, renovated guideline. In fact, this guideline was based on the network for myocardial infarction. STEMI. STEMI network has to be utilized because uh, the territory of Bulgaria is very well covered with uh, good angiographs with uh, subtraction. So it can be, uh, these facil uh, facilities can be utilized in order to reduce the, uh, the stroke mortality. This is our limited uh, during the last uh, five years experience because unfortunately we are not uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated uh, by the Ministry of Health uh, team, but nevertheless we are performing thrombectomies. Uh, it was very interesting for me to see, I didn't know, that the first systemic thrombolysis was done in Bulgaria in 2005 and uh, after looking back on the file, I saw that the first uh, catheter-based treatment of stroke in Bulgaria was done, uh, done by my team in 2004. So one, one year before the syst uh, systemic, we succeeded to reconalize this uh, anterior cerebral artery. It was a patient during a coronary intervention. It's rare, but it's not zero. There are some uh, patients uh, that uh, have embolization of the uh, brain vessel during a coronary intervention. So in this case, we had a gentleman with uh, uh, such kind of uh, embolization and we succeeded to reconalize with uh, uh, microcatheter crossing and small doses of fibrinolytic. So this is the first endovascular intervention for stroke uh, in 2004 in Bulgaria. I will show you two cases. The first one is uh, uh, 67. Uh, these cases are controversial uh, even uh, uh, into the guidelines. This gentleman, uh, he denied to use uh, uh, anticoagulation uh, treatment uh, despite he was uh, uh, in uh, atrial fibrillation. So uh, he presented uh, in a comatose state uh, in our hospital. He was immediately intubated. Uh, his initial evaluation was, uh, you see, quite uh, negative, so the probability to survive is almost uh, uh, going to zero. So in this situation, what to do? To leave the gentleman to die or to do something? So we performed some imaging uh, investigation, and finally, my team, despite uh, our colleagues from anesth anesthesiology department, were very skeptic because on the, on the imaging we had the so-called basilar symptom. The basilar symptom is suggesting basilar artery occlusion. So the probability to survive with the basilar artery uh, occlusion in a comatose state is uh, not very high. So uh, we uh, take, uh, took a look at the guidelines. Uh, in the guidelines, uh, almost nothing about basilar artery occlusion, but there were some small series, uh, individual series showing encouraging results. So. We confirmed by the angio that uh, really we had a basilar artery occlusion. We uh, made a, a thrombus aspiration. And after the thrombus aspiration, we saw on the tip of the thrombosis critical stenosis. So 
this was uh, done by the thrombus aspiration. What next? And uh, based on our previous um, uh, approach and uh, experience with uh, intercranial interventions, we did, uh, 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 let's say, conservative uh, balloon inflation of non-compliant balloon, and we succeeded to restore not only the lumen, but also the flow in, uh, after the basilar, the basilar occlusion. The, the clinical result was impressive. Even our colleagues from the anesthesiology department, they called me, uh, several hours after intervention to tell me that the, the, the patient uh, is awake. It was unbelievable for almost for everybody. Uh, fortunately, he restored quite well, not only by imaging, but also by clinical point of view. He survived and he, uh, in fact, he was discharged uh, uh, several weeks after the intervention in a quite a good shape. We published this case. What about uh, wake-up stroke? Wake-up stroke, uh, we know that uh, we have uh, two trials for late strokes, late comers, and wake-up stroke. In the wake-up stroke, they were excluded uh, by, the, uh, by the teams uh, from the, the first trials. In wake-up stroke, it, uh, we don't know when uh, was, uh, in fact, the occlusion happened, the uh, embolic occlusion in most of the cases happened. And because of that, imaging is very important to tell us, is there a penumbra, uh, is there a salvageable uh, tissue there? So we had a patient after a second uh, cardiac operation, and he wake up on the next day after the, uh, the, the surgical intervention with coronary bypass grafting. He, uh, very young patient, 50, uh, uh, 54 year male, he woke up with stroke. And uh, we decided, of course, not to leave him behind. And uh, uh, on the angio, we saw the so-called T occlusion. On the T occlusion, this is a carotid. It's a, a mimicria of carotid occlusion. In fact, this is not carotid occlusion. It's a occlusion of both anterior and middle cerebral artery. And, and because of that, uh, this is the so-called uh, T occlusion. So we did uh, thrombospiration with the penumbra device uh, several times. Uh, uh, I mentioned several times because uh, after the, the first attempt, uh, there was some flow, but it was not perfect. And because of that, uh, we did uh, uh, second aspiration. And finally, we succeeded to uh, recanalize the, uh, the artery and to restore the flow in both uh, anterior and middle cerebral artery. And he restored uh, almost completely. With, uh, he was discharged uh, with uh, MRS score of one. And uh, on the follow-up, uh, we uh, uh, saw a very good imaging and clinical result. You see that, the, uh, in fact, the bifurcation is absolutely permanent, uh, patent. It's not my conclusion. <laughs> it's a comment of Nick Hopkins. So, you know, uh, Nick Hopkins is one of the uh, most uh, prominent uh, neurosurgeons, uh, Buffalo uh, the Institute, uh, and he's, uh, uh, it's the opinion of Nick Hopkins that uh, 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 we need, all we need, the medical, the, the medical community, we need to use the interventional cardiologists and angiologists that are well-trained. So, this is, this is very important. Uh, uh, we have discussed several times that uh, to treat the stroke is a team aim, team goal, team goal. And uh, I mentioned several times that uh, everybody, neurologist or angiologist or neurosurgeon, oh, they have to be trained. They have to be trained. It's a specific territory, and because of that, we need specific training. So it's important to train everybody that wants to open by catheter-based treatment uh, uh, a stroke patient. So uh, there are some discussion regarding the similarities, the peculiarities of the vasculature, and because of the peculiarities and the specific vasculature of the brain, we have to be trained in order to, make the, to, to perform the intervention properly. But uh, nevertheless, it's the most important that currently we are in one and the same carriage. We have to be together. We have to listen to the neurologist. And the neurologist, uh, you have to use uh, the trained interventionalists. It doesn't matter is it a cardiologist, angiologist, vascular surgeon, or whatever. We, are, uh, we have to be together.
Thank you so much. Short comment. Why do people develop a stroke and have thrombus there? Most of them are coming from the heart. Absolutely right. And the second point is when you replace the aortic valve. Yes, uh, today you use protection because the risk of embolism is also very high. So when something happens on the table, the cardiologist cannot say, oh, I cannot do that. I call now for some new radiologist, but he will go immediately and solve the problem himself. Absolutely right. Totally agree. Uh, even nowadays, you know, with uh, structural heart uh, valve intervention, the probability of embolization is increasing. And uh, we, the cardiologists, we are guilty for many of the strokes. <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding, of course, but uh, uh, more than obvious, we have to be prepared. We have to, to have uh, rescue devices on the shelf in order to manage uh, such kinds of patients. I think what um, you really nicely showed is how the few neuroradiologists that are available across the world will not manage to deal with the huge amount of strokes. I do not know how you, the situation is in Bulgaria, how many neuroradiologists do you think they can cope with 15 to 20 percent of all strokes going for thrombectomy? Probably Professor Sirakov is the right person to, to answer. How, <laughs> uh, Next to you. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I don't believe we still have enough uh, dedicated people which are well trained. Uh, from the side of the radiologist, interventional radiologist. We develop it, but at this moment, there are not enough. Another mm. challenge is even if we had more interventional neuroradiologists, what are we going to do with them over the day? Are they just going to wait for a stroke and only treat strokes? Because the number of aneurysms is not likely to rise. Yes, uh, we are already at a certain percentage. The number of AVMs is not going less, to rise. Yes. It's even less. So that means we are training a whole bunch of interventional neuroradiologists who will then take a big part of the aneurysms yeah, because you'll be fighting for every case at the time. Or you just keep neuroradiologists to wait for a stroke case to be available. So I think, yeah. We can just go for some of the patterns like in Switzerland. So they have four or five centers mm -hmm. with well-trained four to five people, interventional neuroradiologists. Yes. Who can coverage the 24 hours shift yes. and there is a lot of smaller centers which are performing the venous thrombolysis yes. and can say during this time the patients over there yes. there is still place i think for the well-trained centers which are with high volume procedures yes. per yes. year per annually of course yes and i don't think it's uh, not enough for example we have a, a center in which we performed around more than 300 endoscope procedures per year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we are four person which three of us are Yes. Completely equal to, to, the to perform neurovascular procedures. But like I said, maybe for Sofia it's enough. For Bulgaria, yes. we should develop at least two more centers like that. Yes. Because, like you know, 8 to 10 percent of all strokes are it going to go for endovascular. So I agree with you, there is no uh, need to have an interventional neuroradiologist in a small village or a small town waiting for five procedures per year. It, totally is, agree with this, it is definitely an option to have specialized centers where also there's the routine, there are many cases, so people that, are more familiar with doing it. That was my idea, if you it. have international cardiologists um, in a yes. small village, which, the, the, uh, who will perform five procedures, stroke procedures per year, so his ability will be not so well trained. Uh, so the only, the same. so um, I think it's probably not so much the ability, because if we look at the centers, um, who um, uh, were starting with Mr. Clean and so on, they also did not necessarily have any experience in stroke. It will definitely be the team being familiar and the time to get someone on the table. Um, if you haven't practiced something a lot for a long time, getting this multi-complex team together, um, the, uh, it is definitely an option having some specialized centers where then everything is already streamlined and goes for that. Um, the interesting part was um, uh, the team from Buffalo when they looked um, at secondary transfers and unfortunately secondary transfers are always correlated with a lot of time delay. Um, so A, of course, to get the transfer sorted because we're just assuming, so we had a hospital that's 18 minutes away. 
That did it's, not mean it's that. It's a question the, of logistic and yes, organization. Yes, exactly, exactly. Very small uh, and, uh, sample because the time is up. In Norway, they're mm -hmm. starting to use interventional radiologists for the whole body. Yes. To help their interventional neuroradiologists. Yes. At the first the results were not good, so they are trying to better and better the situation with the transport, organization, yes. to save time. So at this point, at that moment, yes. like it's in Bulgaria, we have to think about logistic and better mm -hmm. organization. Maybe in the yes. future, yes. if there is well-trained people dedicated to do something yes. with a high volume annually, yes. it should be good for the patient, not just yes. Yes. we have well-trained person, but he is going to do five procedures per year. I don't think this kind of model will work. It depends on how much the delay will be to bring the patient there, yes. So there was a very interesting study from Nick Hopkins and team where they looked at secondary transfers in the whole of the US and they looked at does that impact outcome and secondary transfers were, um, were associated with a significant decline a in big outcome. Big loss of time. Big loss of time and also often we think that okay, a helicopter will speed things up that is not really the case because it's a specialized team. Putting someone in the helicopter is very time consuming. It's not like with the ambulance, uh, even just unloading the patient. So um, the question is, does it make more sense also flying teams or bringing teams to other centers? What is your opinion? It's a question of organization and uh, mm -hmm. yes. the opportunities. Different yes. countries have different uh, opportunities like Mm -hmm. I just want to, don't want to waste time for the guys no, no, which fine. are live. That's why. <laughs> At that moment in Bulgaria, I am not totally agree that everybody in every small town should do it. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have to train better people. Maybe yes. the rising interventions will rise also the better quality of the dedicated and trained people for this job. Yes. Or even bring teams to other centers and move the interventionists. So different options. Look at the logistics. Okay, good. Less. Thank you. If you would do the... Okay. Uh, sure, but there was supposed to be a presentation before the case. I suggest we switch it because the case is ready, so we first... Absolutely. Uh, oh. It was uh, my, uh, uh, let's say, proposition to start with the case in order not the patient to wait on the table. Okay. And finally, uh, Dr. Stoyanov will yeah. tell several words about the yeah. uh, technology, uh, ICD technology. Of Shall we show us a short presentation of the case? Dr. Yeah. Ivanov, I think, let's is, go. is ready. <coughs> Before they again a female patient, your name. Hello again. Uh, next case is a uh, fifty-three years old female patient. Two days after onset of severe headache. Severe headache uh, of vomiting. Hunting has first degree, fissure third degree. No reason. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is the control result uh, one year after coiling. But on the third year, we have recanalization. We, take, we took a decision uh, to put a flow diverter in the right internal carotid artery, and Dr. Olyoski is next. Hello. Hello, Iris. Hello, we hear you. Ah. <laughs> now, okay. now we can see you as well. Till now, till now we, we have a six range uh, distal access uh, approach with uh, react 071 in the on the siphon on the right carotid artery and after that we are with the uh, penon 27 in the Similar middle the cerebral artery. artery you can see the, the uh, top of the microcatheter here is the top of microcatheter uh, for this aneurysm we choose to use Pipeline 425 to 20 shield technology. And now we will put the folder. Okay. 
โอเคเรดี้ I put the the top of my catheter on the MCA because he is a little bit torturous and to have a good stability on the micro catheter, he is up. MCA analysis. Yeah, correct. Your hand. Okay. We're going up. Here is the stand. Okay. It's a little bit longer. Okay, now everything is straight. And we can start. A little bit. I will resheat it. Okay. Nuri, could you tell us about the materials and the implants that we are, you are using? It's a pipeline shield technology. Uh, it means that he has an anti platted characteristic of the stand. Uh, yes. I think that it's uh, the position is okay. It's below the A01 and before the bifurcation, actually. Do we have a biplane machine or? Oh, it's monoplane. I think that uh, only advantage of uh, biplane is uh, when you treat the avians. It's a little bit longer. But as you mentioned, it's a massage. Yes, push, yes. Push pull, yes. push pull, push pull. Yes, on the curve yes, always. of the vessel. All lifelong push pull. <laughs> to have a yes, it's fully open. <laughs> I will open it now. I will risk it. Yes. Okay. In fact, it's helpful for the apposition of the stand, for, especially for, uh, for uh, flow diverters. It's extremely important to facilitate, in fact, to stimulate the yes. apposition. So this is very important, and especially in uh, brain vasculature that is so tortuous, this maneuver is very, very important, absolutely. Uh, hopefully, uh, Iris, you, you will agree with me. It's not so simple like a coronary stand push uh, and uh, inflate in 10 seconds. No, there is nothing to do. It's uh, much, much more special. Now, uh, ah, I will wait for the uh, venous phase to see the stagnation of the contrast in the aneurysm. Yeah. Good demonstration. Okay. I go out. Okay. The visibility of the stand is okay. Final control angio. And we are ready for the questions. Okay.
Now we see that the, the position of the stand. Perfect. And we can okay. also see the flow of S. We can also see that there's already some stasis and the stagnation of contrast um, inside. Yes. In this context, as an uh, ignorant cardiologist, I wanted to ask you regarding the uh, antiplatelet treatment. We have two controversial targets to keep patency of the stent of the Floyd diverter and to have thrombosis of the aneurysm. What is the regimen of uh, antiplatelet in this situation? Because it's a matter of brain, of course, that we, have, uh, we want to, to, uh, to see patency in the parent vessel. Okay, so what is the regimen? Uh, what the what regimen would be? No, double double antiplatelet. Yeah. For uh, how long? For, uh, for, for uh, six months, uh, double antiplatelet and uh, uh, monotherapy for one year. Okay, just a question. Is it written into the guideline or it's your practice? In most of the centers, they, 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 they work with uh, double it's, antiplatelet. It's okay, it's well to know. Uh, now, we are, we are, we are, we are, the, the couple of centers, they, they suggest uh, uh, three months. It depends about the center. And uh, I don't know, Miro, in your center? Uh, Mike, they still stick to six months, dual antiplatelet, and one year for mono. We leave it yes. just for the aspirin. Hmm. But after we're starting to put this uh, new coating of, uh, of the phenox stains, it's the hydrophilic coating. Uh, we have several patients on mono, monotherapy from the beginning. We, we stick to them only with prasugrel, 10 milligrams per day. Uh, the one lady was allergic to aspirin. And the second one, I have a history of uh, very severe um, stomach bleeding. So we decided to put these two patients we already have first control for the six months. Nothing special, no strokes. So again, uh, we didn't observe any uh, hyperplasia, instant stenosis, hyperplasia, or something like that. So maybe this coating of the stents, like you mentioned, CHIU technology, could be potentially changing the guidelines in the future, and we stick to the monotherapy with these stents. And also with Kangreloa, for example, with Kangreloa, which is also IV and uh, has been used for single antiplatelet therapy. If, if we needed to put it in an emergency case, if it's in a the rupture aneurysm. In the acute bleed, exactly, in the ruptured yes, aneurysm, it is an option. we can do it. It's still it's so quite expensive, expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's in Bulgaria. And you do. have to give a continuous infusion as well. But the uh, main thing is the price. At least yeah. for 24 hours, and you can switch to Ticagre or Prosper. Yeah. yeah which would also go back to when you were previously asking about antiplatelets. So the good thing is you can give it IV. Um, uh, um, I think it's the only one available in IV um, uh, version. Yes. Price is a problem, continuous infusion is a problem, but it may be something for acutely ruptured aneurysm where you need single antiplatelet therapy. Unfortunately, I, I don't believe it's available in, in Bulgaria. I don't it know, is. but it is. You can buy it uh, by yourself or your hospital. Uh -huh. the but patient. it's, uh, <laughs> it's for it. slightly expensive. Yeah. It's like around 400 euro per vial. And this, this vial is enough for one, one, and hour, uh, one hour and a half. Mm -hmm. If you want to cover 24 hours, until we switch to Ticagre, it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it has a very fast switch on and switch off, so yes. it basically immediately works, but the good thing is if there is bleeding, uh -huh. it will immediately be out. So Great. from a drug point of view, it's, it's really ideal. From a price, it's prohibitively expensive. For example, if your neurosurgeon needs to put a drainage, extraventricular drainage, you can switch the Kangre and they can do it in three minutes. In three minutes, there is Great. no inhibition for the... I'm, I'm curious uh, regarding proliferation. How often do you see proliferation in a stent uh, diverter? In the old versions of the flow diversion, without coating, just the standard flow diversion, yeah. we have like less than 5% okay. of the ratio. Uh, hmm. the six months That's control, it. and mm. if we stick uh, and to do another run follow up in one year, after that, only on the aspirin, it's completely gone. 
and what if you have a critical stenosis in within the flow diverter? I, in my experience, never saw it until uh -huh. this moment. Yeah. I have one uh, significant hyperplasia, and we just consulted. it. Should I do something? Should I put a balloon, Dirkelutic or something? They told me, don't touch it. <laughs> and in one year, it was completely resolved. Ah, this is interesting. Just yeah. aspirin, mm -hmm. no sticking to do antiplated. In their experience, they saw a lot of these cases. I'm not sure are they publish it with uh, long follow-ups. But only on a single therapy, in one year, it just disappeared. Great. Can I ask one more question to the operator? Your experience with intraluminal flow diverters, like the web or um, yeah, flow diverters directly within the aneurysm, does that play but a big role? Do you, or do you go for conventional coiling with stent assistance and flow diverter? Or what is your practice using flow diverters within the aneurysm? Uh, like I the don't web. have a lot of well, experience with uh, web, it, uh, with intracycular device. In uh, regular, we, uh, we, we do stent-assisted coiling, balloon-assisted coiling, or flow diverter. Uh, let me I mention that we are neurosurgeons, and uh, uh, for the complex type of aneurysm, we do surgery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I will meant about the, the intra um, uh, stand, kids stand stenosis. In regular, I put the, the patient for a couple of months of, uh, with statins, and uh, I think that it's okay. The patient uh, who is older than, uh, I, for example, 55 years, to put in him on uh, statin or with statin at home. Mm -hmm. I see. And important part, it takes about 9 to 12 weeks for the stent to be covered again with a new endothelial layer, which means that for a minimum of three months, one has to give the dual antiplatelet. But um, it still varies a bit amongst patients, so going longer is um, a good option. Um, main challenge that we often see is with patients going to um, their doctor or the dentist and they say, no, we're going to pull our teeth, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, take it out. So it's, uh, it's a big education part for the patient or family that they cannot stop their dual antiplatelet. Do you do testing of these patients for responders and non-responders? Yes, uh, in our department, our, our one of our colleagues just gathering a big number. Yes. Because at the beginning we are sticking to it copidogrel and aspirin, so we started to test with Verify now. Yes. The copidogrel patients, and it's, it, there is one uh, proposition from the Turkish group of uh, prof Professor Cekirje that after the original medicine, the, the Plavix, yes. I think, Plavix. the copidogrel start to be no so stable in the different shape. Yes. That's his proposal. And may maybe we saw the same. After 2015, 16, we saw like maybe 15 to 20 percent resistance to clopidogrel in our group. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we switched this patient to prasugrel, and we <laughs> have more than 150 patients already with prasugrel with no resistance. Catch with very fair now yes. until now. So we already s switched to prasugrel completely. We didn't start with clopidogrel, test the patient, and switch Same to prasugrel. And we yes. don't have thicker growth groups. In, uh, okay. We prefer to be one dosage per day medicine because yes. I think it's That's more easier for, for mm -hmm. the most patients. Perfect. So, <laughs> so we test. Cla Klaus, how do you do? How do you do it? Do you um, recommend testing for resistance yes. or no so resistance? For otherwise you have no effect. Yes. Yes. The, the, so the patient is flicking some drugs and without any effect. And, and so it's actually 30%. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not uh, one per mil, but <laughs> it's really a percentage, a considerable percentage. Yes. But I also want to, to add perhaps to the aneurysm coiling. I expect that not all of you are doing these procedures. Yes. So when you have a very na narrow egg, you can coil very easily and fill it very good. When you have a large neck, the coils have a good chance to drop out. And then you have also different techniques, which were shortly mentioned. You go with 
two microcatheters, so you have one with a balloon and you block it, but first you have to go in with your microcatheter into the aneurysm sac, and then while it's blocked, you can fill it, but when you have a very large opening, uh, a large neck of the aneurysm, still you have a chance when you deflate the balloon that some of the cords will have contact and, and protrude into the loom of the artery. And when you work with uh, flow diverter or stent, yes, you have also two options. You pl fir first place the stent and go through the meshes and coil, or you go with two, place the tip of your coiling microcatheter mm. in the aneurysm sac. Then with the second system, you place a stent and then you can coil and at the end you pull out the microcatheter. So there are different options how to do that. Uh, yes, depending on the size, on the shape of the aneurysm and the size of the neck. Yes. Well, Professor Matthias, Dr. Sirakov is going to present just that uh, in the next session. Oh, yes, the so. availability for uh, wide neck tunnel reasons. <laughs> and you Fantastic. know this is very fast. Oh, yeah, so. uh, developing uh, area in which we oh, have yes. a lot a lot of devices and we are very lucky that in Bulgaria we can also develop first in human devices or to be pioneers in mm -hmm. some of them. So I think you are going to see something interesting, yeah. like if you're familiar with the common edge device, Cascade, yes. and the mm -hmm. latest one is Nautius, which could be, a, could be an opponent of the web. Do you familiar with the Nautius? We, we, uh, yes. I only wanted percentage. to mention it for the audience because the CEO has to play yeah. something. But you are right, we, we will have nice more, deta more detailed information is coming. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, but for the purpose of time, we have to move on. We have one more presentation from Dr. Stoyanov, who will talk about stroke, stroke prevention. Thank you, Dr. Leski. Thank you. Thank okay, you very bye, much guys. for the care case. See you soon. Dear chairs, dear colleagues, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to talk uh, today in front of you. I will change a bit the topic and uh, my talk is going to be about the cryptogenic stroke prevention and long-term monitoring of the cardiac rhythm. As we all know, the atrial fibrillation is a really common uh, condition and uh, it affects uh, um, around 1-2% to 2 of whole population worldwide. The atrial fibrillation is associated with uh, five times uh, increasing of the risk for ischemic stroke and when uh, we have uh, the the boat uh, condition that uh, atrial fibrillation related uh, stroke related to the atrial fibrillation, we have uh, nearly twice uh, uh, more likely to, to have a fatal stroke compared to the patient uh, with stroke not related to atrial fibrillation. Uh, as you can see on the slide, it, that's the toast classification of the stroke and uh, it's underlined that uh, uh, according to this classification, we, we have uh, around 20% cardioembolic uh, strokes. That, that means that it's really important uh, uh, to know uh, how, to, how to, to prevent such, a, such a strokes. And the most important here is to, to say that we have a, around, uh, in between 25 to 40 percent uh, cryptogenic stroke. That means that we don't know what's the cost of the, of the, of the stroke. Uh, and what's the, uh, what's the problem with the cryptogenic stroke? Sometimes we, d we don't know how to, to, uh, to find the, 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 re the reason for stroke and uh, we have incomplete diagnostic. Sometimes the cost, uh, the cost is, uh, is not persistent. We have, a, for example, par paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or we have uh, two or more causes for um, for the, for the stroke. Uh, about the cardioembolic cardio stroke, it's uh, really severe. And uh, why? Because we have uh, uh, about 50% uh, uh, morbidity and invalidity. 
And uh, in terms of the mortality rate, it's about 25% at, uh, at the day 30, and uh, around uh, one and a half of the patient died the first year. And this is an uh, incredible number. Really often, about 20% of uh, our patient, we, we, uh, they have a first manif manifestation of the atrial fibrillation as a stroke. And uh, we have a, a lot of patient completely asymptomatic with the atrial fibrillation. This is really important to be known. How we should detect uh, the atrial fibrillation? Uh, we have a recommendation from our uh, European Society of uh, Cardiology and uh, well, to, to say, yes, we have atrial fibrillation, this, uh, this diagnosis required, uh, required ECG documentation, and this is mandatory. How we have uh, uh, several tools to detect uh, the atrial fibrillation and uh, according to our uh, recent guidelines to 20, 2020 of European Society of Cardiology, we, um, we have uh, several steps to detect atrial fibrillation. We can uh, use uh, uh, this rule of 15 seconds palpation, uh, palpation of the pulse for our patient. They can do this at home or uh, during uh, third, uh, our office uh, visit. Or uh, the second step is to, to have a 12-lead 12 uh, 12 ECG when they feel uh, arrhythmia. Uh, after that, we have uh, another tool. It's uh, holter monitoring, and we, we can have a 24 hours uh, holter monitoring, and we also can extend until seven, uh, one week uh, this monitoring. But is this enough? Let's say no. We have, have another two tools uh, which uh, we can use. Uh, the first one is external loop recorder, but uh, we can use this uh, uh, continuous recording until 30 days. And uh, the other more powerful and really uh, useful tool is, uh, uh, is the loop recorder. We can, uh, we can implant this uh, really small device and we can have a continuous monitoring, really stable with a lot of information until 36 months. Nowadays, we, we have uh, uh, a lot of new, new devices, smart watches and uh, different smart devices, and they provide uh, useful information about uh, our rhythm. We have uh, several trials about this, and probably this is a promising future. Uh, is uh, 30 days enough to, to find our patient with atrial fibrillation and uh, the, the reason for the cryptogenic stroke? The answer is uh, short, no, because we have uh, huge data about this and uh, at the day, the ter the day 30 of the cardiac monitoring, uh, in the real world diagnostic, we have only 5% of uh, of patients that are, uh, we detect only 5% of the atrial fibrillation in a cryptogenic stroke patient. What to do? How, how to improve the, the, um, the treatment uh, of uh, our patients and to, to find uh, the reason for their cryptogenic stroke? Because it's really often, uh, often condition. We can use uh, these small devices they're really, really small, and it's not a huge surgery. It's a small device that uh, uh, should be implanted next to the ster sternum and in proper position, and we have uh, really a, uh, a lot of advantages when we use this uh, promising technology. And uh, we improve our diag uh, uh, diagnostic pro process, and we, we found our patient and, uh, atrial fibrillation and also other condition, but the topic today is a cryptogenic stroke. We have a continuously uh, a monitoring of the patient. Uh, we have a stable ECG uh, during the symptoms and uh, the patient in, also in the patient that are asymptomatic. Uh, what about the, the patient, how they feel this technology? Because it's a small surgery, they're 
probably not comfortable with this and they refuse uh, such technology. No, we have a small trial from book and uh, this in the, uh, on the slide you can see that the patients are really satisfied com uh, with this technology compared to the, the, the patients with uh, external whoop uh, recorders. You can see 21% 20, 20 versus 10%. And this is really important to be known. I want to show you this inc uh, incredible good uh, study. It's called the Crystal AF study. It's really well designed uh, study and uh, with uh, cryptogenic, clear cryptogenic stroke patients. They have a brain um, uh, infarct seen on MRI or CT. And this is documented uh, within the previous 90 days. And uh, the, the reason for the, the, um, uh, the stroke is completely unknown. They have, a, uh, before inclusion, 12 lead ECG, uh, also hotter monitoring, transesophageal uh, echocardiography to detect uh, PFO or, the, or ASD on the um, intraarterial septum. And, uh, the patients are, uh, are uh, over the 40 years. The um, follow-up is three years. And what's uh, this, um, this study review? Uh, they've, they the, the um, authors found that uh, uh, in, implanted patient, the active group patient, compared to control group, they have seven times more uh, detect, uh, detected atrial fibrillation. And uh, this, uh, in this group, the, the patients receive proper therapy. And in 97%, they received the oral anticoagulation. And this is really important. And uh, they conclude that uh, the more of you look, the more atrial fibrillation you, you find. What's the, the value of the WHOOP recorders? Uh, this is a continuous monitoring and for the cryptogenic stroke patient, and this, this uh, tool is superior to standard care according to, to Crystal AF trial, AF trial. And 30 days, because a lot of people are using uh, external um, loop recorders, 30 days are not enough. And uh, the rec uh, they are well recommended, and uh, uh, in uh, in our guidelines, 20, this are the, this is um, on the slide is uh, part of the guidelines 2020, the European Society of Cardi Cardiology, and uh, recommendation. Uh, they are really well recommended in the patient with the cryptogenic stroke. We also have we have this paper from the European uh, Heart Rhythm Society and uh, the other society from uh, Asia Pacific and Latin America. And uh, you can see on the left part of the screen these uh, green hearts. This is the same recommendation as uh, level 1A from the European Society of Cardiology. And they um, suggest that uh, the, the use of loop rec in uh, implantable root loop recorders should be considered for detection of atrial fibrillation in selected high-risk patient. And, uh, and also, um, they uh, called these implantable root loop recorders the right tool for, for, the, right, for the right outcomes. But in, at the end, it's written also in the right population. You should keep in mind this. My take home messages are that implantable loop recorders are the, the best tool for diagnose silent atrial fibrillation in patients with previous cryptogenic stroke. And to, you should keep in mind and to send the patient, if you have a, such a patient, to, to, to receive such a technology because it's really important and uh, they should receive a proper medication because, uh, as you know, the, um, the antiplatelet with the clopidogrel or aspirin, it's not enough and it's not uh, really good in a patient with atrial fibrillation and stroke. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, thank you very much for that information and your presentation. You. One question, when do you do also uh, ultrasound examinations? Yep. To see what is going on in the atrium? You do that routinely also, yes, when you detect uh, atrial fibrillation or not? You mean to, when we perform an echocardiogram? Echo, yes, and? echocardiogram, because you want to see when, some, when you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, naturally yes. the next question is, is there already something in the atrium uh, yeah. forming thrombus uh, and so on? Thank because you for your question. Uh, with the transthoracic echocardiography, the at right atrium and the, um, the appendage of right atrium is not really well seen. We should perform transesophageal trans yes. echocardiography or CT to detect uh, if we have uh, such, a, such a problem. But the, my topic was for the cryptogenic strokes yes. and we, uh, we really don't know the, the cause for uh, the, the, the reason for the stroke in such a patient. And I really believe uh, that this technology will change the um, the, the world practice and to, to will save us oh, yeah. the lives. Okay. What do you think will be the impact when now more patients are on NOAX, DOAX on the thrombolysis rate? So, um, on the patient, because um, reversal, difficult, can, so if now patients do come and they've had an event, the thrombolysis rate, of course, will be impacted. So probably that, again, will push the amount of thrombectomy rates. Yes. <laughs> and the thrombolysis rate may go down. So yes. although we're preventing strokes, if there is no way to um, deal with these patients in a different way, yeah, because your hands are bound if you want to give thrombolysis, except if we now have reversal, if yeah. we look at reversal. Thank you. I... So uh, what I'm saying is we have to look <laughs> at both sides. Yes, you're preventing them. You're preventing strokes on the yeah. one hand, but those who do get a stroke despite being on them, your hands are tied when they come for the thrombolysis, so you need to have another safety mechanism which may already yeah. be the, the thrombectomy. The thrombectomy, it's uh, the best way to or reverse, do this. Or, or we have, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so then we close that session because we have talked about the stroke programs different versions and what you have to organize and so on. And now we continue with neurovascular interventions. So it's not only stroke, we have also other diseases at the brain arteries. Thank you. Do you need a program? Take place of this skin, there is some brain for you, just straightly continue. Perfect. Your moderator, right? She moved. Hallo, grüß dich. Hi. Du hast dein Programm. Du hast dein Programm. Gott, super. Ein Vortrag, alles gut, alles gut. Ein Vortrag. have a little delay. Uh, the first presentations will be from Dr. Tanova, which is our leading anesthesiologist in uh, St. Ivan Risky Hospital. She's going to speak about the treatment after uh, and taking care after the treatment for the patient, and mainly the, this so fatal sometimes uh, vasospasm we have. Thank you. Please, well, I will present you the uh, intensivist point of view regarding the multidisciplinary approach in treatment of post-hemorrhage vasospasm in the aneurysm, uh, patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, without going deep into numbers, uh, I will just mention, as it was previously mentioned, that uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is still a devastating mm -hmm. event with a high mortality 
And uh, uh, although the survival um, has increased in the last decades, um, uh, uh, there is still a significant long-term disability and neurocognitive impairment uh, among survivors, survivors, and one of the most important causes of mortality and poor uh, neurological outcome is namely the cerebral vasospasm and the delayed cerebral ischemia. Uh, there is evidence that treatment of these patients in high volume, uh, specialized centers with dedicated teams of neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and neurointensivists improves the results, and vice versa. Um, uh, the too big decentralization, uh, which is uh, a trend in the United States, for example, may, on the other hand, be associated with worse outcomes. So um, that's why the multidisciplinary approach in a specialized center is really something that matters. Uh, the subprognoid hemorrhage develops in two phases, the early phases within the first 72 hours after the onset with the um, transient global ischemia and the sympathetic hyperactivity, and from 72 hours onwards uh, comes the delayed phase where this delayed cerebral ischemia appears. Uh, the um, tasks of the neurointensivists include early management after a subprognoid hemorrhage uh, with the initial resuscitation of the patient before the coiling or clipping of the aneurysm, then the management of delayed cerebral ischemia, and of course the management of all the systemic complications which are related to subprognoid hemorrhage. The focus of this presentation is mainly the management of delayed cerebral ischemia, which in the time course of the events after a subprognoid hemorrhage uh, appears somewhere between the 4th and 14th day. Uh, the period can be extended up to the 21st day. Uh, but in some small part of the patients, about 4 to 5 percent, there could be an ultra-early angiographic vasospasm, which is um, an arterial narrowing within the first 48 hours of, after subprognoid hemorrhage. The exact mechanisms are still not very clear. Maybe it's because of direct manipulation of cerebral vasculature during surgery or angiography or mechanical pressure on vessels surrounding intracerebral subprognoid hematoma. Anyway, uh, although it is um, quite rare, it actually leads to a twofold increase in the risk of uh, delayed cerebral ischemia and cerebral infarctions. And the patients with ultra-early vasospasm should be monitored very vigilantly for signs of DCI early in their course. And unfortunately, their uh, refractory, usually refractory to treatment of vasospasm. Uh, as for the uh, delayed cerebral ischemia, which is the much more common event, um, after the fourth day, uh, according to the definition, it's any new focal neurological deficit or a decrease of at least two points on the Glasgow Coma Scale, and the symptoms should last at least one hour, shouldn't be a present uh, uh, immediately after aneurysm repair, and other causes should be excluded, such as hydrocephalus, fever, uh, electrolyte disturbances, seizures, especially the non-convulsive seizures. Um, and also, delayed cerebral ischemia is an appearance of new infarctions on CT or MRI. Uh, but the large vessel vasospasm actually is just one of the factors um, in the genesis of the delayed cerebral ischemia. There are many more factors uh, which are implied. This, these are the neuroinflammation, the microthrombosis, the microvascular dysfunction, uh, and also um, an altered cerebral acti um, electrical activity with the cortical spreading depolarization. So this multifactorial uh, genesis is confirmed by the fact that angiographic vasospasm does not always relate to DCI. It occurs in 40 to 60 percent after subarachnoid hemorrhage, but leads to DCI in only 20 to 30 percent. And the successful treatment of angiographic vasospasm does not necessarily reduce uh, all-cause mortality of DCI. It's also important that some patients with DCI have no angiographic vasospasm, so uh, that's why uh, the um, it's, um, it con confirms that mechanisms independent of large vessel vasospasm cause secondary ischemic brain injury. 
um, uh, for um, detection of early detection of uh, delayed cerebral ischemia, we have to monitor the patients. In the awake patients, uh, this means frequent neurological examination. When the patients are sedated, this is not possible, of course. And here comes uh, uh, to help the daily transcranial Doppler ultrasound, but we have to bear in mind that the data are best for the middle cerebral artery. There is the best sensitivity and specificity. And the gold standard is the conventional cerebral angiography, of course. There are other non-invasive um, tools which can help us in um, detecting a vasospasm, CT angiography, perfusion CT, MRI and MR uh, angiography. The perfusion CT is a promising too. Uh, uh, in some centers, not in ours, I must confess, but supplementary monitoring is um, implemented. Uh, the partial brain tissue oxygenation monitoring, the microdialysis uh, for estimating the brain metabolism, and quantitative EEG. These tools are good for evaluation, better evaluation in poor grade uh, patients. Um, the only two measures that have uh, a proven effect on the prevention of delayed cerebral ischemia are nemodipine and uh, maintenance of euvolemia. Uh, the nemodipine, it's interesting that it has no effect actually in the angiographic vasospasm, but still it improves our outcome and it should be taken from the patients. Uh, it's better the oral uh, nemodipine for 25, uh, 21 days. And um, uh, as for the euvolemia, the um, um, classical triple H therapy has become uh, now old fashioned uh, because um, from the triple, uh, uh, three H's, only the hypertension is left now in the protocols. Actually, the prophylactic hypervolemia is not useful. It can even be dangerous because of fluid overload and uh, a potential for pulmonary edema. Also, hypovolemia should be uh, avoided in those patients and a strict input-output balance should be uh, kept. Um, uh, uh, numerous pharmacological interventions have been evaluated for uh, DCI prevention and uh, a lot of other um, uh, um, trials um, are ongoing. Um, they are coping with the different aspects of the delayed cerebral ischemia, not only the vasospasm, but still none of them has shown any uh, beneficial result. Um, so the goal of the prevention of vasospasm still remains uh, elusive. Um, when we detect uh, a de delayed cerebral ischemia, according to the definition that I have um, mentioned earlier, we have to promptly treat those patients, and we uh, treat them in a stepwise manner. Um, the first-line therapy, it's, um, it's in the domain of the intensivists. It's induced hypertension and volume optimization. Um, with an initial elevation of mean and arterial pressure by 25-30%, but it should be not more than 150 millimeters mercury. We use usually norepinephrine or phenylephrine. And um, then we um, do a volume optimization with boluses of isotonic fluids or more rarely colloids or hypertonic saline. Then uh, come two tires of rescue therapy. Uh, the first tire of rescue uh, therapy includes the endovascular uh, therapy uh, with an intraarterial vasodilators, usually verapamil or nemodipine, balloon angioplasty stent implantation. Uh, another um, part of the rescue therapy in the tire one is the cardiac output augmentation and uh, hemoglobin optimization, which should be maintained above 80 grams per liter. And the uh, uh, second tire of the rescue therapy includes therapeutic hypothermia intrathecal vasodilators or thrombolytics, uh, block of the stellate ganglion, and uh, eventually intraortic balloon pump. Of course, each institution, there are no strict protocols, no strong recommendations, and each institution decides at which stage to uh, implement the different um, 
um, interventions, the different measures. What we do at our institution, uh, this is the induced hypertension and volume optimization, and if this doesn't work, we do um, uh, um, conventional angiography with an uh, application of intra-arterial vasodilators. Uh, balloon angioplasty, our colleagues, the neuroradiologists, uh, do only when there is a detection of periprocedural uh, vasospasm, but not as a routine practice in the late, uh, um, in the delayed cerebral ischemia. And I will just show two brief cases. The first one is a female patient, uh, 40 years of age, and has two fissure four. Um, her aneurysm was caught on the second day after subrachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, she developed a late vasospasm on day 12. She had uh, left hemiparesis and facial asymmetry. Uh, on the MRI, which I'm sorry, but I mm, haven't shown this, but there were a signs of subacute ischemic changes in the right hemisphere. On the same day, intra-arterial application of nemodipine uh, was performed uh, with no um, very obvious result. Uh, on the next day, day 13, a second intra-arterial nemodipine application was done again, and there was a resolution of symptoms, and the patient was discharged with no neurological impairment on uh, day 23. Here, is the, here are the images before and after the nemodipine application when the results are the angiographic results are evident and they correlate well with the clinical results. And one more case, it was a very recent case, a male patient of uh, 45 years of age, uh, Hunton has four Fisher four. He, became, uh, he came to our institution already intubated and sedated from another hospital. On the third day after subrachnoid hemorrhage, uh, his aneurysm was caught, and um, right afterwards, because of an acute hydrocephalus, um, external ventricular drainage was put. On the day six, he was extubated, but in the following days, uh, there was a progressive deterioration of the patient's condition with decreased level of consciousness and left hemiparesis, and or the ninth day, an intra-arterial application of the Rapamil was uh, performed. Actually, the, the results, neither the angiographic nor the clinical results were very um, um, uh, good. Here I will show just uh, uh, the images before and after the Rapamil applications. The difference is not very evident here. But, um, and the patient, afterwards, the patient had a very long and very complicated recovery period with a lot of complications, uh, uh, multiple fever episodes, um, epileptic seizures, uh, uh, hydrocephalus because of the chronic hydrocephalus, uh, uh, ventricular peritoneal anastomosis was implanted on the 58th day of his hospitalization. And uh, afterwards, on day almost three um, months, he was at our hospital, but he was discharged uh, with some cognitive impairment and with no motor uh, deficit. So although this is not uh, the most representative case, I decided to show it because I would like to emphasize that the pathophysiology of subarachnoid hemorrhage is quite complex. The delayed cerebral ischemia is a multifactorial uh, process. The vasospasm is an important factor, but uh, it's not only the, va the vasospasm that matters, and even the poor grade patients, as was the example that I showed you, deserve their chance. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tanova. Is there any questions from the audience? Okay. I have a brief question. Why do you yes. do uh, stellatum blockade so late? It's, I think it's, e yes, uh, it's the, easy, e the it's very easy, easy. measure, That's and it gives, right. it, it gives you a few hours of... As I said, there is no... I put it in the third yeah. um, uh, tire, but actually it could be done really very early, and we are... I must confess that we are not performing it, but we have discussed with the neur neurosurgeons, and we are planning to perform it even in an earlier... Um, um, stage, so I totally agree that it could be done. It's easy and 
it, has, it can have good results. As a last resort, um, we have sometimes done continuous infusions of intra-arterial nimodipine, leaving the catheters inside. For how long? And um, for actually up to eight days, but uh, sometimes we have to change them, um, basically until the vasospasm phase is over. Sometimes you need several catheters. Um, not recommending this as the treatment of choice, but um, the um, uh, nimodipine does not. Uh, so the the half uh, the life is so short um, that that sometimes and it's been successful. So I think we've done six or seven cases and it has worked. You have to look for infection, of course. There are risks when you have to change the infusion that no air comes in. Yes, um, but is there also some effect of the blood pressure? How you continuously yes, yes the blood raise pressure. It? Uh, well, it, uh, there is the effect, but um, that is counteracted. So these patients were all um, so. uh, uh, still um, uh, asleep. So I yes, blood just pressure. Want, uh, to mention that we are still now fighting to get this access to the myurinone, but maybe Professor yeah. Hinkes will mm -hmm. tell us, is there a big difference if we start we, to use it? Yeah, we developed kind of an escalating scheme, starting with milrinone uh, as a first yes, attempt. You know. So we give uh, eight milligrams for 30 minutes uh, on a daily basis, and uh, if the patient continues to have even more vasospasm. We change, as Iris said, so a continuous infusion of nimodipine, the, the short-term infusion of nimodipine doesn't work. You have to give it over days. Mm -hmm. But it's always a trouble with the, the blood pressure, yeah. So it's important to, to know it. It's a very important topic, in my opinion, because the patient with sopranate hemorrhage, the procedure could be perfect, clipping or coiling. Exactly. And they can be not survival after 10 days. Mm -hmm. So it's and very important to And there to are a lot of things we can process. implement in our practice. Yes, it Thank you once again, Dr. Tanova. The next speaker is Dr. Alexander Sirakov from the same hospital. He's going to speak about treatment of uh, endoscopic treatment of cerebral aneurysms and the devices and techniques that are acutely developed last year. I'd um, like to thank the faculty for inviting me, and um, I'm going to present our single center experience with uh, recently introduced devices that are dedicated for the treatment of acutely ruptured uh, and wide neck cerebral aneurysms. Uh, it's a notorious fact that um, cerebral vascular diseases are the main burden in the Balkans and especially in Bulgaria when it comes to um, mortality and morbidity. Um, according to the uh, local governmental data and the national fund data, approximately 37,000 cases of cerebral vascular diseases are being diagnosed annually which means that uh, it's high likely for you to encounter SAH patients if you're dealing with this pathology. A um, couple of words, who are we and what do we do for a living? Uh, we are a small hospital, a neurovascular dedicated center. With, uh, within our department, there are two biplane angels dedicated for neurovascular procedures. Uh, we provide services for a variety of um, uh, cerebral vascular diseases, or in particular, ruptured and unruptured cerebral aneurysms, uh, brain AVMs, fistula, and spinal vascular pathologies. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a dedicated uh, emergency room nor a stroke care uh, unit, so we are unable to provide um, stroke treatment and mechanical trabectomy for our patients so far. Uh, when it comes to our protocol for dealing of, uh, with the, for the treatment of uh, acutely ruptured and wide neck uh, cerebral aneurysms, we usually um, start with uh, simple coiling. That's, the, uh, that's a really effective technique, but sometimes that's uh, really not that much. Um, you cannot uh, build a stable basket inside the uh, wide neck aneurysm. So uh, as a second treatment option, we, uh, we rely on the well-known uh, balloon-assisted coiling. Um, it's really effective and um, considered safe, but sometimes this technique poses some serious limitation in, in terms of uh, navigation into the distal vasculature or um, thromboembolic complications due to the occlusive nature of the uh, microcatheter balloon. When it comes to uh, recently introduced device, we do have some solid experience with the um, temporary neck bridging devices, uh, the Cascade and the Kamanechi stents. Both of them are um, temporary, manually controllable uh, implants that are uh, aimed to reconstruct the aneurysm neck. 
so you can achieve better coiling and uh, better occlusion rates inside a complex aneurysm. And as a last resort in our department, we use combined approach uh, with the implementation of a um, microcatheter balloon and the uh, Kamanechi or Cascade device. Um, we call this technique the hybrid technique. So for the sake of entertainment, I'm gonna show you um, like 10 cases, uh, most difficult cases we, we successfully treated uh, during the last few years. Um, this is a uh, case of a ruptured uh, ACOME aneurysm. It is a tiny little aneurysm, but the, uh, with extremely wide, net, uh, wide neck open to the uh, A2A1 complex. What we did over here is we embolized the aneurysm with uh, balloon-assisted coiling. It was highly effective, and you can see the compliant nature of the balloon uh, successfully remodeling the neck. Uh, therefore, we managed to completely uh, occlude the uh, aneurysm sac with the, um, as you can see, on the final, on the final DSA. Another, another patient with, uh, that was treated with uh, balloon remodeling, it was acutely ruptured um, PC, uh, right PCA aneurysm. Actually, we approached the patient for simple coiling, unfortunately, due to uh, the presence of a second lobby of the aneurysm proximally located. The coils were uh, kind of unstable where they were protruding to the parent artery, and uh, therefore we uh, introduced a microcatheter balloon just beneath the aneurysm neck and successfully coiled the aneurysm. Uh, when it comes to new devices, that's the notorious Kumanechi device. Uh, that's the manually controllable handle. Uh, you can uh, adjust the uh, level of expansion of the device. It's a uh, non-occlusive braided mesh uh, that offers uh, temporary protection of the uh, parent vessel in incorporated branches or the inner model successfully the aneurysm neck. It's fully radio pack and it's quite easy to control. Um, I'm going to show you some classical examples from our practice. Uh, that's a, uh, a rup acutely ruptured mid basilar aneurysm that was uh, kind of difficult to call, though, because of the uh, wide neck. You can see up to almost 7.5 millimeters in diameter. So what we did over here is we implanted this device across the basilar artery and the aneurysm neck, so we uh, successfully called the, the aneurysm what the, aneurysm, uh, what the device did is it kept the uh, basilar artery patent during the embolization because it's not occlusive and successfully remodeled the neck, gave us enough support to occlude the aneurysm with the, uh, with the embolizational coils. Um, another tough case, uh, I think that's the most challenging uh, Kamanechi case we did ever. Uh, it was a um, double rupture, actually. The patient had two intraparenchymal hematomas next to each other. Um, uh, our strategy was to uh, embolize both of the MCA aneurysms in one endovascular session. So we approached the distally located aneurysm first. As you can see on the 3D reconstructions, uh, the, 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 although there is a well-defined sac, the, the, the presence of the, 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 the wide neck is, the neck is really wide and there is the presence of branches. The proximal M, M2 branches are incorporated inside the aneurysm. So we were unable to achieve a stable, a stable uh, coil basket inside the aneurysm without any sort of protection. So what we did over here is we um, implanted the Kamanechi into the upper branch of the aneurysm. Therefore, we managed to successfully occlude the distally located aneurysm and we moved to the proximal one. Um, that's the second option we got in our department. It's called the Cascade Occlusive Net. Uh, I gotta say that both devices are like conceptually, conceptually speaking, they are the same, but meanwhile, they are extremely different because uh, I don't know if you noted, but the Kamanechi contracts in a um, crescent-like uh, shape, and the tip is kind of flexible. Sometimes it can cause like uh, uh, device-related vasospasm. But um, the um, Cascade device contracts back and forth, and uh, uh, it's actually mesh is kind of denser than the Kamanechi. <clears throat> um, that's uh, ACOM, ruptured ACOM complex aneurysm. Um, we had some troubles to uh, successfully maintain stability of the coils inside the sac. So what we did is uh, we implanted uh, the cascade device across the uh, A1, A2 transition and successfully embolized the uh, aneurysm. 
Another classical example uh, of cascade coiling, that was a, a really old lady with a nasty looking aneurysm of the uh, vertebral basal wall system. What we did over here is, uh, we actually were really desperate about this case because you can see that the, 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 the neck is really awful and the, the, the whole morphology of the vertebral basal wall system is, yeah, ugly looking. So what we did over here was we catheterized the, the, the sac and successfully implemented the uh, cascade device across the uh, vertebral basal wall system and um, we completely embolized the uh, aneurysm. These are the final results. Uh, the devices uh, are really good. They are um, controllable. You can uh, manipulate with the, the, the porosity of the mesh. They are easily visible. You can see on the fluoroscopic images over here. Uh, when it comes to like complex aneurysms located at the level of bifurcations, uh, we use that fancy hybrid technique we call. Um, that's a ruptured ACOM aneurysm. Um, the problem here was the fact that uh, both A2 were next to the aneurysm neck. What we did is uh, we successfully catheterized um, both arteries and we placed the um, compliant, extra compliant balloon in the lower branch and a Kamenechi device in the superior branch. Um, it's a really good technique because it combines both the, uh, the, 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 the ability of the um, microcatheter balloon to reconstruct and obstruct the bore fall, and then you have the Kamanechi uh, uh, next to the microcatheter balloon. This, this is the final result with the complete obliteration. Honestly, I think that's actually the uh, second year follow-up or something like that, so the result was really, pretty good. Uh, another case example of um, simu the simultaneous application of um, microcatheter balloon in Komanechi, uh, uh, wide neck, uh, basilar tip aneurysm that was approached with the uh, balloon into the right PCA and a uh, Komanechi device into the uh, left PCA. You can see uh, how well both devices reconstruct and bridge the neck, and therefore we managed to obliterate the aneurysms the aneurysm with coils, and then that's the final result with full patency of the vertebral basal wall system. So the summary is, yeah, coiling is efficient, I, I gotta say, but sometimes uh, it's really difficult to like completely obliterate the uh, aneurysm with only coils. So uh, nowadays there are a variety of new uh, devices available on the market, and um, we would like to highlight that uh, the learning curve with those devices is extremely important and essential for your success. I would like to thank you with this impressive piece of art of ours that we managed to publish on the front cover of the Neurosurgery uh, Journal. Thank you very much. Nice. Thank you, Dr. Sirakov, that you also managed to be in the time without any delay. So any questions from the audience? Are you giving aspirin? Have you used the uh, Comanechi? No, Professor. I, from what I know from the literature, there was a, a German group that actually did um, Comanechi in uh, non-acute uh, scenarios, uh, prof, uh, Dr. Fisher or something like that. Uh, our experience with the, this device or any temporary uh, bridging device uh, under the circumstances of SAH is without any, dual, uh, any mono or dual antiplatelets. We just do regular heparinization at the start and that's it. But you give heparin? Yes. Yes, you give heparin? yes, uh, yes. I can add that because that was a completely new device which we have to start like pioneers. They uh, advocate that we have to put a dual antiplatelet therapy to do elective cases. I didn't want to start with elective cases of the device I didn't want. So the first uh, like 20 cases was only rupture cases in acute scenarios, so we didn't put aspirin for them. And we managed to, to conclude after more than 160 patients. Yeah, Maybe something like that. 80% or... of them acutely ruptured. We don't need aspirin. We didn't see more complications compared to the balloon. Uh, the, the, yeah, the thromboembolic complications from this technique is, are, are relatively rare. Maybe the only complications we've seen so far is the dreadful movement of the tip. Sometimes it like, tends to m migrate or uh, irritate the vessel that, that, that's dis distally located. Uh, the, 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 the solid argument towards no antiplatelets was the uh, open cell design of the, uh, the uh, semi-looking stent. And, um, the, the fact that it doesn't block the blood flow inside the parent vessel across the aneurysm. 
Thank you. Once again, I want to invite Professor Hans Henkes, who is going to present uh, his endovascular treatment experience with large and giant rupture, cerebral aneurysms. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, so the, the majority of ruptured aneurysms are fortunately neither large nor giant, they are small. And it's a, a terrible misconception to think that small aneurysms are harmless. The opposite is true. So the majority of aneurysms we see in a ruptured condition are between three and six millimeters. Um, and on the other hand, large and giant aneurysms frequently are real, a, a technical challenge for both microsurgery or endovascular treatment. And there is uh, certainly no universal standard solution for these aneurysms. And uh, we go for a totally individualized treatment concept in the far majority of cases. So we have a statistics for, from 2007 to uh, 2020 with uh, 983 ruptured aneurysms we treated. And uh, nine. 0.7% were large and uh, only 0.8% were giant. So giant, ruptured giant aneurysms are really rare. Uh, you may argue that the majority of these patients may not come to medical attention because they simply die before the, from the rupture before they arrive on the angio table. So these are uh, three examples. This is a uh, ruptured internal carotid artery aneurysm, the ACOM aneurysm, uh, fusiform basilar arteries, the so-called megadolico ectatic basilar artery, and all these patients died. As you see here, there's already massive hematoma and um, midline herniation. Uh, this is uh, instantaneous increase of um, intracranial pressure and the interruption of cerebral perfusion, and these aneurysms usually destroy the, uh, the brainstem of the patients. For, th for those patients, there is no endovascular treatment. The only thing you can do is to fill out the death certificate. Um, clipping of these aneurysms is frequently uh, propagated, however, uh, together with the removal of the hematoma, however, clipping of these aneurysms is everything but easy. As you see here, this was done by a really experienced neurosurgeon. As you see here, most of the middle cerebral artery is missing after the clipping. So he, he clipped the aneurysm, but uh, in the very same moment, he clipped most of the middle cerebral artery. Um, even if we do something for these patients. Uh, in that particular case, this was a, a, a PCOM aneurysm. We coiled it partially, knowing that uh, knowing that uh, this partial coiling in the far majority of cases is, is enough to prevent re-rupture. So uh, it, this looks not very elegant, but uh, as a matter of fact, if you wait for half an hour, the aneurysm is going to be thrombosed and uh, will not re-rupture most likely. However, the patient eventually died from uh, vasospasm in both uh, anterior cerebral arteries. So he had uh, secondary vasospasm and uh, died from the increase, uh, vasospasm induced um, increase of the uh, intracranial pressure. So the, uh, it, is, it makes little sense to, to show maximum effort in the acute phase because whatever you do, the, the majority of these patients are going to die anyways. This was a, uh, a young lady. She was, she was uh, presenting at 10 in the evening in a, in a hospital with severe headache. They gave her uh, migraines, um, didn't do any, anything, gave her migraines medication and sent her home. Two hours later, uh, four hours later, she lost consciousness and she was living in, a, in an odd place. So it took three hours to bring her from the room to the ambulance. So they had to uh, do any kind of uh, uh, technical things to bring her out of the home. And uh, when she arrived, she was deeply comatose. The uh, pupils were still constricted. And you see here, there's a massive uh, uh, hemorrhage in front of the, the brainstem. And the, it was a, a very odd dissecting aneurysm. As you see here, the uh, basilar artery is dissecting all the way up. And the uh, uh, posterior cerebral arteries and the uh, superior cerebellar arteries are coming from the, the top of this kind of a, a balloon. So, nicely shown here. These are the posterior cerebral arteries, the superior cerebellar arteries. So what to do here? Um, fortunately, she had a, a competent PCOM, so the posterior communicating artery had the connection to the posterior cerebral artery. So the, the only technical solution we had was putting a piconus, a, a stent, underneath the bifurcation of the basal arteries. We coiled everything below everything underneath the piconus. So this, you, you may call it the inverted piconus technique. So the, usually you put the piconus and you co would call this in that case, you would occlude everything. So we, we did the opposite, what, is you, what the, the uh, piconus is, is meant for, 
piconus uh, crowns underneath the bifurcation that we coiled here, and uh, we were able to keep the bifurcation patent. And unfortunately, she died from uh, hypoxic brain damage. This was a case, I think, in retrospect, the patient was very lucky because the neurosurgeon on call was an unexperienced beginner, and he said uh, uh, that this aneurysm is beyond my uh, horizon, do something. And uh, despite this uh, huge hemorrhage, we, we went ahead with the, this piconus. This is the stent at this level, at the neck level of the aneurysm. We put the stent here, um, gave aspirin and uh, uh, brassogral and uh, coiled the aneurysm on the next morning, the bus came and uh, evacuated the hematoma and the patient had a perfect recovery without the need to clip this aneurysm. The, the, the attempt to clip this aneurysm most likely would have ended uh, similar to the case before with, uh, with obliteration of the, uh, the, most of the uh, MC branches. Um, this is a, a huge basilar bifurcation aneurysm, again treated with a piconus stent, and I want to show uh, that to, to leave this remnant of the aneurysm in the acute phase is uh, just right. So it, it, it makes absolutely no sense to try to, in, in this acute phase, to reconstruct the uh, bifurcation of the basilar artery. It, it simply increases the risk. It has no benefit for the patient. This can be done later. In, in case the patient survives, uh, we would rather do this, let's say, six weeks or two months later. And uh, the risk of re-rupture from this uh, remnant of the aneurysm close to the uh, basilar bifurcation is very little if, if uh, not inexistent. Uh, another uh, concept of treatment, this was a ruptured uh, parathermic aneurysm. This is the aneurysm uh, severe hemorrhage and has four. The uh, parathermic aneurysm has not a really wide neck, but it's, it's uh, unfortunate anatomy. So we, we coiled the aneurysm, leaving the neck remnant, and uh, once the, the patient recovered, we came back, put a floater verter underneath the uh, aneurysm neck, and this is uh, June 2017, and the uh, follow-up in January 2019, you see the uh, uh, parathalmic part of the segment of the internal carotid artery is beautifully re reconstructed. The uh, aneurysm is uh, completely isolated from the blood circulation with a very good clinical outcome. So it, it, it makes uh, a lot of sense to, uh, to go for partial treatment in the acute phase and to, to go for perfection in case the, uh, the patient was able to survive for the following, I don't know, six, eight weeks. This was a very, very interesting patient, the, a young man. He came as polytrauma to us. Uh, his only polytrauma was the fact that he was working in the uh, office as a, a public relations manager and he, he was falling off his chair. So this was his polytrauma. He had no trauma, actually. He, he, he had, uh, at the very same moment, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and a retroperitoneal hemorrhage uh, due to the rupture of a uh, lienal artery aneurysm. The underlying ves vessel disorder was uh, segmental arterial mediolysis, um, which caused, so this was cl clearly uh, a serious problem, but he was about to die from the uh, ruptured uh, intraabdominal aneurysm. He uh, underwent splenectomy. We did an angiogram, and the only thing we saw which was not normal was this little blep on the basilar artery. This was on uh, April 2016, 25th of April 2016. He was uh, surprisingly recovering from both conditions until the moment in, uh, on the 10th of May, so this is uh, 15 days later, 10th of May, he re-ruptured. And the, the angiogram now showed that the uh, uh, dissection of the basilar artery now has developed to a huge dissecting aneurysm of the basilar trunk. and. Uh, uh, I mean, as you can imagine, this is a real challenge. So what we did is uh, we uh, went for partial coiling of the aneurysm very carefully, knowing that these uh, kind of pseudo aneurysms are extremely fragile. It's, you just touch the wall and they, they go down. So we partially coiled, loosely coiled the aneurysm, uh, gave um, aspirin and uh, brassogral to the patient, and uh, implanted a floater verter. This is one year follow up. The, uh, uh, the, the patient fully recovered. The, on, the only real complication was the sister of the patient. She, she studied Heid, in medicine in Heidelberg, um, and she explained us that this is kind of an experimental treatment which should, should not be done. <laughs> 
So the um, uh, large and giant aneurysms are fortunately rare. The, the rupture risk is very high, and those aneurysms should not be observed. They should be treated right away. It makes no sense to go for any kind of conservative management. Um, the, most of those can be treated by vascular, endovascular means. Uh, as you have seen, sometimes some sort of creativity is necessary to get get rid of these aneurysms. Um, parent vessel occlusion is, still remains a good choice for giant aneurysms, especially in, for paraophthalmic and uh, PCOM aneurysms if the patient has a complete uh, circle of villus. Flow diversion uh, or a combination of uh, flow diversion and uh, coil occlusion is a very good choice and it's an appealing option, especially for large and giant sidewall aneurysms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Henkes, for sharing your experience. Is there any questions from the audience? Thomas, I'd have a question. Um, we know that uh, when patients um, have stress, like in subarnot hemorrhage, that uh, then the platelets recover faster. Um, have you seen that? Do you see that? Do you train, or how often do you check for um, anticoagulation? Do you use a different regime? Do you need higher doses? Um, yeah, we. Um, in, in the era of uh, standard assisted coiling and, and flow diversion, we use a lot of uh, uh, implant, a lot of uh, highly thrombogenic implants. As a matter of rule, a, a, a rule of thumb, I would say, while 100 milligrams are enough for a patient in a regular condition, uh, we start after, for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage with three times 500 milligram per day in the morning. Um, midday and evening 500 milligram IV, then we start measuring this. We, we measure the response and then we are tailoring the dosage. There, you, you, you see patients needing two or three grams of aspirin in the acute phase after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So for, forget about 100 milligram, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And one more question for me. You mentioned this, uh, in this case, where the, the rupture MCA with intracranial hematoma. So the not so experienced uh, neurosurgeon referred it to you. And you mentioned that the next day, under dual antiplatelet therapy, they mm. evacuate the hematoma. Sure. Do you have a tough discussion to, to ask them to do the evacuation of the hematoma under dual antiplatelet therapy in our department? For, for any reason, I, I cannot tell you why. For any reason, uh, the combination of aspirin and brillic for surgery is terrible. Uh, the, these patients are bleeding like hell. The, and for any other reason, the combination of brasugrel and aspirin is much better. Not only a, a prosugrel, plus aspirin. Uh, yeah, and uh, this was an uncoded, this year, a year old case. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, this was aspirin and, and prosugrel prior surgery, no, no and, serious hemorrhage. And my question if I have to do it in my department, I will have just no answer to me from my neurosurgeons. If I ask them to evacuate hematoma under aspirin. So this was done by this, the boss. He previously had a, a colleague he, from Russia. I, 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 he did everything for me for one bottle. So every aneurysm was one bottle of vodka. So you, you should find any deal with, the, with these guys uh, <laughs> to help you. I understand. It's interesting. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Uh, so we can start you know, uh, with one of the pre-recorded cases because we are very in front of the time. I don't want to delay for the lunch. Can you please start with the second pre-recorded case we prepared? After that, we have a bigger time for in the second pre-recorded uh, case spot so we can do the rest of the cases then. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry that we don't have life condition cases. Uh, it was not possible, so we decided to, to choose maybe more interesting or challenging cases in our department. We have performed, so I'll start briefly with the history. It's a rupture, basilar mid basilar aneurysm, very hairy condition. You see it's like a dissecting aneurysm in which we decided to treat it in acute phase with this new P48 stent with coating. It's called HPC, hydrophilic coating, which uh, allowed, allowed us to put the patient under only mono antiplated therapy. So this is the images uh, from the procedure. Interarterial DCA, we saw the wide neck, like I said, basilar mid aneurysm. And because it's acutely ruptured, we gelled, gelled a microcatheter inside with the idea to put several coils just to induce faster thrombosis inside and to, be, to feel more safe about the next days and to prevent maybe a quickly re-rupture of the aneurysm. So this is the navigation inside 
with the first microcatheter. This is already you can see on non subtracting images without the roadmap. This is the navigation with the second microcatheter with which we can uh, de um, deploy the flow diverter. Like I said, it's P48 flow diverter with HPC coating. We load the patient before the procedure, so one hour before the anesthesia. We load uh, the patient with 50 milligrams of prasugrel. Uh, so we start the procedure. This is the navigation. We go for the left uh, PCA because the anatomy, an anatomic variation was easier to navigate. So the next step is delivering the, micro, uh, delivering the stent inside the microcatheter. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was Phenom 21, the catheter we used for the, I didn't mention, the P48 stents coming through a 021 catheter. So this is delivering of the stent. Like you see, we just halfly unsheet some portion of the coil. So the first microcatheter is inside the aneurysm if there is any, uh, any introduction be between the two, two micros. So here is the tip. You can see it on the non-subtracting images uh, above. Here is the tip of the stent. The stent is still inside the microcatheter. So here we are placing the landing zone we desire. So we can cover completely the aneurysm neck. It was very wide necked. I think it's around 10 millimeters. The stent is 18. So we have to be very precise to have four millimeters above and four, uh, distal and four millimeters proximal to the aneurysm. You can see it's very radio packed, it's very nice scene. So we here reach, if you can see, the point of no return to the stent. This stent could be reached at around 70 to 80 percent of its length. So we stop here, we start to coil. I didn't deliver completely the stent, so I didn't want to move it or to dislodge it during the coiling. So I decided now to put the first coil. Like you see, I didn't like the projection of the first coil where it was going like a mid buzzer so I tried to play with it. I used the protection of the halfly uh, 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 sheeted stand. It's like a temporary stand for your coiling. So we are very carefully, very gently, just one long coil, and we decided to not waste time to stay with this halfly deployed stand. After is, the first coil... This is a 3D coil? coil? Sorry? This is a 3D coil or a helical? Uh, it's three, 360 of striker, I think. The longest they have is 50 centimeters. That's why we chose it. Not to lose time to deploy another one and to coil it. So when we are... S I was satisfied with the position of the coil, I detached it. And you will see very nicely how, when you just push the stent from the point of no return, it perfectly applied to the basal or mid artery. I lied to you, there is a second coil. Sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot it. We do like uh, the professor said in his presentation, loose coiling here. We have a flow diverter stent. We just want to reduce the chance of earlier rupture of the aneurysm. So here we're starting to deploy the stent, uh, removing first the microcatheter for the coiling. And now we are ready to deploy fully the stent. And then look, uh, you can see it above. It's perfectly applied, apply, just covering the neck of the aneurysm. So we are going to do a final run to, to see everything is in place and at the desired positions. This is the removal of the wire of the stand. I didn't uh, want to go through the stand here because I like the uh, positioning to the wall. I didn't want to change something of the structure of the stand. And this is the final result. It, uh, I said very good stagnation of contrast with the coil. So it was one of our first cases in which we introduced the stent with the HPC coating in an acute phase. So thank you for that. I think we are already five minutes past, past okay. the time. We can do the lunch and 
immediately after that we can continue with. Or if you prefer, we can continue with the, with the lectures. For the program, now we have a lunch break. It's up to you. Let's continue. OK, then can we start? I think we are still in the time frame because I have three more recorded cases and the second recorded gap we have is a bigger. I can present it over there and now to do the, the break if you want. Okay. Now, without the break. No. Okay? Can you play the first case? The first case is... Uh, a juvenile giant aneurysm of 19 years old boy with just uh, neurological intact with headaches. This is the anatomy of the aneurysm. Like you can see, it's a very nasty aneurysm, it's like dissecting M1 segment. These are the DSA runs during the diagnostics. So there is no option for a classical surgery here. We spoke with the boy and the relatives and we decided to go for the endoscore treatment in which our strategy was to put a flow diverter stand from the healthy portion of the M2 segment and not to cover the A1 origin. So we have to finish just before the origin of the A1 segment. Uh, for this uh, purpose, I think the best stand available on the market is the P64 stand. Like you know, it's completely resheatable. You can deliver it completely, fully, and it's with, uh, at the proximal end, there is of eight markers. They're gathered, to, uh, gathered together. So when you decided this is your position, you can just detach it. So in this case, you, sh uh, you, you will see we have to put several positioning of the stand until we were satisfied with the positioning of it. It's a very long lesion. Uh, we have the same strategy here. We gel the first catheter just to put uh, several coils inside and to induce faster thrombosis. And this here is the microcatheter for the stent. We go to the healthy M2 portion of the left MCA. Uh, we, uh, we used 4.5 by 27. It's a very, very long stent, but we, we really want to cover it correctly. And like I will repeat myself, I, we didn't uh, want intended, intentionally to cover the A1 origin of the left uh, AC. So here is coming the second microcatheter, I think, for the, for the coiling. We didn't use uh, distal access catheter. It's a young boy, so we used six French chaperone, I think, here. Uh, the Petroso sinus, uh, uh, the Petroso segment. Uh, if I remember correctly, we use most likely the Echelon microcatheter for the coiling, and uh, here is XT27, headway has the XT27 for the delivering of the flow diverter stand. So we are going with the wire inside the aneurysm sac, and just leave it here for the coils. It's very easy when you have biplane because you can orientate yourself for more things even during the navigation. So you can see here the first coil, we, again, we will halfly deploy it. Like you see, without any protection, the coil will penetrate or uh, contribute inside the parent artery. So we leave it like that to be less traumatic. Without the roadmap uh, below, you can see the delivery of the stent. Again, there is a tip. After like five to 10 millimeters behind, five millimeters behind the tip, there is the actual stent inside. So we are no, so not uh, much experience compared to Professor Henkers. So I cannot uh, guess where, if it's unconstructed inside the catheter, where should I start? With the microcut and with the stent, so to be completely sure where I will finish. In, on Thursday, we performed a case together with the professor. He told me some tips and tricks where we should I 
observe and watch inside the microcatheter so I can guess almost correctly where you finish. But I won't share, you, share it with you. It's only for me. So here we unsheet the stand. I will start slowly retract the microcatheter while holding the, the stent in place. C can you see it correctly? Okay. So here is the wire of the stent. And now it's starting to come the, the stent itself. You can see it's very nicely opened. So we just continue. This P64 stand has additional wire around it, which is very nice radio packed. And you can see, it, is it a good op uh, well opened? Is uh, the good position of the door on the lateral view? Uh, the right monitor, you can see how it's uh, stay inside the M2 segment. So here was our first try. We have like 10 millimeters more to the A1 segment, so I decided to resheat completely the stand and to try to go more proximally. It's really a beauty with this stand when you are not very experienced physicians because if you don't like the position, if it's not open, at least you can remove it safely. But the best, the best thing, you can resheat it or deploy it up to three times. The company says up to three times it should be safe. So I go a little bit more proximally this time. You can see it here. Here is the end of the stand. So here is the A1. I have five millimeters more. So I was maybe more aggressive this day, I, I decided to resheat it again and to go five millimeters more proximally for perfect wall positioning and more stability in the M1, M1 segment. So again, I go a little bit more proximally and it's completely delivering of the stand. Now we were satisfied with the position. I point you with the wazer where the, these eight markers are together. So now you just unleash it from their hyper tube, and then and they then we we'll, these markers will become eight. So this means the stain is completely open. Before that, I finished with the coil. I was prepared for the sack. Here is here is uh, still didn't did not detach the stand. Here you can see the markers are still at at once. Here is on the lateral view. So I just put one coil. I think it was one call, remove the catheter, so I didn't want to change something with the already deployed stand. Then I detach it. So we now remove the micro catheter for the coiling. <coughs> And now is the time to see these markers becoming eight. Here. You see the stent? Just do some tension and the stent is opened. It becomes like, like a sleeve. On the lateral view, you can see it here. You see it? The markers. So they are completely opened for the nominal of the vessel stand. Now we are removing the wire, the delivery wire, do a final run, and we have six months, I think, and nine months co control for these patients with complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Very nice reconstruction of the stand, uh, of the vessel. So now you see the final run.
very good sublimation, this ugly looking anevrism. And I put se several images, now you'll see it, the next one, from the first control on the first month, uh, on the six months. This is complete reconstructions of the vessels. Very nice, with no feeling inside the sac. So that was the second case. And now we have 40 minutes for lunch and poster session evaluation. Thank you once again. Is there any questions about the recorded cases? Okay, thank you. Have a nice lunch. Mm -hmm.
try to start now because we are a little already late. I will ask again Professor Henkes to share his experience with this new HPC coating for the stents, maybe stents of the future. You're welcome. Yeah, good, good afternoon. Um, th this is not, not the easiest topic, to be honest. Um, if, if you look at, uh, <coughs> these are flow diverters. If you look at flow diverters, which has been exposed to uh, blood, you will see uh, after a few minutes, they're going to be thrombos. So they are filled with coagulated blood. And those are flow diverters. So these are regular flow diverters, the first three lines. For regular flow diverters, if you look at reg uh, coated flow diverters, same conditions, exposure to full blood, no thrombus formation. So this is the summary of the whole topic. Um, this work, uh, in many aspects, is certainly beyond the intellectual horizon of a neuroradiologist, as you may observe. And I, I did this uh, w with several people together. One of those is uh, Dr. Lenz Habian. He's a, a biologist and a genius. So the con our conflict is that I'm <clears throat> co-founder and shareholder of the company, which has financed this development. And uh, Tim is the, one of our employees. If we speak about uh, stenting his, uh, history, uh, it is not, uh, the, the history is not very long. Uh, if you look here, the first coronary stenting for, uh, to treat acute myocardial infarctions was not earlier than 1991. And in 1991, uh, 1999, the, uh, the first drug eluting stents came to the market. So we, we are, uh, the, the drug eluting technology, surface modification of stents has a relatively short history. These first generation drug eluting stents were not anti-thrombogenic. They had a totally different uh, purpose. The, the, the purpose of this uh, coating was to reduce and inhibit the uh, vascular cell proliferation, though they were fully thrombogenic, but they had a biologic effect on the endothelium. Always niche came up with a stand which had both features. The combo stand uh, combines the uh, uh, inner surface, a luminal surface coating with, with uh, circulating, which is attracting circulating uh, adult endothelial progenitor cells. They are cap captured from the blood and they are accelerating the endothelialization of these stents. Again, fully thrombogenic, but this was a, one of the earlier concepts to reduce in the midterm the thrombogenicity of the stents and the uh, outer surface, the, the uh, abluminal surface of the stent again has sirolimus as an anti-proliferate drug. Polycene F, um, this, this is a stand, uh, a stand with polycene F coating, a cobalt chromium alloy stand with a, a nano coating polycene F has exactly the same effect. The, the purpose of this coating is again not anti-thrombogenic. The purpose is to accelerate the process of endothelialization. However, we have to keep in mind and we have to admit it is quite effective in terms of reducing thrombogenicity in the sense that the, uh, uh, the phase for dual antiplatelet uh, inhibition, which is needed, is reduced to two weeks only. That's a significant improvement against the, the regular drug eluting stents, which uh, previously needed one year of uh, dual antiplatelets and now uh, mostly are implanted under six months. So th the thrombogenicity is the same. However, the endothelialization is accelerated. So what's about the uh, dual platelet inhibitions? It, the, it is increasing the, uh, hemorrhage, the risk of hemorrhagic complications. In our field, in neuroradiology, mainly the risk of uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, if the patients are non-responders to aspirin or clopidogrel or any other P2Y12 receptor antagonist, uh, we may observe uh, thrombus device thrombosis. And uh, there are other aspects like drug interaction, for instance, ibuprofen is completely antagonizing aspirin. Um, we have, this was mentioned previously this day, uh, um, variable dosage requirements. The patient had a subrocnoid hemorrhage, the dosage requirement goes through the roof. And we face in patients who are properly inhibited after two weeks, two months, or at any point in time, uh, the possibility of hyper or hypo response, which may be there in the beginning or which may develop on the way. So the, the so-called holy grail of neurovascular standing is to re, uh, avoid the need for dual antiplatelet medication by reducing the thrombogenicity of the surface. These are, mo in the majority of cases, 19-old stents. And uh, we, put, we, we try to put something on the surface which is preventing platelets to accumulate and adhere on the surface of these uh, implants. 
So in a in a perfect coding, uh, this would be allow this would be uh, possible to to implant without any uh, accompanying medication, and we are far away from this. I have to admit. But we are now in the situation when we can go from dual to mono anti-aggregation. These are historical examples. For instance, uh, gold coating was uh, combined with hirudin coating. Gold has no effect on the thrombogenicity. Hirudin is reducing the thrombogenicity. However, it's, it's short acting. So it, it, it works for one or two days and then it's, it's washed off and uh, you have the full throm fully thrombogenic gold coating. So it is short term, okay, but it does not avoid the, the need for um, a dual antiplatelet medication. The uh, uh, diamond-like carbon technology was quite interesting. Diamond-like uh, diamond carbon is a surface coating which makes the surface of the stents smoother. Uh, however, they show full thrombogenicity. It has no effect on the platelet adhesion. Um, Heparin coating was done. Heparin is okay. It is reducing short term the thrombogenicity, but uh, it is not effective uh, for several weeks or months. The first successful um, uh, substance which was invented is um, um, phosphorylcholine. Uh, the, the data go back to 1984. These gentlemen, Hayward and Chapman, they uh, the, uh, discovered and evaluated phosphorylcholine and could show that uh, phosphorylcholine is reducing the thrombogenicity and this is what is used today for um, the Florida Verda from Medronic, which is called the uh, SHIELD technology. It's a pretty old technology, uh, but it's certainly uh, anti-thrombogenic. These are the molecules on the surface which inhibit the, thromb the thrombus adhesion. This is a comparison. Flex is the uncoated device, and shield is the, uh, the coated device. And the, the higher the curve, the more thrombogenous is the, the product. And you see the flex is, is uh, three times more thrombogenous than the shield. And this is just empty, no, no thing. So it is, let's say the shield is double as thrombogenic like uh, the, um, uh, the, the empty tube but it has uh, significantly reduced thrombogenicity. They compared uh, the Rivo P64 uncoated pipeline, uncoated and pipeline shield, and as you see here, the, the longer the bar, the, the higher the endothrombogenic effect, and uh, pipeline shield is highly endothrombogenic. Uh, pipeline uncoated and the Rivo uncoated are extremely thrombogenic, and uh, P64 is more or less in the middle between the two. And, uh, um, uh, Acandis is uh, pr propagating Pluxide, which is not a coating. It is a surface uh, modification, which again, as you see here, does not reduce the thermogenicity. This is a, a very typical image, what, what you can get with uh, full blood exposure of different products and uh, doing electron microscopy afterwards. So the Rivo P64 pipeline, pipeline shield, you see there's almost no uh, cell adhesion and thrombus adhesion on this shield a pipeline, and there's uh, a lot of thrombus adhesion and thrombus formation on the non-coded um, uh, surfaces. So pipeline shield and phosphorylcholine is simulating the effect of erythrocytes. It, it is uh, as anti-thrombogenic as the surface of red blood cells. This is a totally different concept. This is the, the, the concept we were following, and uh, this glucocalyx is the inner slimy surface on the uh, vascular inner liner, and the, the substance we are using is a, a nanoglycane-based um, substance, which is uh, put on the surface of these implants on a, a nanoscale thickness. Uh, this is simulating not the erythrocytes, it's simulating the inner surface of arteries with the same effect. So this is bare and uh, HPC coated devices in comparison, full, blo full blood, whole blood exposure, and uh, fluorescent microscopy, and you see there are a lot of uh, platelets on the surface of the bare layer, and this uh, HPC coating is preventing the uh, uh, platelet adhesion. The same is true for a flutter verter. This is flutter verter without coating and with coating. And this shows a, uh, an experiment. So uh, the, the, the regular exposure is for minutes. So this, this is called a, uh, uh, a loop device, this gentler loop. And this allows exposure experiments for hours. You, could, you can do this in these rotating loops for uh, hours and days. 
same result. Uh, uncoated versus coated, you have uh, a lot of uh, thrombus material on the uncoated surface and nothing on the coated surface. And uh, we were lucky to receive an award for this publication from CVIR. We tested this in, uh, in animals and saw that there is no difference in the process of endothelialization, which means in difference to the uh, polycene F, uh, with this coating we don't observe, unfortunately, an accelerated endothelialization. The speed of endothelialization for uncoated and HPC-coated devices is the same. Uh, there are new uh, pro um, projects coming up. Uh, CD31 uh, coating is tried by, uh, from BALT. They, uh, they try to uh, uh, coat their float averters, and this is uh, the... the um, uh, the, the effect is main, probably mainly, again, this accelerated endothelialization. In vitro results, however, show that also the need for uh, acute anti-aggregation is uh, reduced. No, today, nobody knows if this uh, CD31 coding is, will, will allow to, to implant these devices under mono-aggregation. There are no clinical data available so far. And uh, Akandis has uh, another project, Derivo Heal which means uh, another coating. This Derivio heel is a combination of, um, it is heparin-based essentially, and um, it may work, however, again, the in vitro results mainly shows, as far as they are published, it shows um, biocompatibility, but the uh, um, anti-aggregation or th reduced homogenicity effect has not been shown so far. The last principle is uh, this uh, X coating from uh, Teruma. It's an old coating which was originally used to uh, coat uh, infusion bags and tubes and everything. It, and it has been uh, adapted to the technology of permanent implants. Uh, again, data are not available. So the, these were the original X coated products. And now they have a, uh, a floater with, with X coating, but they, they don't claim uh, full. Uh, redu fully reduced th thermogenicity. So in summary, we can say the HPC uh, definitely reduces significantly the thermogenicity of these implants. Uh, pipeline shield, the same. The difference is between the two is not known. The uh, push force is uh, reduced for pipeline shield, and, and it is not very significant for the uh, uh, Phoenix floater radar, so it's no big deal. The Derivo heel, uh, we see some th reduced some thermogenicity and accelerator incro. The uh, incro uh, acceleration is more significant with this polycene F, and CD34 and X uh, have hardly defined pr uh, properties at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Very fascinating uh, lecture you had. Well, maybe this is real the future of the, of the stands. Sure. Is there any questions because he's in a hurry for the flight, his flight? So, okay, there is no. Thank you once again for your contribution. Have a nice flight back. Thank you. See you. So the next uh, lecture is going to be presented by Dr. Uh, Alyoski with com Petrov, Petrov, okay, with a complication by endoscope treatment. So the floor. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Mikhail Petrov. I'm a neurosurgeon from the Department of Neuro Neurosurgery, uh, Pirgov Hospital. Uh, we saw some wonderful cases in the live and recorded session so far. So now I guess it's time for really bad cases, cases that uh, make you wonder why did I become a doctor. So this is uh, the topic about complications. Uh, <clears throat> if anything can go wrong, it will definitely go wrong. Unfortunately, this is the case in uh, endovascular neurosurgery. Uh, this is uh, a very nice uh, publication uh, about complications. Uh, and a series of 275 patients. In this uh, publication, uh, the complications were divided in four main groups, uh, mechanical complications, technical complications, judgment errors, and critical events. You can see the percentage of all those complications in uh, this uh, series. Uh, unfortunately, 30% of these complications lead to new neurological deficit. So this is why it's very important to uh, know them and to learn how to avoid them. 
and if they happen, and they will happen, to know how to manage them. Uh, in, from uh, the last three groups, uh, we're going to show you an example about these complications. Uh, examples from our center. The first case is about technical complications and unintended embolization. Uh, this is a case of a 31-year-old right-handed male patient with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage from a uh, left frontal perisagital AVM. It was graded uh, specialized Martin II. Uh, during the embolization, uh, we couldn't see the onyx, and when we zoomed out, we actually saw uh, this thing over here. A uh, dreadful picture. This was onyx extravasating from the microcatheter inside the petrous segment of uh, the internal carotid artery. We did uh, DSA. You can see the result, complete occlusion of the left IC of this young man. What to do? We started panicking. You can see uh, our solution. We made four passes with four, uh, four by 14 balloon catheter and tried to smash the onyx against the walls of the vessel. Uh, and to try to recanalize the vessel. You can see that there is uh, MTK2B recanalization of the internal carotid artery. Uh, there was uh, a little less flow in the ACA over here. Uh, the good thing in this patient was uh, the good flow contralateral from the contralateral uh, right ACA. Uh, these are uh, the control images. One year later, the patient survived, hopefully. Uh, you can see some uh, pieces of onyx inside the bifurcation of the left MCA. This is the control MRI one year later. After intensive rehabilitation, the patient was able to walk, even to ride his motorbike. This is the MRI. MRA, actually. Um, the next complication, thromboembolic complications. Uh, this is a 62-year-old year female patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, she arrived at day three at our hospital. Um, she was hunting HES 1, Fisher 2. Uh, on the CTA, we saw this uh, posterior communicating artery aneurysm, and we went for endovascular treatment. While navigating with the microcatheter, we made a control DSA, and you can see this over here, complete occlusion of the MCA. We had to take some important decisions to abandon the procedure, try to recanalize the vessel, or to continue with the procedure, do what we came for. Uh, actually, this is what we did. You can see on this picture over here, we called the aneurysm. After that, we went for um, thromb extraction of the thrombus. We made uh, four or five passes with the solitaire stent retriever with actually no result. Um, and after that, we went for a salvage uh, interarterial thrombolysis, again with uh, not satisfactory result. You can see almost no recanalization. Uh, even though we, we left the patient on double antiplater therapy, hopefully, you can see on this DSA, she has a very good collaterals from the anterior cerebral artery to almost the whole territory of the MCA. Uh, on one year later, this is the control CT, almost no ischemic zones on the, on the scan. And this is the CTA. You can see that the patient actually recanalized the MCA on the double antiplatelet therapy. And maybe the interarterial thrombolysis, we are not sure because of the bad picture and the end of the procedure. Uh, this is our last case. This is. Uh, the, the worst type of errors, judgment errors, where we're not sure that we took the right decisions, where we should have done what we have done. This is a 49-year-old female patient with sudden onset headache and loss of consciousness at her workplace. At the emergency department, a CT scan and CT angio were conducted, uh, and a right temporal lobe ICH was diagnosed, and ophthalmic segment aneurysm. You can see over here, this is the ophthalmic artery, this is the aneurysm. Uh, the dimensions were 7.7 7 .7 millimeters uh, neck uh, uh, dome, and uh, the neck was 4 millimeters. We uh, tried to do uh, to oversize the aneurysm and try simple coiling. 
you can see the result over here. We didn't like it. There was a small prolapse of uh, loops of the coal inside the ICA, so we removed this coal and tried to do it uh, with a balloon, balloon assisted. You can see even worse result. Some loops of the coal prolapsed in the ICA. We continued. Things got worse with every single step. You can see while traversing with uh, the second microcatheter in the hope to uh, place a stent in order to push the loops of the coals to the walls and uh, maintain patency of uh, the ICA, even more coals prolapsed and the picture is really bad. Fortunately, we placed a solitaire stent. You can see a good flow in the MCA, ACA. Uh, the patient was uh, discharged with no neurological deficits with on double line to play the therapy. Unfortunately, two months later, the patient was admitted again at the emergency department with status epilepticus and an MRI was conducted and a glioblastoma was diagnosed in the zone of the hemorrhage. She was operated, the diagnosis was confirmed and the patient was sent for radiation chemotherapy. So to, uh, the take home messages, choose your patients carefully Plan your procedures meticulously, pay attention to the details, Mixta mistakes will occur, learn how to manage those complications. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Can I ask you, in the case with the AVM, did you manage to understand the, there is some rupture of the catheter, yeah, the proximal was... catheter, or more proximal to the... Catheter itself, maybe at the body of the catheter was Yeah, some it, there was a rupture in the microcatheter. But at the, the proximal market, uh, is it the Apollo catheter? Uh, Apollo. Yeah. So is there the proximal market some problem or no, below. below it? Below. Inside the guiding catheter? Did you try to extract it? The onyx? Or just balloon? Because the, the Russian group showed when they lose onyx or something like that, they will go with mechanical thrombectomy, remove it. If it's at the early time, the first 60 to 90 minutes, it can penetrate and to remove it. Like they say, it, I don't have experience. Uh, me too. Yeah, the results are nice. He's lucky. So it happens. Yeah. It happens. It's very important to know how to manage this complication. It's not every time this uh, lucky scenario is going for a good, yeah. good end. For sure. So thank you. Other thank questions? You. Okay. So our next presentation is new devices and techniques in treatment of unruptured cerebral aneurysms by Alexander Sirakov. So, second presentation, same agenda, new devices, new techniques, but this time in unruptured case scenarios. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, we, we do all know that dealing with ruptured cases is like fighting a Godzilla, so we all prefer to avoid dealing with uh, SAHs and acutely ruptured aneurysms if we could, if we can, of course. When it comes to the management of unruptured cerebral aneurysms, uh, you can start to be a little bit more creative, use um, a lot of new um, technologies, find your patients, put the patient on double antiplatelets, um, prepare him for a stent or something like that, or the, 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 the new sophisticated devices uh, like the Nautilus. In our department, we do have experience with the um, all those for uh, recently introduced uh, um, stents. That's the second generation uh, uh, LV stent uh, recently introduced intracyclinum plant called now to us. Uh, I think we perform uh, all the 30 in first in human cases in our center. The well-known Atlas stent and the new fascinating P64 with the HPC technology. So a lot of options available. I'm going to show you a bunch of cases we, we did with the, uh, all, all the aforementioned devices. This, this is a, um, this is a um, asymptom sorry, uh, a ruptured symptomatic uh, MCA aneurysm with a really complex anatomy. 
we uh, the plan here was to uh, deploy um, permanent stand that that LV is able from uh, uh, M2 to uh, M1 and uh, sufficiently embolize the aneurysm. Um, the stent is um, a second generation, uh, has a lot of improvements in terms of like better uh, navigability, visibility, and the new improved uh, um, delivery system. Uh, you can see the implant over there on the furrow. Um, with the scaffold across the aneurysm neck, we managed to achieve like a sufficient degree of occlusion of this uh, complex MCA aneurysm. And the second case is a very representative case of Nautilus embolization. Uh, that's a symptomatic 60-year-old um, lady with a, a prominent visual deficit. Uh, we found a um, giant MC, uh, uh, internal carotid artery aneurysm, and uh, we decided we should go for um, stage embolization. Uh, due to the complex anatomy in the uh, relatively wide neck, we decided to implant uh, that sophisticated device inside the uh, aneurysm. Um, a bunch of words about the Nautilus device. It's, uh, um, it is made of a nitinol alloy, and uh, the first few whoops uh, uh, actually behave like a coil when they're, um, when they're in inserted into the aneurysm. Um, the, 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 the device has some sort of a um, temperature or memory-like uh, shape. Uh, once it uh, gets fully introduced into the aneurysm sac, uh, next to the equatorial plane of the aneurysm, it forms like a discus shape, uh, I think, which can be deployed at the level of the neck and help you com uh, to completely remodel the aneurysm. Uh, it has a central pores over here, central pore, that you can um, use a second mic microcatheter and navigate through and start deploying coils. Um, so you achieve good occlusion rates. Um, that's a second example of Nautilus embolization, um, symptomatic MCA aneurysm. Uh, we uh, evaluate the, evaluated the anatomy and we decided that we sh it's very crucial for the patient to protect the, the uh, bifurcation of the MCA. This is what we exactly did. We deployed the Nautilus device inside the equatorial plane of the aneurysm, slowly retracted the device, navigated through the central pore with a second microcatheter and started to insert coils slowly. Uh, this is the final angio, and it shows the complete patency of the MCA proximally and distally. Uh, another challenging case, in my honest opinion, and uh, that's a um, MCA kind of ugly aneurysm located at the level of trifurcation. What we did here is, uh, I'm not gonna lie, we failed like, failed like miserably two times to embolize this aneurysm with like a, a simple coiling or assisted coiling with balloons or whatever. So well, we thought that it's a good idea to do um, Atlas in Y configuration. That's exactly what we did. So we navigated into the inferior branch and then up to the superior branch. And uh, we deployed two Atlas stents into the Y fashion. That's the uh, Vaso CT reconstruction. And you can see the patency and the full reconstruction of the MCA trifurcation. Um, that stable configuration of the stents actually allows us to uh, uh, deploy a bunch of coils inside the sac and therefore prevent the aneurysm from future rupture. These are the uh, following images, uh, the insertion of the coil mass, and that's the final result. Another tricky aneurysm. Uh, uh, actually, this aneurysm is uh, unruptured, but it showed uh, progress on the follow-up. It started to increase diameter, so we thought it's a good idea to uh, propose a treatment to the patient. Um, in, in such cases, when you have like a broad neck or the, 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 the very, very small sac, we prefer to deploy a stent. That's the P64 over there, completely deployed across the uh, aneurysm from proximal A2 to uh, distal A1 across the ACOM complex. That's the uh, vaso CT reconstruction. You can see a perfect tubular shape implant that covers the aneurysm over there. And uh, another case example of flow diversion in small vessels. Uh, as far as I remember, this patient was actually consulted and uh, she was offered no help, no treatment, because I open quotes, uh, there are no such device for distal anatomies. However, we 
successfully managed to navigate through the ACA and the, we deployed 3 by 15 um, P48 stent across the aneurysm neck. You can see the uh, perfect deployment of the stent across the ACA and the, uh, and the aneurysm neck. And over there, that's the final result. No, no, comp uh, no damage to the vascular of the uh, territory of the ACA. <coughs> Sorry. And that over there is a, a really good predictor of uh, aneurysm occlusion. After flow diversion, you can see that's the stasis of the aneurysm sac at the late venous phase of the DSA. So I'm gonna conclude the same as from my previous presentation. Coiling is, coiling is really, really a good option, but sometimes you have to consider a lot more opportunities if you have the chance in the armamentarium, of course. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, thank you. Is there some questions rising from the audience? I would have one. So the, those were some really challenging cases. So really congratulations on how you managed them. Um, I, I've got one question that is, in, especially in the mucotic or larger aneurysms, of course, if you use the Comanche, for example, you will not have the possibility of a balloon there. If there was a rupture, when you have a balloon, you could use the balloon to stop any bleeding. Do you sometimes use an additional balloon, um, probably also from, via the other groin, um, in those tricky, yeah, where you look at them and they already look as if they're very likely to rupture? Well, we do acknowledge the fact that actually the, 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 that's the only disadvantage of the temporary stent devices because they're not, they're not occlusive. So in case of uh, interprocedural rupture, either it's mm -hmm. a parent vessel or aneurysm, you're helpless. So you gotta puncture the groin, navigate, and hopefully get into the yes. rupture point and uh, deploy the balloon. Um, that, that's the only reason why we, we, we never actually performed uh, that much double commonage or double stenting. We want to have at least uh, one occlusive device uh, deployed mm -hmm. into the cerebral vasculature just in case something happens. Not gonna lie, we've seen this. And yes. uh, thanks to God we had our balloon next to the, next to the uh, parent vessel so we could stop the bleeding. But yeah, when it comes to like um, mycotic aneurysms, we have like a limited experience in that gun life, like 15-ish cases or something like that. The, the, the very last one was a recent. But we, what we do in mycotic aneurysms, we don't. We try to avoid using sophisticated approaches like adjusted um, uh, assisted coiling or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. All we want to do is like deploy one, two very firm, uh, very, very um, tiny coils or add some liquid embolic agent and that's it, go away. Fantastic, and another thing, you were showing those excellent reconstructions, so um, what is your recommendation? Do you also use flat panel imaging where you can yes. see the actual struts? Yeah, uh, it's, it's probably really something you could tell uh, the audience. Uh, that, that our protocol was uh, before the era of uh, Bulgarian antiplatelet testing. Uh, yeah, we, we, we recently started to test our patients like three, four years ago, something like that. Um, and we, we had that protocol that we waited like 15 minutes after deploying any device into cerebral vasculature yes. just to observe any, any acute stent stenosis or thrombosis or something like that. Um, nowadays, with the new machine that was uh, installed in our department, we have the opportunity to do flat scans and vasocities and better evaluate the patency of the, uh, the flow of or whatever it's inside yeah. the vessel. We use that for our follow-up uh, as well? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 actually, no. They we do this MR? as only, yeah, only okay. MR. Mm -hmm. yes. We do control angels, and if we need it, the, the second follow-up, uh, we are going to MRI. Yes, so, uh, so we do the same, but if there's any question, if there's something with the struts, or if there's stenosis, then um, it has, uh, what I wanted to point out is the amazing image quality that oh, you really? can achieve yeah. with flat panel, which you cannot get with CT. Mm. Nowadays, so, yeah. we don't wait for the uh, five, 15 minutes control. We just do the vaso CT and you can see the patterns of yes. the vessel. Like, it's pretty accurate and in high detail. So, Thank you very much. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going very nice with time because I have all, uh, also two pre-recorded cases I want to show you and we are going to step for the satellite symposium. Mm -hmm. So if it's possible. I'm going to show you two cases of Nautilus assistance calling. This is a new device, like we, uh, the, my colleague mentioned, it's a nitinol wire which is temperature uh, created. 
uh, and it has this memory when it goes for uh, above 37, 6, 7 degrees, it becomes stiffer. Mm -hmm. So if you place it right at the, at the level of the neck, it's very nice protection for you. Okay. So it's inside the neck, yes. it's like a web, but you don't preload the patient, you don't need uh, do antiplated therapy, and it's a little bit stiffer if you're too slow. Mm -hmm. Maybe the temperature becomes very fast, uh, creates very fast uh, stiff device. But if you place it right at the, at the neck, it's very nice protection during coiling. Okay. We have uh, like first in human experience in our department. We already have like 30 cases. Mm -hmm. If we could manage to deliver it easily, the yes. procedure after that is a piece of cake. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you can see it here. It's a very wide neck MC aneurysm. This is the working projection on the left. Uh, it was not rupture one, so the patient here was loaded. If uh, we are not able to place the nautilus correctly, we are going to proceed with uh, stent assisting coiling. Yeah. So we are here, here left the whole navigation, sometimes to see the beauty of the biplane. Uh, the colleagues who work with this neural intervention know sometimes the anatomy looks nice, easy, and you have trouble to get whatever you want. So it's like saying, never say these aneurysms look e easy. <laughs> yeah. You're going to jinx it. So this is the navigation by Dr. Sirokov. Mm -hmm. We are going most of the time with 014 micro, uh, micro guide wires, sorry. Our most usable one is Porto from Phoenix. Uh, we use a lot of Traxxas 014 yes. and we really like this Asahi guide wires. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. The Asahi Chikai, Asahi Black, they're, they're perfect. I also quite like the Synchro from its durability. Um, but, um, but the the portal is, is like a Gemini of the Synchro, Yes. Mm -hmm. but here is a little bit cheaper, so it's our workhorse. We start with yep. it, if we have some problems, we change to the others. I do the same. <laughs> so it's like Synchro 2, it's yep. completely like Synchro 2. So here is the delivery of the micro uh, I think it's uh, SL10, with which uh, the Nautilus goes through 017. It's like a coil, if you, like 20 degrees. It's like a soft coil. When it touch something hot, if you put it in a hot water, it becomes discus, this pre-shaped memory mm -hmm. form. So in our experience, after a bunch of cases, like a 10 cases, I started to oversize it. I don't like the discus shape. I prefer to be like an um, ellipse shape. So it's better coverage of the neck inside if you can think like a 3D dimensional uh, image, it's better to have not just discus at the level of the neck, because sometimes one of the, one of the policies of discus could place inside your parent vessel you want to protect. So here is the delivery of the, of the Nautilus. Like I told you, the first half is very easily to deploy, and the second half is becoming stiffer and stiffer. Maybe the temperature is already working with its, uh, its properties. So here, Alex is delivered completely. Mm -hmm. Here is the tough point. It's starting to get rigid to deliver it completely. So it's almost, almost out of the micro cutter. And you see it's discus shape when it's go out. Yes. So you place it at the level of the neck to get a good protection. We pull the whole system and verify that we are, we are protecting the both branches we want to protect. Now it's, it's going to be a little bit like an uh, eclipse. Uh, I, I don't know how it's in English. It's, it's not flat disc. It has some yes. curve, so it's better for protection of the neck. Eclipse, yeah. 
So now we, the, the second tricky part is to go through the center. If you go through the center, it's the best. Because if your coiling catheter is through the center, every coil is pushing the device near to the neck and seal it there. So it's very stable. If you go just through some of the struts, your movement of the coiling microcatheter is limited. So sometimes you cannot proceed for very aggressive, very good coil pack density. Mm -hmm. So here he managed to go through. And you did have quite some time before it came stiff, so it does give you some time. It's uh, when they showed us to yes. you uh, outside. Mm -hmm. When you when it touch 40 degrees water, it becomes discus. Yes. So that's yeah, why we think so after we halfly delivered it, it starts to become rigid. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. maybe they will upgrade it in the future. So this is the coiling microcatheter going through the center of the device, and I think the first coil is coming. No. Yes, we have some misdirection between the camera and the coils. So you see how good it will uh, hold the coils at the position. It's like the Biconos, Biconos of Phoenix. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's something like that, this uh, rotational stand. But there you have a stand body inside the, in this case, in MCA. So you have to put the patient on double antiplated for at least six months and leave it for more one year additionally. So for the rupture cases, for elective cases, I think it's very elegant. Maybe beneficial compared to the web device we have to, to experience, uh, you have to be very good at sizing of the web. We have limited experience of web uh, below around 10 pieces. And the other difficulty for web in Bulgaria that you don't have the sizes with you available. Sometimes you have a procedure, maybe you think you have the, the right size, but if, if, if you have to order it, you have to wait some time to be here. Mm -hmm. So this is the control angel after the first coil. You can see the stagnation inside. This discus is creating like throw diversion effect inside the sac. It's very rigid, that's why it's also like stiff. And the other very good future, uh, feature in our opinion, the recognition rate for now at least it's zero. We think there is some additional epitalization because it's yes. very, very close discus. So it's okay. very easily to epitalize. It, it's just a theory. Yes. We don't mm -hmm. know yet. Because but it's not coil. Yeah, because interestingly with just coils, yeah, there is the not with stent be... there is, with the web there has been some reported, so it could very well be, yeah. If With the position alone, of the discus is good, maybe mm -hmm. the epitalization is very fast, maybe. Yeah. I say maybe because we have limited uh, patients. It's uh, very good. Uh, here we detach it. After the first coil, we, it's already stable. We detach the discus. It's like a coil. Uh, you, it's a mechanically detached. And we continue to coil until we like the coil pack density or it's not able to deliver additional coil inside. But it's very nice when you put it just the device, mm -hmm. you can do a run, you can see stagnation inside the cotteras like you put a flow diverter inside the, uh, in front of the anavrism neck. So we leave here some additional coiling. It's very hard to replace the micro cut. Sometimes in other situation, we have to go in another portion of the anavrism to code another portion if you left something. Here is extremely difficult. It's very hard. You cannot go again. That's why at the beginning I said if you if you're in the center at the beginning, it's the best. Mm -hmm. If you puncture the center of the device. <laughs> and here you can be very aggressive. See how the, the tension inside the microcatheter it jumps all the time. You cannot move it. The nautilus is there. The idea is very good. Maybe if they Upgrade it for an easier delivery because if you have a smaller neck, a smaller aneurysm to deliver it inside, sometimes it's scary because after the first portion, it's starting to push the aneurysm. And you're a little bit scared, you go a little bit outside to deliver the device and try to put it again inside. It's maybe not the best uh, maneuvers you can do. It looks like sizing is very similar to when we started with the web. We were undersizing all of them at the beginning. And then, of course, there's the danger of creating a dog's ear at the side. And, but yeah. for, one wants to be careful at the beginning and we're automatically chosen. Uh, so I think it's probably very similar that here yeah. the sizing is important to not get the dog's ear on the side. Looks like a very promising device, how it's holding it. The engineer yeah. asked me why you all the time oversize it. It doesn't look like a discus. I say, I don't want... Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to be, prefer to be stable. Yeah. 
because in their opinion, if it's discus and you seal it, but sometimes we see what's in discus near to the branches you want to protect, sometimes the discus could be like this. And when and it's oversized, you have the stability to be a little bit inside the sac, so yes. it doesn't move at all. So very good pack density, and you can see the final result with both MCA branches protected. I think the whole procedure was mm -hmm. done. You see a small portion of the aneurysm, which was not filled with coals, but there is a stagnation like a flow diversion effect. We have also control here with no recognition of this aneurysm. Done by, I think, completely by Dr. Sirokov. So that was the one recorded case I wanted to show. Is there any questions about it? It's just like so, a... Dem Sorry? Is the device really available? You've done the first um, in-man studies with this device? Yes, they already have CE mark now. Okay. So mm -hmm. maybe they will start some post-clinical uh, studies and follow-ups. Is it the Israeli company? Yes, and yes. the stream. Uh, okay, yeah. And the stream mm -hmm. company. Yeah. So it's just a demonstration of a new device, which we mm -hmm. recently gained some experience with. Uh, so please, the next case is the same. Additional on Altios case. <clears throat> it was one of the first structure cases. And we could use everything. Balloon cystic coiling, common edge assisting coiling. So it's a big rupture PCOM on the right side. There is a small, small one on the left side. Uh, the patient was in a relatively good condition, only with ophthalmoplegy. Mm -hmm. So we decided to put this now to use. We already know about the effect and to coil loose. And in the end, you see there is not a lot of course inside, yes. but there is completely no contrast no uh, going in. And the neck to dome ratio is a lot, lot better than the other cases. But also the patient, uh, I think was did not recover fully for the ophthalmoplegy, but partially. Yeah. The interesting thing is when the aneurysm um, has a thrombosis, it still gets smaller. So you'd think yes. that, yes, there's filling, but very often it's reversing or even disappearing, the ophthalmoplegia. So yeah, it resolves. Important. Most of the yeah, time yeah. it resolves. Mm -hmm. So again, here is the navigation. We have a biplane system. Here, I think we use some 90 degrees microcatheter. I'm not sure it was my, uh, maybe headway 19 degrees okay. uh, for delivering the Nautilus. You see it again at the beginning. We choose a bigger aneurysm, so we have to have enough space to deploy the device here, and we can be. What sizes does it come in? From four to seven. Okay. So they are going, I, I told them, you have to go until 10, at least yes. until 10 millimeters, because we have eight and a half millimeters aneurysm made by seven millimeters device. Yes. But it was played with, with the course and with the device, and it was complete discus. Mm -hmm. And they told us, uh, for now, for the C-mark, we apply only for, from four to eight. Four to eight, okay. That will That'll be available be. sizes at the beginning. So this is the entrance of the aneurysm. See the operators are speaking something with their heads, hands. This is on our older angel biplane machine. We have an older GE and the newest Azure system from Philips. So the image quality is not so good, but it's still the biplane. It, it's, it's 17 years old GE, so it's good. So the micro is inside the aneurysm. You can see the tip. We remove the guide wire and we are preparing for delivering the Nautilus device. It's coming typically like a coil and it's very soft at the beginning. There is two millimeters atraumatic uh, tip soft, which they told us made around 50 rabbits aneurysms, small, big ones, without rupturing it. Mm. So here it comes out, and half of the device, when it's halfly deployed, you see the microcatheter will start to be pushed out. You see? Yeah. Here we have to do some tension of the microcatheter. Still very difficult to deliver after the first half. Now, if it's, the aneurysm is smaller, you have a concern 
Where is the limit of tension you can apply? Exactly, one would be concerned of pushing when you have to push a lot because there's no space, yes. Yeah. That's why we chose with the bigger yes. aneurysm at the beginning. So the, the device is completely delivered outside the microcatheter. Now we pull the whole system and to apply it, to apply it at the neck. So you can see, I prefer this shape. Mm -hmm. Not quite a discus. I see the contrast inside. Uh, this case is not mm, really representative, but you have cases at where we see the contrast staying there without moving in. Mm -hmm. So this is going across the center of the device. But even at this stage, there's already some stasis. There's already less. Not as visible as in the other, but um, Like I mentioned, we have there. more representative case in yeah. which is uh, it is like uh, you put two flow diverters in front of it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a satellite way. So now that just the wire is through the device. So see when we push the microcatheter going through the device. It's already very stiff. Yep. So the wire is here, in, but the guide wire is still not. So we are pushing the guide wire to go in. You see how we move the device because the tension is too big. So in a small aneurysm, it, it's that dangerous. Would be the, yeah. It's dangerous to do it. And then they ask me, the engineers, what do you prefer, stability or is it delivery? I said it should be a balance. You have to think about it and listen to the physicians which are using it. Maybe there will be two generations in the future, soft version and maybe yeah. more rigid version. Depends yeah. on what you prefer. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the rescue. If it did rupture in a smaller aneurysm, I suppose you could still put in coils as quickly as possible, but it, this would be a big rupture, not just one. So, mm -hmm. That's why we choose this case, I think, yep. to show that the device is still rigid at this version. You see how it jumps when you push it a lot? So here we go, not, we go through the center, but not in the main stream of the device and through some of the loops. Mm -hmm. It's also very nice for coiling, but uh, if you have to, like I mentioned before, you have to change the portion of the, of the aneurysm, it's very hard to go through inside. Okay. But that's the idea. If you, if you seal the neck and it epithelize, the chance of recognition should be very low. And now we start to coil. <laughs> they ask me, also the engineers of the company, how many coils you think you spare with this device? I said, not too much. Yeah, the neck is okay, but it's a small coil. If you have to count how, ma how many coils we spare, I don't think it's too much. Because one of their well, advantages, they want to be, oh, we reduce the coil number halfly yeah. or something like and that. And here you would feel much safer taking a longer coil initially rather than two small ones. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably one argument one could give them, but if you really save a lot. Not the volume which yeah. the device taken, but... From the volume, no, exactly. It's just and the best advantage, we didn't see any recognition rate yet. Mm -hmm. So we do it only in rupture cases. We have just two elective cases. Yes. But the, the, uh, in my mind, maybe the theory, there is no, when we put the patient on hypertension after the first days, uh, we do a, a artificial hypertension, maybe the normal cause are going in to the pulsating of the yeah. blood pressure. And this is very stable, it cannot move. But so it epitalizes. That's exactly it. So we know that in aneurysms over one centimeter, we basically always have coil compaction. Yeah. yeah because um, even if we see it filled like that, it is maximum like 30%. Um, even if it looks completely occluded, it's not 100% occluded because the space. So this may avoid the coil compaction. So it'll be really interesting. That's what we saw uh, Alex show in the presentation. We have a giant aneurysm, symptomatic mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And we do staging above 20 millimeters. So at the first stage, we call as much as possible. Yes. In one month, we put a flow diverter yes. to spare the big thrombosis portion. And here we put an altius mm -hmm. and relatively loose packing, and there is no recognition in one month. Yes. 
And it's not just the coil compaction, it is usually at the top of the aneurysm as the dome, there's the thrombus. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's not even the elastica, the membrane around it, it's already dissolved in the aneurysm, the giant aneurysms are only held by the thrombus together from bleeding, so the coils would be pushed into the thrombus, so this should be avoided. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if, I think it sounds, uh, do you see I'm getting excited about the device, I like it. <laughs> And if you have uh, the good idea experience. is good. Like mm -hmm. I said, they have to think about the deliverability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because at the beginning it was scary how, how yeah. it was pushed. I have to say I would be reluctant still in a small aneurysm because if it does rupture, the whole aneurysm dome yeah. will be gone. It's not like a small perforation that we have with a coil where you can then we coil it We put one device, yes. 4 by 4 millimeters ACOM. We put four millimeters device inside yes. and it was enough. I didn't go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, it yeah. wasn't the typical shape. It yes. was like a coil. Okay. And I detached and leave it. I, we didn't put additional coils inside. Leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And okay. we don't have the follow-up of this patient, but I think we'd be, it will be gone. Yeah, could be. I was okay. scared to go through. And I, I would have been as well, because if that ruptures, that's it. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you see the images, there is no mm -hmm. contrast inside. But it's like very loose, just one coil inside yeah. the sack on the native. And when you, when you do a run, there is no mm -hmm. contrast inside. I probably missed it before, but you also would not need dual antiplatelet or what is recommended here. You can do it um, in an acutely no, ruptured No, it's intrasacral. It's Inter Exactly, so you would... Mm -hmm. And like I told uh, with the other devices, Comaneci and Cascade, uh, when we have a new device in our department, I start only in rupture cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So most of the time we have only heparin. So like I told you, this uh, loose packing, we were not very aggressive. Here is the device is still attached. You see, the Nautilus mm -hmm. it didn't detach. It's here. Mm -hmm. And this is the micro cutter for, for the coiling. We have uh, one complication with the device I have to share with you. Mm -hmm. uh, one Nautilus didn't detach till the end. And in the end, it was not possible to detach. And we remove it. And we were very scared if there is yes. any movement of the course, but maybe we were lucky. Is it possibly to mechanically force it to detach by twi turning, turning, turning? We tried several times. We tried tips and tricks from the engineers. It was not possible. Okay. So loose coiling with good stagnation inside. Uh, I'm not sure did we put the control, but it was completely gone with uh, partially resolved of the ophthalmoplegy. But the protection of the neck is very nice. You have to be aggressive as nice. much as, as you want. And how does it appear in MR imaging? Um, I don't know it yet. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we start in May. So yes. the first follow-up we do an angio. The okay. second follow-up of the patient in one year we do MR. So okay. maybe in one year we can show is there in difference compared to the other course. But it's neat, you know, it should be the yes, same. Yes, it should work. I still remember when EV3 brought out the Axiom coil and it looked like a nice coil and then we suddenly had artifacts in the yeah. MR, which I'm so, that'll be good. So that nice. was the second case Very nice. I wanted to show, if there is any question raising from the audience. So these are all aneurysms which are super tricky to treat. So these are not the easy aneurysms, what are shown here. So really congratulations how you're doing that. Thank you. In our field, I think the device is developing, developing continuously. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, just a comment. I would say as a neurosurgeon, you can convince a neurosurgeon that an MCA aneurysm should not be good. Yes. Because you have a very good device. This is a very promising device. I think the largest problem, is, as you know, with stents, stents in immune patients, double antiplatelets, perforators, And maybe reducing the percentage of recanalization. Exactly. Maybe. Exactly. We will see in the future. I think that it's a, it's a very promising and also congratulatory because from uh, our point of view as neurosurgeons, MCA has always been easier to clip rather than the endovascular super or double stenting or whatever procedure you use MCA is not an easy endovascular procedure. It's always more complicated than other. So yeah. Thanks for the comment. We have, yes. you know, a strong unit of neurosurgery. And they say the same for the last two years. They have like two clipped aneurysms with very big hematomas. We need it to be clipped. 
So they say maybe this is the future. Uh, we are not glad to admit it, but we are going to the point maybe we are, we are not needed, and I disagree, because we already always need this teamwork for evacuation, for drainage, for everything. Mm -hmm. One more question, if there yeah. was a recanalization, would you be able, so for example, the, the fear of if on the side something came, you did get a dog's ear that went to the dome, you could go through it a second time? Inside? Inside. Probably, Should work. Yes. That's what I'm thinking, because that is, would be the big difference to the web, where basically once you've deployed the web and there is, you've lost, because you can't really get yeah. on the side of it. It probably mm -hmm. we could go in, but... I won't. Maybe in the recognition, yes. I will put the flow diverter. I'm just wondering, in theory, if it would be possible to it go back be. in. Mm -hmm. it yeah, be. yeah. Good, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. the next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Kopaski with why is needed reversal agent for dogs. So, here we are. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. That was great. Това е сетрите симпозиум на Бьорингер. Аз си позволя да говоря на български, защото не искате да чуете моя английски. Слайдвате се на английски обаче. Защо е важно да има защо е важно да има антидот при новите орални или директните орални антикоагуланти? Кое прави това да е важно да има антидот, един антикоагулант? На първо място, разбира се, поведението при остри състояния. Това го знаят най-много колегите от спешните отделения, от спешните звена, хирурзите, все повече и спешните невролози. Изключително важно е да се осигуря едно спокойствие на предписващите колеги антикоагуланти, защото и тук пак ще си позволя едно сравнение. Когато невролозите искат да профилактират последващ изхимичен инсулт, давайки антикоагулант, давайки нов орален антикоагулант, в известна степен те режат клона, на който седят, защото всички пациенти, които получават орални антикоагуланти от групата на директните орални антикоагуланти практически не могат да получат съвременно лечение, най-масовото съвременно лечение, разбира се, а именно интервенозата, системната тромболиза. Знаем, стана дума вече, че в България няма достъп до ендоваскуарно лечение, поне не такъв, какъвто ни се иска. И за това, в известна степен, когато предписваме орален антикоагулант, ние почти обричаме пациента да не може да приложим съвременно специфично лечение. Разбира се, когато този орален антикоагулант, освен, че е модерен, освен, че има добър кампоянс, освен, че има едно предвидимо действие, за разлика от витамин К антагонистите, има и антидот. И това е Разбира се, специфичния антидот на дабигатрана и даруцизумаб или известния ни праксбайнт. Индикациите по продуктова характеристика на праксбайнта са спешни хирургични или нехирургични интервенции. Тук спада, държа да кажа, и венозната тромболиза и това е повода аз да ви запозная с тази презентация. Ще ви споделя нашия опит за лечение на пациенти, които са на дъбигатран, при които се е налагала интравенозна тромболиза и разбира се, живото опасни и трудно контролирани случаи на кървене. Това е един достъпен медикамент. Все пак, виждате, над 8500 болници в света прилагат това лечение. Казахме индикациите. Изключително важно е да се отбележи, че идороцизумапа е специфичен антидот само за дъбигатрана, т.е. той няма ефект при пациенти, получаващи друг 
орален антиклагулант, както и да припомним начина на неговото приложение. Става дума за два флакона, които представляват единичната доза за приложение. Два флакона, всеки от които съдържа 2,5 грама праксбайнд, които се правят последователно, венозно, като една краткотрайна инфузия, малко по-дълга от бавно бол с приложение. Прилага се така и само така, при всички случаи, независимо от изходната доза на дъбигатрана, независимо от килограмите, независимо от възрастта на пациента. Прилагат се два флакона, праксбайнд, един след друг, венозно. Всъщност, основният въпрос е колко време след приложението на антидота ние имаме прекратен антикоагулантен ефект. Реално, в първите минути след като приключи инфузията, пациента няма следа от ефекта на дебигатрана в организма. Втория въпрос. След като проведеме съответно кръвоспиращата процедура или малката хирургична процедура или съответно интервенозата тромболиза, колко време е нужно да се изчака, за да се възстанови лечението с дъбигатран, защото пък това са едни високо рискови за тромбози пациенти и изчакването ги подлага на риск от тромбози. Реално препоръката е директни директните нискомолекулните хепарини могат да се прилагат веднага след процедурата, а дъбигатрана може да се възстанови до 24 часа след приложението на праксбайнд като антидот. Тъй като, тъй като, пак казвам, че отсъствието, липсата на антитромботичен ефект, на антикоагулантен ефект в този период поставя пациентите пред голям риск кои са процедурите с нисък риск на кървене. Това са малки зъбни процедури, гастроинтестиналните процедури, всякакви колоно и гастроскопии, малка ортопедична хирургия, в смисъл артроскопии, както и процедури по отношение на рамото и ръката, кожни биопсии, биопсии на лимфни възли, коронарната ангиография, лапароскопски холецистектоми и други лапароскопски операции, бронхоскопиите и епидуралната инжекция, обаче при АНР под 1 и 2. Кои са високо... Процедурите са свързани с висок риск от кървене. Това са практически 2 и повече зъба, екстракция на 2 и повече зъба, кардиохирургия, неврохирургия, урология, голяма ортопедична хирургия, трансуретрални манипулации или резекции на простата най-често, биопсия на черен и дроп и на бъбрек представлява процедура с висок риск от кървене, както и всяка хирургична процедура, реално, която изисква работа над 45 минути. Индикациите за употреба, индикациите за предписване на дъбигатран, при които лекарството се реимбурсира от здравната каса в България, са, разбира се, предсърдното мъждене, дълбоките венозни тромбози, профилактиката и лечение на белодробна тромпемболия и по отношение на централна нервна система, това са пациентите, преживели мозъчен инсулт, с висок риск от инсулт, при наличие на неклапно предсърдно мъждене. Дозировката във всички случаи е 110 и 150 мг, като по отношение на профилактика на дълбока венозна тромбоза е допустимо да се приема и по-низката доза 75 мг. И завършвам с един случай, един от няколкото случаи, които имахме възможност да прилагаме идроцизумапа при пациенти, приемащи дъбигатран, при които се налага лечение, остро лечение на мозъчен инсулт. Един 82 годишен пациент с остро настъпила левостранна хемипареза, хоризонтална погледна пареза, централна лицева и глосопареза в ляво, хемихипестезия, един тежък 
хемисфирален инсулт в басейна на дясна средна мозъчна артерия с них 17 точки, с хипертония и с химична болест на сърцето, състояние след коронарен байпас, с хронично предсърдно мъждене и бъбречна недостатъчност, който приема във връзка с тези коморбидности, приема по-низката доза да бига тран, а именно 110 мг два пъти дневно. На скенера, разбира се, в спешно отделение нямаше нищо и бяхме изправени пред дискусията да правим или да не правим системна тромболиза при този пациент. На първо място, кое ни спираше, малко по-високата възраст. Тук има грешка, той беше на лечение на дабигатран, а не с идороцизумаб. Изключително висока степен антикоагулация, АПТТ практически не дава никакъв резултат, не коагулира. И пациента, разбира се, беше в края на терапевтичния период, докаран в клиниката след 3,5 часа след началото на изхимичен инсулт. На първо място ние имахме един чист, грубо казано, скенер, т.е. без наличие на прясна изхимична зона. Имахме възможност за доста бързо провеждане на всички необходими изследвания за вземане решения за тромболиза и разбира се наличния праксбайнт в болницата. Как поступихме при пациента? След 30-минутна 30-минутно обсъждане и процедури в рамките на Дортонида във времето. Проведохме системна тромболиза с 0,63 сумарно милиграм на килограм тегло актилизе. Беше преустановено малко по-рано заради кървена от венците, но никакви други странични ефекти или осложнения не настъпиха и имаше почти пълно обратно развитие на тази тежка симптоматика при този 82 годишен пациент. На контролния скенер малка изхимична зона без никакви хемургични колекции, без никакви хемургични компликации, което беше нашия страх. Това беше един от първите ни пациенти, при които приложихме интервенозна тромболиза при пациент, който приема системно антикоагулант. В абсолютните противопоказания на интервенозната тромболиза влиза антикоагулантно лечение, в смисъл на перорално антикоагулантно лечение. Разбира се, Праксбайн да прави това да има и изключения. Виждате, пациента е изписан с изключително подобрение и ние имаме на този етап 12 документирани случая, при които при пациенти на дабигатран сме прилагали праксбайнт, благодарение на което сме успели да проведем интервенозни тромболизи по протокол на тези пациенти. Реално имаме един случай с кървена от венците, един случай с хематория и един случай с хемургична трансформация на инсулта, който не доведе до значимо влушаване на симптоматиката. Нещо обратно, даже имаме клинично подобрение при всички от тези пациенти, при които сме приложили венозна тромболиза. Благодаря за вниманието. Or because you are you are one of the few hospital that is also mechanical trabectomy available, and you showed us twelve cases, so that's why I'm asking. Така е. Този конкретно случай най-вероятно ще ще достигне до тромбектомия, ако нямахме първоначалното повлияване. Това, което благоприятства да опитаме, това беше един от първите ни случаи с праксбайн, беше, че все пак беше на 3 часа и половина пациента. Тоест ние имахме така още... В най-добрия случай имахме половин час, 45 минути, в които оставахме в терапевтичния прозорец на системната тромболиза. Смея да кажа, че търпим еволюция и ние също и все повече случаи 
ги даваме директно на ендоваскуларния екип. Но това е бъдещето. Самия факт, че ние днес доста голяма група невролози сме на този форум, означава, че това е пътя. Конкретният ми отговор тогава беше, че имахме още време в терапевтичния прозорец. Благодаря. Thrombolysis is a very powerful drug, especially in the small vessels. We need to have responsibility when we're putting on patients on drugs that cannot be reversed. And I think there has to be much more training for teams to have at the CT scanner immediately the possibility for reversal. Mm -hmm. Because if you have to bring the patient to the ward, You need to find the drug. It has to be on the thrombolysis trolley as part of the procedure because the number is increasing so much of patients. Very important. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Kovacki. Uh, so I think we are finished with this session. You have like 10 to 15 minutes break and then we will we continue with... Okay, so... Okay. It's up to you. Thanks. Thanks. Do we change the... Dear colleagues, uh, we are proceeding now with a live case, with a live case of uh, critical carotid stenosis, because I see my colleagues in the room are quite ready. So uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Janevska to present us the case by clinical and imaging point of view. And after that, we are going to proceed the advancement of the case. Our patient is a uh, male, 71 years old, uh, present in, uh, with uh, TIA for uh, last two months, loss of, uh, uh, loss of vision, uh, dizziness, weakness, and uh, headache. One month later, uh, with uh, ischemic stroke in the left and uh, uh, right uh, middle uh, cerebral artery, with uh, uh, comorbidities, uh, coronary artery Uh, disease with uh, chronic total occlusion uh, of the late circumflex uh, artery, dyslipidemia, and arterial hypertension. Risk factors is, uh, for atherosclerosis is a smoker, male, and uh, years. The result uh, from color Doppler ultrasound is uh, subtotal stenosis uh, uh, of uh, le left internal uh, carotid artery and uh, significant stenosis of uh, right internal carotid artery. Uh, the, the result of uh, go back. Yes, uh, 
the result of uh, CT angiography of the cerebral artery is uh, uh, yes, the critical stenosis, the same subtotal uh, stenosis in a left internal carotid artery. Is it possible to stop? Yeah. And little Yeah, in fact it's here. Yes. Yeah, it passed. Go ahead. Just a little. Go, go, go. Go, go, stop. stop. Yes. Come back a little. It's o it's overlapping. It's overlapping. In fact, it's overlapping over the vertebral artery. And uh, but you can you can see it there. Could you please stop when I say stop? No. <laughs> Let's go again. No. <laughs> yeah. So the stem is here. Yes. It's critical. It's really critical. Yes. Okay, and go ahead. Uh, yes. And uh, therapeutic uh, method uh, is endovascular treatment of uh, critical stenosis of uh, left internal carotid artery. Our strategy is a right radial approach and deep loop technique uh, for cannulation of uh, uh, left common carotid artery with uh, six uh, uh, French guiding sheet catheter and distal protection spider. Okay, now. Dr. Stankov, do you hear us? It's necessary 10 yes. minutes for the beer ready for the start with procedure. You can go with one uh, election and... The, the most recent symptomatic was a small, small uh, uh, stroke with uh, almost full restoration uh, with uh, side, uh, right-sided hemiparesis. And uh, he restored completely, in fact. And because of that, we decided to, to treat the left internal carotid. During the imaging, we saw very well on the CT that uh, the left internal carotid is uh, really critical. And your technique is a telescope technique. Uh, you had a SIM catheter beforehand, and now you are... Exactly. In fact, we have uh, quite a good experience with uh, uh, upper approach, arm arm approach, both radio and brachial, uh, the so-called deep loop uh, technique. And uh, in, uh, in cases in which uh, we have uh, difficulties of uh, femoral approach or it's, uh, uh, it's too calcified uh, to, uh, to plan a, a closure device implantation, we are using uh, also the, uh, the arm. Of course, uh, uh, the, the most suitable patients for this approach are the patients with bovine arch. So in bovine arch, in which the left common carotid is uh, like a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk, there is a very smooth transition from the brachiocephalic trunk to, to the left carotid. But in this case, it's not, it's not the case. So in case the left uh, common carotid is an independent branch of the, of the arch, like uh, in the usual case. Uh, in these cases, we are using the so-called deep loop. And uh, the success rate of uh, deep loop for the left uh, in, uh, common carotid uh, artery is uh, uh, more than 90%. We published our series of uh, more than 60 patients. And, uh, but of course, it's, uh, it's not 100%. Uh, Dr. Stankov can uh, uh, probably tell us uh, what is the situation now. Where are you now? I try, I try now to the, go with deep loop and cannulate the left common carotid artery with the six French, six French uh, sheet catheter. And uh, after that, we're going with a placement of the spider, digital protection six French. Which sheath are you using? The Rumo. 
The rule sheet, 110 mil uh, centimeter. No, it's a. Uh, because in I'm fact, it's from a, the radial. It's a shuttle sheet uh, cook, uh, 110 centimeters. The shuttle sheet uh, uh, has a very good feature of uh, hydrophilic coating. And uh, uh, because of that, it's suitable from uh, radial because it's long enough uh, to perform the deep loop and to enter the, the carotid. With a uh, standard 90 centimeters, it's, it's not so easy to, to reach the carotid bifurcation. But uh, with the usage of uh, 110, it's, uh, it's quite uh, suitable to, yeah, to, 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 to uh, utilize a deep loop technique. Uh, of course, always uh, in this case, the femoral, the femoral approach is also uh, feasible. Uh, there, uh, in the common, uh, in, into the common femoral artery, uh, there is a calci significant calcification. That is a relative calcification for uh, closure device, for vascular closure device, but uh, it's uh, also possible uh, to perform the case by, uh, by femoral. So uh, we can, uh, uh, okay, we can follow the, so you can see this is on the left anterior oblique that uh, there is a trend, the, the wire to not to go into, I mentioned yesterday that uh, it's relatively easy, but, uh, but not always, uh, not always. Uh, in this situation, <laughs> So in, the, in this situation, uh, the, uh, one of the obstacles of the 110 centimeters is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, using the uh, Simmons catheter, uh, and because the Simmons catheter is shorter. And uh, in this situation, what uh, Dr. Stankov can do is to remove the long sheet, to cannulate with a simple Sim Simmons catheter the left uh, carotid, to put deeply the long wire and to try again with the long sheet in order to selectively go into the, into the uh, carotid, into the left carotid artery. Uh, Ivo, which, uh, yes. which SIM catheter are you using? Which company? What, uh, what is the SIM catheter? Uh, Simons Edinichka. Simons 1. Simons 1 or 2. It depends. Which, so um, what I find often is that the SIM, for example, from the Cordis um, is quite stiff. We are using so, the Cook, so SIM, SIM 1 and SIM 2 of Cook. So here one thing to try is that uh, the SIM try. catheter from Penumbra is very, very soft and flexible. So in these situations, that's a catheter which will follow much easier without dislodging everything. Very, um, because, very good point. Because as you said, you need a stiff sheet. So you need the shuttle, for example. You could not use a, a non or a very soft sheaf here because if you then place the stent and devices, you risk that everything goes out. So you need the stiff, stiff You're sheaf. absolutely right. Um, in fact, uh, when the, the aortic valve is uh, coming Competent, the deep loop sitting on, on the aortic cusp, it's, uh, it's not uh, difficult, uh, but in case there is, for, for example, a, a aortic enlarge, in this situation it could be uh, a uh, big, big problem. Uh, we, we had two cases done with a long sheet entering the left ventricle. I don't advise it. I don't advise it, but uh, we did uh, two cases with a very good deep can cannulation. And because of, in most of the cases, the carotid stenting intervention, it's not a long procedure. Uh, because of that, we can, and uh, in case the patient uh, is supporting uh, the, this uh, deep cannulation within the left ventricle, it's, it's possible to be done. But of course, it's not advisable as a, as a routine approach. And uh, otherwise, uh, always uh, we can switch from uh, uh, arm approach to femoral. That is uh, the most logic. Uh, we can, uh, Dr. Stankov, what we are doing now? Uh, I changed the, the catheter. I use now vertebral catheter for, uh, for French for the help me to the kind of really left common carotid artery. I try one minute with this device. 
And if it's not possible, I'm going to the change the long sheet with short and again cannulate with sealant catheter. Probably the and big, this is the best way. Did you cannulate first uh, the left uh, common carotid with the... Yes, uh, I yeah. cannulate. We can okay. see. Sasha, please. If possible, yeah. Let's see step by step. Yeah, this is the Simmons catheter. You see, yes. it's uh, really a critical stenosis with very good cannulation uh, with the Simmons catheter. But uh, uh, in very... In uh, many cases, when uh, the Simmons catheter is uh, very well Next. engaged, but in case uh, uh, sometimes so uh, when we are going with the wire, the wire in fact is pushing the loop down. So on the on the uh, ascending aorta, and uh, of course the access is lost. Uh, it was. Uh, please go back, Sasha. Verni edna nazad. Uh, it was uh, very nice to see the collateral feeling and how critical is the left. Uh, you see, there is a uh, contralateral feeling. There is a, it's not perfect, but uh, it's more than obvious that the perfusion pressure from the left side is very low because injecting contrast into the right carotid, there is a, uh, there is a contralateral crossover, crossover uh, uh, flow. And you can see by the injection on the yeah, left the side that the A1 segment was not filling at all. Exactly, so. because it, uh, it's a competitive flow uh, with uh, a higher uh, perfusion pressure from the right side. And because of that, the, the anterior uh, is not filled. Uh, with this maneuvering, you can scratch some debris from the altar. It's absolutely, it's a, absolutely great, a great remark. In fact, too much manipulation on the, le, uh, on the level of the arch is not advisable. And uh, uh, we know from the trials that uh, uh, in some trials uh, it's proven that around, percent, uh, around 20 percent of the uh, uh, microembolization into the brain uh, due to manipulation of the catheter during the, the uh, the procedure before the intervention itself. So it's uh, it's not a good it's not a good idea to manipulate too much uh, catheters and sheets and so. On. In fact, when one looks at we are ready with deep poop with the wire, uh, especially in uh, on a such a situation in which uh, there is a critical stenosis, uh, it's even uh, it uh, can be even even worse. So now we are trying to advance over the soft terumo wire and uh, uh, did, you change, the did you change the wire, Dr. Stankov, with uh, Stork one? Stork now one I... Uh, this is the uh, angulate terumo wire. And now I'm Which going one? with the ter terumo angulate. Terumo. Angulated yes. terumo. Yes, and now I'm going with a long five French catheter, Jatkins right, and okay. after that, I change with torque for the support. Okay, very good. Very good. It's uh, uh, usually uh, because the terumo, uh, terumo is very, very good to enter, but sometimes can be dangerous uh, regarding the uh, crossing the, 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 the wall of the vessels. And because of that, after putting a long catheter, like in this case, uh, uh, long diagnostic for French catheter, we are using uh, as a conduit the uh, four French catheter in order to put uh, the uh, very soft stork wire, uh, because the stork tip is very gentle. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not traumatic over the vessel wall, uh, never puncture. Uh, it's probably... I see uh, it's probably better to go femoral. Yes, I'm now going femoral. Yeah, because you probably saw he was selectively into the, uh, into the common carotid, but even the, the four French didn't go up. So more than obvious, it's uh, better to switch to, uh, to femoral. Uh, I, would suggest, I would suggest to go for the presentation to leave uh, Dr. Stankov to register what uh, he is doing meantime, and after it, uh, we, uh, we are going to see the result. If you, uh, if you agree. 
Ще бъдам на кръчето, то ще го залепим с специално лепило. Можете да го спрете, да, после ще го... Окей, so it's a pleasure to open the next session, which is all the catch and carotid procedure. And we are starting with the presentation of Professor Petrov about total endovascular... Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will speak about uh, complex pathology. Uh, in many cases, like uh, or, uh, often in the medicine, complex pathology requires uh, complex decisions. Uh, not easy, not, not easy to be done. And uh, we are going to speak uh, especially uh, about aortic pathology involving the ascending aorta and the aortic arch. So, uh, my disclosures, in fact, the biggest disclosure that I have that as everything that I'm showing is off-label. So, uh, speaking about aortic arch, and ascending aorta, uh, uh, in uh, which cases uh, uh, everything is straightforward. The cases with congenital aortic syndromes, like Marfan, Eller, Danlos, uh, positive patients with uh, uh, pathology of the ascending aorta, both aneurysm and dissection, definitely they require uh, surgical, classical surgical treatment. What about the zones? Uh, these zones are the, uh, uh, the possible landing zones uh, uh, in the context of endovascular intervention. So uh, the zone, uh, zone two landing, it's uh, after the subclavian artery, it's uh, uh, relatively easy to be manipulated with uh, uh, thoracic aortic stent graft implantation. But it's not the case with the saccular arch aneurysm involving the brachiocephalic vessels. And uh, it's uh, uh, even uh, more complex in patients after surgical treatment with residual or re-dissection aortic dissection. And uh, in this case, uh, it's uh, uh, even uh, many, uh, often the ascending aorta is involved, not just uh, the zone zero. Uh, about uh, extending the, uh, the tether to zone, uh, zone two, uh, I mentioned this is the zone around the left subclavian artery. It's uh, not so difficult, uh, so it can be done with cr uh, crossover bypass from the carotid artery to the subclavian artery, or with a branch graft, or with a simple chimney from the subclavian artery to the, to the aortic arch, or in many cases, we can cover the left subclavian artery with, uh, without uh, any uh, fear regarding ischemic syndrome, because in most of the cases, uh, the steel syndrome from the right vertebral through the left vertebral uh, can give uh, enough supply to the, to the left arm. So, this is the simple case. The most uh, difficult is when the aneurysm or the dissection, the primary entry of the dissection is involving the arch itself. So zone one and even uh, worse, zone zero. So zone, zone zero is before the brachiocephalic trunk. This is the, the biggest challenge of everything. Uh, there are several uh, small trials like this one feasibility trial uh, with a branched uh, stand grafts, uh, but uh, still we don't have enough data and uh, there is no clear indication about the utilization of, of the branch graft. What is the challenge? Uh, the challenge, the main challenge of in this situation is the involvement of the supraortic branches, so the brachiocephalic vessels that are, of course, very, very much important. And in uh, most of these patients, uh, we reach angulated uh, morphology and uh, more than obvious, the proximity of the aortic uh, valve to the zone zero uh, can interfere with a uh, possible, possible landing zone for stent graft implantation. Uh, how is possible to avoid uh, this situation? Uh, one of the uh, procedures that can avoid uh, this situation with additional uh, stent graft on elephant trunk implantation is the so-called total debranching. It's, uh, uh, in fact, it's a bypass from the ascending cord to the, to the brachiocephalic vessels. 
The problem is that the extracorporeal uh, uh, perfusion is not avoided. So we need the heart and lung machine, and in most of the cases we need sternotomy. So it's a real operation. Uh, open versus hybrid uh, versus uh, endovascular intervention. It's quite difficult to make a real comparison because uh, in most of the cases there are some small series, uh, in fact, that are not standardized. Uh, there is no real randomized trial comparing uh, uh, all the three options. In, in most of the cases, of course, the mortality is significant. It's reaching even 20%. Uh, even in very uh, skillful surgi surgical teams. Uh, and uh, um, the other obstacle is a relatively high stroke, stroke rate. So this is uh, 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 the, the statistics, uh, open versus high versus uh, endovascular intervention. You, you see here death rate and uh, uh, cerebrovascular events, it's not, definitely it's not, not zero. It's even more complex in the so-called uh, patients require redo, redo operations uh, because of uh, disease advancement, aneurysm or dissection. In this situation, uh, the uh, recurrent disease is requiring uh, redo operation. The redo operation risk is definitely almost two times higher. The mortality risk and stroke risk uh, is almost two times two times higher, uh, no, uh, no speaking about sepsis, renal failure, and, and all the rest. So uh, you see uh, the different kind of uh, uh, interventions like ascending uh, hemi-arch uh, and even worse in, in total arch replacement. Fenestrated grafts, fenestrated, uh, fenestrated grafts uh, were proposed as a possible, uh, possible solution. The problem is that the fenestrated grafts uh, are custom made. So every fenestrated graft has to be uh, custom made following the particular anatomical features of the particular patient. So in an acute situation, of course, it's not possible to be performed because uh, we don't have the exact fenestrated graft for the exact patient on the shelf. So, this is a, a cadaver reconstruction about the zones. You see, uh, the zone zero is even more complicated, and uh, we have uh, the brachiocephalic uh, vessels above. Let's speak about chimneys. Chimneys is also option. Chimney or snor uh, snorkel is allowing, parallel to the aortic stand graft, to put stem grafts into the uh, brachiocephalic vessels, uh, both uh, left common carotid, left subclavian, and also the brachiocephalic trunk. The problem is uh, that uh, uh, the parallel grafts, uh, parallel to the, uh, to, uh, to the uh, uh, to the aortic graft, can uh, cause uh, some invagination and gut, like a, a, a leakage place uh, of the, uh, for um, uh, early or late endo leak. This is a, a let's say, a attempt for comparison. So this uh, meta-analysis uh, uh, compared, in fact, for a redo operation of uh, such a complex pathology, and uh, they compared uh, totally uh, open surgical, hybrid, and chimney. And uh, uh, Mulakakis and Manjalardi, uh, they showed a, re a relatively acceptable result, but still uh, with a, a relatively high uh, uh, perioperative comorbidity and mortality. The, I mentioned already that the Achilles heel of the chimney technique uh, is, uh, in fact, the lack of sealing. In fact, with the chimneys, we are trying to uh, provide uh, proximal landing ceiling zone in order to have a seal of the flow uh, regarding the dissection uh, uh, faust lumen or the uh, aneurysm it itself. And uh, like uh, stated here, the chimneys uh, don't provide the perfect landing zone because of this invagination. So the, the stand graft itself, the aortic stand graft, has to accommodate, has to accommodate, has to in, be invaginated and to accommodate the chimneys in order to have a, a better ceiling zone. And in this cartoon, it's very well uh, shown that uh, putting chimneys uh, one or two parallel to the, to the uh, aortic graft, we need more 
diameter of the graph because we, we need more circumference. We need such a bigger circumference that can invaginate enough in order to accommodate the parallel chim chimneys without, without causing endo leak. And uh, in fact, this is the problem. So uh, this is, uh, these are the obstacles, these are the, the pitfalls, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, in some cases, uh, we have to, uh, to do uh, complex cases in order to, pay, uh, to save the patient's life. There's uh, some uh, tips and tricks uh, to avoid uh, end leak in chimney parallel grafts. Uh, this is the, the oversizing of both chimneys and uh, aortic graft, and also kissing balloon, uh, putting additional coils, and so on and so on. So there are uh, some uh, tricks to overcome this, uh, this situation. This is our, during the years, uh, experience with uh, aortic intervention. There are more than 420 aortic interventions up to date. So these are uh, our 12 patients in a table uh, treated uh, with uh, additional uncovered or covered chimney technique stents. And uh, I will show you several. Uh, we had one patient only who died, uh, uh, one mortality case, uh, who was uh, with uh, uncontrollable aortic dissection with imminent rupture. And unfortunately, during the, uh, in fact, the early phase of the intervention, he ruptured and he died. So, redo arch intervention, I mentioned already that the mortality rate uh, can reach, uh, uh, it's not very rare. So, uh, even not five, up to 10% of the patients require, after the surgical uh, aortic, uh, the proximal aorta intervention, they require uh, reduced surgery because of the uh, residual aortic dissection. So, several clinical cases uh, based uh, on uh, our experience. The first one is a 57-year-old male who was uh, operated uh, approximately one year and a half before uh, the admission. He was uh, operated uh, in another town. Uh, and uh, he had uh, severe uh, dizziness and chest pain. And because of that, he was investigated with a CT angio. And uh, it resulted that uh, he had, uh, unfortunately, type A aortic residual dissection. So you see here, this is the, the entry point. This, the big one is the false lumen. The small one, one is the true lumen. Unfortunately, this entry point, just before the brachiocephalic trunk, uh, was keeping the false lumen in all the brachiocephalic vessels and also into the descending aorta, causing brain ischemia. And uh, this is the surgical prosthesis here. You see, this is the proximal uh, ascending aorta, surgical prosthesis. Many surgeons still, many surgeons, they fix only the primary entry, the proximal entry uh, into the, of the dissection, and uh, they rely on the nature, the centralization of the flow into the true lumen will resolve the rest. But unfortunately, in many cases, it's not true. So in this situation, you see, here is the dissection just before the brachiocephalic trunk. There is an extreme compression of the true lumen on the descending aorta and uh, almost uh, totally compressed uh, true lumen on the level of the uh, left and right carotid arteries. And this is the reconstruction of this gentleman. What to do? Of course, more than obvious, the reduced surgery is risky uh, around uh, one year uh, before he was operated. And uh, there was a huge discussion what to do and uh, what to perform. The, uh, the de debranching the de was also, also difficult because of the dissection persisting on both carotid arteries. So it's not easy to make a debranching uh, with a distal uh, anastomosis on already dissected vessels. So uh, it was also problematic. The risk was uh, considered too high, too high. And because of that, we decided to, uh, to make uh, like a salvage procedure, so to put a, a, a stand graft into the brachiocephalic trunk from the uh, uh, right arm to puncture directly the left carotid on a retrograde uh, manner in order to put a stand graft, second stand graft into, into the uh, left uh, common carotid. Uh, so this is the puncture of uh, the left common carotid that was closed by the proglyte, and this is the moment of crossing uh, into the uh, true lumen 
uh, of the carotid artery and going down into the ascending cord. And in fact, to meet all the three uh, tubes, let's say, all the three tubes to, uh, to met into the ascending aorta within the surgical graft. So we were using the surgical graft as a landing zone. So this is uh, the situation, uh, one chimney uh, into the brachiocephalic trunk, second chimney into the left carotid artery, and the valiant aortic stand graft coming uh, into the uh, uh, aortic arch in order to, to make the three parallel, uh, par parallel tubes, covered tubes. And uh, this is the, the implantation uh, parallel to the, to the grass. You see uh, the tips, the distal tips of the two uh, uh, schnorkels of the two chimneys. And this is the, uh, the, the final result. You see the flow restoration into the true lumen. And there is no false lumen. You probably remember how big was the false lumen at this level. And it not anymore seen. So there is no any more false lumen and excellent flow into the brachiocephalic, uh, brachiocephalic vessels. And this is, this is the final result. The second case is 69-year-old male after re resection of the ascending aorta a uh, long time ago in 2012. Because, again, because of the persisting uh, dissection, he had uh, two secondary interventions. One with a valiant captiva into the descending aorta, but because of the continuing dissection into the abdominal segment, he received a multi-layer flow modulation implantation into the distal thoracic and the abdominal aorta. Unfortunately, still, the false lumen was persisting on the level of the aortic arch. The false lumen is huge. It's two times bigger than the, the true lumen, and there is an imminent rupture of the, this, uh, uh, in fact, false lumen aneurysm on the level, on the level of, the, uh, of the arch. Based on the previous case success, uh, we decided to uh, perform something similar. You see the valiant captiva thoracic aortic stand graft. Uh, and this is, again, direct puncture of the left carotid, access from the uh, brachiocephalic, uh, from the, uh, art, uh, from the uh, right subclavian artery in order to put uh, the chimney. The, this is a stand graft uh, going uh, into the brachiocephalic vessel. And this is the implantation of the chimney. Again, these are the two chimney grafts. Uh, and uh, here is the opening of the, of the arch, arch graft. This is uh, the balloon inflation of the, of the chimneys. And this is the the balloon inflation, uh, probably next one, is the triple, it, the, the triple kissing. So um, inflating the two chimneys into the carotids and uh, inflating also molding. In, in fact, it's not a real inflation, it's a molding of the stand graft in order to have, uh, like uh, mentioned, in order to have good sealing in, on the proximal level. And uh, in this case, uh, it was mandatory to close the subclavian. You saw probably, I will go back in order you to see better, that the, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the steel syndrome uh, is supplying not only the subclavian artery, but also it was supplying the, uh, uh, the false aneurysm. Could you please play the left, uh, left cartoon? Left, not right. Click, click on play on, on the left. Yeah, play. And uh, in case uh, the guys can succeed to play the left cartoon, you are going to see by the subclavian artery that the false lumen is filled. So in this situation, could you try again? Go one slide back and try again. And in this situation, we have to close the left subclavian artery. It's mandatory to close because otherwise we are going to create a dead space under tension and it will rupture. So because of that, we uh, put a, a vascular plug into the uh, ostium of the left subclavian artery, and we succeeded to, uh, to close uh, everything. So this is uh, the closure with the proglide, the closure of the carotid uh, puncture. Fortunately, the uh, Bentley uh, stand graft is six French compatible, so it's uh, excellent to, to implant uh, uh, the proglide. And uh, it's, uh, you see, Excellent flow in both uh, brachiocephalic vessels without feeling 
of the Faust lumen. So it's a good centralization of the flow. This is the third case. Uh, it's even more dramatic. It's a lady, 68 uh, year old, uh, who was admitted uh, in another hospital uh, with uh, everything dissected. Not only the aorta, this is the aortic valve, you see, proximal dissection, too proximal to think about endovascular intervention, it's not possible. So, uh, proximal dissection uh, just above the aortic valve and the dissection, spiral dissection into the brachiocephalic vessels. And uh, it's uh, like a multiple, multiple uh, entry tiers and multiple uh, flaps. So you can observe flap into the brachiocephalic vessels, into the sending aorta, and extremely compressed. You see, it's like, like a needle. The, tru the true lumen is like a needle almost uh, totally occluded. So uh, we decided to reverse the intervention. So first to restore with stents the flow into the true uh, uh, lumen vessels, uh, both brachiocephalic, uh, uh, visceral, renal, and aorta, and on a second stage to, uh, to make the, the surgical intervention because the lady had uh, 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 malperfusion syndrome, mesenteric, visceral, and renal kidney and brain, malperfusion syndrome. So uh, she was, uh, it's true, she was uh, more or less uh, inoperable. And uh, uh, from the other hospital that uh, he, uh, she was admitted, uh, they canceled from surgery, they uh, um, uh, left her on natural, natural evolution. So this is the intervention into the mesenteric artery that was uh, almost totally closed. So we restored the, uh, the vessel, the mesenteric uh, artery, we stented, uh, you see, uh, that there is no flow into the brachiocephalic uh, trunk and into, into the carotid because of the compression of the true lumen, uh, real mal malperfusion. And because of that, we implanted stent in into the left carotid, into the brachiocephalic trunk, into the left subclavian, into the mesenteric vessel. You see the protege, several proteges into the brachiocephalic trunk, uh, into, you see, the, the, the stents that are restoring the flow into the uh, true, true lumen uh, in all the three brachiocephalic vessels, uh, and, uh, and also the carotid here is in, into the brachiocephalic trunk and the carotid. And this is the implantation into the subclavian artery. So after doing that, you uh, probably remember there was no flow into the right carotid artery. Now it's excellent flow in, into the true lumen. And she restored. She started speaking. She felt very well. And uh, uh, definitely, and this is the implantation of a, a stent uh, in, in the supoclusive aorta. You see? It, it's really supoclusive aorta into the, into the true lumen. And the lady was operated. Uh, several hours after that, with uh, this uh, uh, surgical uh, operation, with uh, uh, very good result and uh, with uh, restoration of the flow into the vessels. So as a conclusion, despite off-label, endovascular options are still here. They are emerging as a viable option in treatment of complex cases of aortic dissection type A and uh, uh, aortic arch uh, uh, an saccular aneurysm. And uh, we have probably in the future, of course, uh, bigger series and, uh, and uh, higher experience in order to prove uh, the role of uh, such intervention. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Congratulations. Uh, it's uh, amazing and uh, not always easy to understand what is going where. <laughs> but uh, the result is at the end marvelous. And uh, I just wanted to, to ask you about this patient. Um, most of the time, we see some residual flap after operation for aortic uh, dissection type A. So uh, when you decide to go for the endovascular procedure, you are waiting for something to develop like a symptom, or you have Absolutely. something uh, in the imaging which showing you that you may be going Absolutely. to prevent it? To be fair, we have uh, in our follow-up several patients with residual uh, Faust lumen persistence. Uh, the most important is uh, to take a look at the ischemia symptoms and ischemia signs on the imaging and uh, to measure, to make a serial CTAs in order to take a look what is the evolution of the Faust lumen 
and the true lumen, and what is the, in fact, the ratio between false and true lumen. In fact, in case uh, the true lumen becomes two times bigger, uh, two times smaller, so just the opposite. In case the false lumen becomes two times bigger uh, uh, compared to the true lumen, uh, it's uh, uh, impending rupture. So uh, we have to follow very strictly every six months uh, uh, such kind of patients and to, and to decide uh, based on the clini clinical. You see uh, the patients that I'm showing are severely symptomatic, severely. It's not possible to wait. But in case uh, we have a really severe enlargement of the, of the true lumen, despite uh, good uh, hypertension control, uh, probably in this case we have uh, some uh, elective, elective indication to, to, to do something. And um, uh, in, our, in our experience, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with our cardiac and vascular surgeons, we have uh, uh, several patients with total debranching. Uh, even two weeks ago, we had a patient with uh, total debranching of the brachiocephalic vessels. And after that, it's easy to put a, a stand graft uh, in, into, the, into the arch. And uh, uh, for us, as well, what I'm showing, it's not the first one choice. The choice first one is uh, probably really total debranching, and after that, put in a stand graft. This is probably the best, uh, the best way up uh, on uh, nowadays. Okay. The other questions? I'm very impressed. Very good uh, done cases. Yes, I must say, because it's very critical. The, the normal, it's not easier where you have the deception starting at the left subclavian. Yes then you can go in and place, you can sacrifice the left subclavian when the vertebral on the right is good. Yes, but here, that are very critical. Life-threatening cases, yes? Yeah, it's true. Okay. In, yeah, in case you allow us uh, to show probably what Dr. Yeah, Stankov... Yeah, that was my uh, suggestion to okay. see what else we Great. did the case. In. Dr. Stankov, we are with you. Okay, let's ask, let's ask the panel. What kind of stent you are supposed to use? Uh, exact. Exact? Yes. I don't know. I'm not familiar yes. with exact stent. I would normally use, in that case, when it's a symptomatic patient, a MoMA device, so proximal protection, when it's asymptomatic and not ulcerated sedation, even when it's very tight, I can also work with a filter. Yeah. But routinely we use all the time a self-protection device. Yeah, what kind of protection do you use, Dr. Stankov? Okay, six millimeter spider. And what about predilation, Klaus? Would you go for predilation or not? I would not go for predilation when it's not calcified. I don't see too much calcified. I think yeah. it's a soft plaque, and with a soft plaque you can go and uh, do immediate state. Yeah. When there is calcium, then I would predilate okay. because you can have the problem that you are, yes, within the. the the lesion and you cannot move it anymore <laughs> because it's so, so rigid uh, and calcified. Yeah, I, I guess that the exact stent uh, it has good profile and not... Uh, Absolutely, very... exact stent is a quite so low, low profile. probably direct stenting yes. is the preferred choice. Yeah, uh, let, uh, let's tell the audience uh, this is the European style. So um, in Europe uh, we tend more to make direct stenting. Uh, that is uh, absolutely advisable, uh, especially in case of uh, closed cell design. It's a very good option because after putting the stent, we 
fix more or less the plug, uh, and uh, we tend more to post dilate. The, the American guys, uh, the reverse uh, yeah. the technique, they, uh, they, they try more... They do pre-dilatation, and sometimes they have the places stand and, and doesn't touch Without touch touching anymore. anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, Dr. Stankov, you probably uh, have heard. You know, just a question yes. for Professor Matthias. Uh, in a situation like this, uh, you prefer not or you stick to the old stents. Double That's mesh? different. I, I, when, in symptomatic lesions, I also like the hybrid stents. Mm -hmm. So where you have um, these very tiny mesh work, yes, like road sable and, and so on, or exact stent. But here, the, the exact stent is a very stable, strong stent, so I have no yeah. doubt that that will be opened completely. So, Dr. Okay. Stankov, you understand? So the advice yes. of the panel is direct stenting? Yes, uh, my uh, route is the same. I'm going directly for direct stenting. Next slide, please. No problem with the crossing with the stent of the zone of stenosis. Next. And this is but final you result. See how compressed was the stent? It was really very tight stenosis. In most of the cases we are using, uh, I can guess it's the same here, a five millimeter non-compliant balloon. Yes, I take it this one. Yeah. And, and this is the final result. And the inter intracranial final result. We now you can see the start of the flow in the cerebral anterior artery. Yeah, that yeah. was missing. And uh, some disease. more better. Yeah. Uh, flow in the uh, media artery. And how is the patient doing? How is the patient? Very, very fine. It's uh, speaking English. It, it's tell me <laughs> a very interesting presentation for your presentation, Professor Petrov. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. he appreciate right. it. Okay, I appreciate as well. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go up. I just want to discuss the length of the stent. In a situation like this, uh, a little bit curvy artery, we usually go for the longer stent. Just having an idea that uh, atherosclerosis is a little bit more than we see on the angio. Very good point. And uh, I don't know what do you think, long stent or short one? Yes, uh, that depends. Yes, you can use all the 40 millimeter long stent. Yeah. Yes, but uh, I think when you check on that patient in a couple of weeks, yes, there is some remodeling and it will look differently and even better than now. Yeah, because of that we have on the shelf both uh, short and long version in order to adopt. And there, there are no more, not very much data or uh, trials, but in order to keep the anatomy uh, in quite uh, often we are we like tapered, so in order to follow the anatomy, yeah. the step down from the uh, common to the, to the internal. And uh, in these cases, we are using tapered, conical. I so think this because just usually if you do a CT, mm -hmm. on the CT, the amount of the plaque is usually exceeding what we see on the angel. And the problem is shell shall cover all the plaque or you only cover the... Uh, most stenotic part. In fact, on the CT, it was seen that uh, the stenosis is quite short. short. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. It was very well done CT that uh, showing very, very short stenosis. So, uh, what we are doing with the femoral, femoral approach, was there uh, too much calcium? To yes. Too much calcium. So, manual compression. It's a manual good, compression, yes. good old method, so uh, <laughs> not in dramatic. And Guy uh, it's, uh, yeah, and it's a six French uh, sheet, so it's, uh, it's not a large bore. How much is the arterial pressure of the patient? It's a great question. 114. Yeah, this is our absolutely routine protocol. We are pre-treating the, the patient uh, with atropine yeah. because in the past, a long time ago, we saw several asystole. So because of that, uh, we routinely put uh, atropine one milligram 
uh, before the implantation of the stent and uh, before uh, the, the post dilation. And especially in when the bifurcation is, is involved. The so at the end, a historical remark, yes, when Gary Rubin started yeah. in the United States as a cardiologist to do the carotid, yeah. he said it must be done by a cardiologist because you can have heart arrest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, in most of the cases, we have on the shelf uh, uh, noradrenaline, just in case, because uh, especially in some women, uh, the arterial pressure drop can be really very, very uh, serious. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, routinely using uh, volume expansion and, uh, and some uh, calcium gluconate uh, as a mild option to, to increase the pressure. I don't know. It's true. Ah, yeah. So we, we need to, uh, so if you could tell us about your blood pressure management now, because, um, if the blood pressure, because if the blood pressure falls down, this patient has a contralateral stenosis, and we need to see whether he li relies on that. Absolutely. We are trying, uh, in most of the cases, to stay on the middle, uh, let's say, gold middle zone, uh, around 120, 130 uh, systole. Yeah, this is uh, the, the, be the best case. And I see Donald. Uh, hello, Donald. Very nice to see you. Welcome. Well, wonderful to see you and enjoy the meeting again. I, I'm having a great time watching it. Thank you. Uh, do you have some comments, your opinion? I think, look, I think it's been a good job. It's not always easy doing a live case in front of people, particularly a carotid stent, so I think it's a great result. And I agree, I think that the artery will tend to adapt in the next number of days to the stent, and so there will be some remodeling, as was, was suggested. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have to finish yeah. the live case. Absolutely. Congratulations for the team. Thank you very much for Good your job. demonstration. Well done. <laughs> and Tibor, uh, I don't know, do we, we have uh, a coffee break or we have the latest advantage of how we continue the program? If you want, uh, Donald, could you, uh, could you support us to, uh, to have a small break and after that to continue uh, with you? I, I, can, I can share a coffee too here from Scotland. <laughs> yeah, great. <Okay. laughs> we invite you a coffee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, small coffee break and uh, we continue with uh, Klaus. Very interesting presentations. Sorry, if I got it right, we don't.
presentation about uh, experience with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Professor Matthias, please. Yes, many thanks for your introduction and for the invitation. Also, Ivo, who has done a great job to organize this meeting. And asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis is under discussion now for more than 20 years because we have different therapeutic options, and I will talk about that. Yes. First, it is a definition. Yes, because symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, is a clinical orientation, but what's really happening in the carotid artery it might be different. At the moment, we see only on the large screen it. Now it's coming. Okay. And so, as you see with these uh, images, yes, there might be regularly clinical asymptomatic infarctions. That depends on the area in the brain and the size, yes? So what is asymptomatic then? It is not when you look at the imaging, it's only when you look at the clinical situation. And how high is the risk? Annual stroke rate of asymptomatic carotid artery syndrome with more than 70% narrowing is in the range of 3 to 5% per year. And with best medical treatment, it's less than 1%. So when it's less than 1%, yes, how, why should we use a carotid surgery or, or stenting? Does it make any sense to treat these patients invasively? And what influences the stroke rate? It's uh, the degree of stenosis naturally. It's also the age of the patient, gender, plaque morphology. What is with the contralateral ICA? Have we multiple vessel disease with several of the neck arteries narrowed? What is with heart disease additionally? Yes, and when you look at that, that's an elderly, yes, graph by the carotid surgery. Yes, you see that the absolute risk reduction is very clear. Yes, when you have a high degree stenosis, the patient has a very good benefit. The stroke risk increases with the degree of stenosis, but that is only one predictor, and that's not the strongest one. There are others. The degree of stenosis should be at least 70% when we treat them invasively. Yes, with a stroke rate of, of about 1% per year and a 3% complication rate of invasive therapy, that the patient must live at least another four years, otherwise he has no benefit. We know from the trials, especially space, that the stroke rate is lower of the intervention when the patient is younger. That's easily to be explained because then you have a more or less normal aortic arch and the risk that you dislodge material on the way to the lesion is much smaller. And you see it here again. So when you have a 3% complication rate of invasive treatment, yes, the patient has to live about four years, then he has a benefit in comparison to best medical treatment. Therefore, the age and comorbidity matters. And we also know from old, from the NASTED trial, yes, that it depends also on the morphology of the plaque. So when it's ulcerated, yes, the benefit is much more uh, with a degree of stenosis and an ulceration, you see that half of the patient have a good outcome and a, a significantly reduced stroke risk when it's ulcerated. And you see here, we have smooth stenosis, we have ulcerated lesions, so when it's asymptomatic and ulcerated, yes, then I would recommend to treat these patients. So, Black morphology is important and it should be discussed in the single cases because that has a high predictive value. Contralateral disease, as you see it here, you have a high degree of stenosis, picture on the left side, and you see the other carotid artery is occluded. So there is also a high risk that that patient might develop without invasive treatment a large stroke. 
And we also know that from the nested trial, yes, the two years result that an occlusion of the contralateral side, yes, it is a high risk for a larger stroke. So in these cases, because surgery also has a higher risk when the other side is occluded and you clamp the side during operation, then it's much better to do a carotid artery stenting in these cases. We have a much lower risk because you know the risk in the nest set was nearly 15% when the carotid arteries was occluded in space, it was 13%. So it didn't change over a decade of, uh, of many years. So you see here a case, bilateral disease, one side more or less smoothly delineated, it's the right ICA and an ulcerated on the other side, and so we treated that on both sides. What to do with symptomatic ICA stenosis, with asymptomatic stenosis? Yes, we have these options of best medical treatment of carotid end arterectomy and of carotid artery stenting. So you have to make a decision on the basis of some of the trials and personal history of the patient. And you see here with the ACST, yes, the surgery had a complication rate of 3.1%. And uh, they had a good result in the follow-up. And when you look at ACT, uh, yes, you see with cerebral protection, uh, CAS was much better than, than uh, CEA. Yes. And space was stopped before we had enrolled enough patients because uh, enrollment was poor and therefore we could not come to a final result. We, we published that data, but it was, was not satisfying. So, when I look at the ACAS and ACST findings, five-year stroke risk. Uh, so, when you have a normal life expectancy of the patient, yeah, then it's good to look at the long-term outcome, and you see, yes, surgery in was much better Yes, absolute re uh, risk reduction, and uh, ACSD, very similar. So the message is, this trial is, yes, you have maximum benefit in patients younger than 75 years. There is no evidence of benefit in patients aged older than 75 years. Benefit for men and women are more or less equal. And we have a 50% reduction in disabling of fatal stroke. But best medical treatment also over the years was better and better. We have there quite a good treatment. Yes, what happened with carotid artery standing? That are older data, but you see here, yes, it was going up, uh, uh, down, uh, below 3%. Yes. Uh, with PROACT even below 2% of complication rate. So it is still improving. You see here with the, the CAPTCHA-2 trial, yes, death and major stroke 1.1%. That's really good. And uh, I'll come now to other results. Yes, complication rates in space was 2.5%. Act 1, 2.2% in five years. So that's again what I told you when you have best medical treatment with a complication rate of 1% per year, then yes, after two and a half years, you are better off with invasive treatment with carotid artery stenting. Major stroke and death, yes, with CREST or Act 1 is below 1%. And when I look at our older Dortmund data, that were 1,700 asymptomatic stenosis, yes. There is no major stroke and mortality is zero. So we are far below 1%. So it's a very safe procedure in the experienced hands. Total complication rate, 0 0.4. And in Hamburg, the last years, in the program you read, read 200, but in the meanwhile we have treated more patients, so it's 234. You see the age. It's between 48 and 91, mean age nearly 71. Comorbidity, these patients all have uh, additional vascular uh, affections. 
And you see, yes, minor stroke zero, TIA one, mortality zero, recurrence stenosis one, which we also fixed with endovascular treatment. So the total complication rate is also below 1%, so it's in the same range as the first year best medical treatment complication rate. Why have the CAS results improved? Naturally, we have more experience what patients we select. Uh, we have more experience with the procedure itself. We have improved devices, and we use routinely cerebral protection. We talk about prevention of stroke, but what is with the cognitive capability in patients with a flow-reducing degree of stenosis? Normal blood flow in the brain tissue is about 60 milliliter per minute and 100 gram. And we have a stroke below 20. With 20, you can still rescue the tissue, but when it's below and can reach to 10 millimeters per minute only, then the, the cells are dead. But what happens between these, between 20 and 60? So my recommendation, endovascular treatment when degree of stenosis is sufficiently high, irregular surface of the plaque, ulcerated plaque, contralateral ICA occlusion, life expectancy should be five years and more, and also the wish of the patient can influence it because when you know you have a high degree stenosis, yes, some of the patients are very nervous and say, I want get, to get rid of it, yes? So then we also accept that. Carotid endarterectomy is also indicated when we have heavily calcified lesions because that is some of the limits of endovascular treatment. So I close my presentation with this nice sentence, statistics, the only science that enables different experts using the same figures to draw different conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, outstanding data. And I have one question, uh, because some of the markers uh, for uh, prediction of stroke risk are very old one, like extensive CC and uh, irregularity. And now they are mixed with some new one coming from the MR field and coming from the yes. intravascular intracranial ultrasound. So in your opinion, what should prevail, newer or over or both? when you make a decision? To make a decision, so, so plaque analyzers are already mentioned, yes. Uh, the other question is always multiple vessel disease, because then you have an underperfused brain, even when the patient is still clinically asymptomatic. In reality, some of them, they are very slow. So the brain cells needs more time to perform some actions, yes. And so therefore, you have to look at both, yes. Naturally first the, the brain and the artery and then you can do that with MR imaging today, also with the plaque analysis. But I do because that is more expensive and more, so normally a, a good ultrasound examination is enough for me. Yeah? Because and you measure the flow when you have 300 centimeters per, per second flow velocity, then you know that it's a high degree stenosis. We are waiting now for the CREST 2 trial results. Yes. And it will confuse the area even more because you are showing us an excellent results which can be comparable with any randomized data and you cannot beat a complication rate of 0.4%. And then again, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, but I, I, I think that uh, next trials, because people are more and more experienced how to do the procedure, yes? And therefore, the uh, numbers will improve also with time. That at least I expect, yeah? Okay. Thank you. So we have here now also some... We have a question here for Dr. Nikolov. Just a remark, just a remark. We have the, the data from last month in Lancet from uh, ACHT 2, the one which compares uh, CA, uh, Both methods are very good yeah. for us Yes, and uh, we can also say that with uh, these comp 
concurrence, yes, with, with endovascular treatment, also surgery became better and better over the years, yes? So the, the five and six percent complication rates are more or less gone, yes, also in surgery. Okay, thank you very much for this talk. And we are moving uh, to the next talk, uh, which will be given by Professor Petrov. The, the talk, yeah. Okay, Dr. Polomsky, total and subtotal. Stenosis. I wonder what total stenosis means. <laughs> <laughs> Understand now. <laughs> So, dear colleagues, uh, uh, my name is Petr Pulomsky, and thank you for the opportunity to present our work uh, about uh, carotid artery standing in uh, subtotal carotid uh, stenosis. So, uh, the endovascular experience in our center uh, for the last five years is uh, uh, above 8,000 8, intervention at all, uh, uh, more than 750 of the cases are carotid and artery stenting cases, uh, including uh, stroke intervention. 68 is the number of the patient with near occlusion or subtotal carotid artery stenosis that were, was intervented for this uh, period of time. About the subtotal carotid artery occlusion is uh, uh, invented, uh, not invented, but described for the first time in uh, 1953, actually. Uh, then it was clear that uh, this uh, condition is uh, the therapeutic cha challenge different than uh, uh, severe stenosis itself. Till now, there is no universal definition in the world about uh, uh, subtot subtotal carotid artery stenosis. In the different articles, in the different Syria, uh, different out authors um, point um, uh, some um, uh, point many of uh, many of uh, angio criteria for um, uh, subtotal carotid artery stenosis, but the most uh, constant one is distal co-ops of internal co carotid artery following a critical stenosis. Uh, it's from the angio. There are so many synonyms in the, for the near occlusion, uh, near total occlusion, 99% stenosis, uh, functional occlusion, incomplete occlusion, and string sign of internal carotid artery, etc. Of course, uh, two trials, NASTSET uh, and uh, ESCT are the cornerstone for the intervention of carotid artery at all, not uh, uh, subtotal, but every severe carotid artery stenosis. Uh, it's uh, very important to say that uh, these two trials, which are cornerstone for the intervention, use a different method to measure uh, the severity of stenosis. The NASTED met method actually measure the uh, uh, diameter of the internal carotid st uh, artery just after the, the stenosis. Uh, uh, and uh, compare it to the uh, narrowest segment of the artery. In case of near occlusion and um, uh, subtotal carotid artery, artery stenosis, the uh, diameter just after the stenosis is co dietary just after the stenosis collapsed. So uh, the stenosis can be underestimated. What we uh, uh, know from here is that the severity of the stenosis from the angio, uh, uh, which is actually the percent of the stenosis, cannot be the only one criteria in order to recognize and diagnose uh, subtotal uh, carotid artery uh, stenosis. Actually, uh, I've tried here to summarize four most constant criteria in the different articles for subtotal carotid artery uh, occlusions. The images are taken uh, from our patients. Uh, first uh, criteria is the late contrast in internal carotid artery, distal to the stenosis. Second criteria is internal carotid artery uh, with small, smaller distal uh, diameter compared with the contralateral one. Third one is the presence of intracranial collaterals from the non-target internal carotid artery. Actually, um, from the live case of Dr. Stankov, we see similar uh, uh, feeling of um, uh, left anterior, uh, left anterior um, uh, cerebral artery from the uh, uh, right. 
And uh, the fourth criteria is a distal diameter of ipsilateral uh, internal carotid artery less or equal to the, uh, compared to the external uh, carotid uh, artery uh, from the such side. To be honest, um, in order to uh, um, diagnose or to refer a stenosis as subtotal occlusion, we uh, uh, try to find more than two of these criteria in our 68, our series of uh, 68 uh, uh, patients. These stenoses are divided uh, of two main groups. Uh, it's uh, 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 very important. First of all, uh, there are stenosis with a complete collapse of uh, um, uh, carotid artery distally to the uh, lesion. Uh, we, which are called uh, near occlusion with full collapse and other new occlusion without full collapse. This is a um, cornerstone of uh, probably newest publication about uh, treat or not treat this type of uh, uh, lesions. Till now, a number of current guidelines uh, recommend actually conservative uh, treatment in patient with near occlusion uh, with only single ipsilateral uh, vascular event. Uh, but uh, to be honest, the optimal treatment of the patient is uh, uh, unclear. Uh, what we know about uh, the pathophysiology, uh, each, carotid, each severe carotid stenosis can progress to near occlusion, and each near occlusion can progress to total one. Uh, actually, uh, the histological finding in most of the cases is uh, atherosternosic lesion, which is uh, um, severe, not occlusion, but in some cases, uh, the pathological finding is actually a, a re recanalized uh, thrombosis in uh, this patient. Uh, during the, during the uh, intervention, uh, um, antatherectomy, uh, intraoperatively measured pressure distal to the stenosis is usually higher uh, in patients with near occlusion. Uh, and uh, I will try to explain this phenomenon. Actually, the uh, collateral boot fall is uh, uh, very uh, important in this patient. There are two types of collaterals. Collaterals uh, that involve circle of uh, villis. Here you may see the uh, 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 relation between the grade of the stenosis, severity in percent, and uh, frequency of the collaterals reported in the um, uh, measurement. So, uh, two type of collaterals. Uh, first of them uh, are uh, involved the circle of wheels, and uh, the second one are different than circle of wheels. Their uh, most biggest of them are through middle med uh, arteria meningea medica, ophthalmic artery, or um, uh, occipital artery. Uh, uh, there is uh, just uh, one publication trying to explain the phenomenon of uh, subtotal carotid artery stenosis. It's uh, uh, by Sp Spencer and College. Uh, they describe a theoretical model uh, according which if the stenosis is uh, severe enough, and uh, uh, this will um, um, progress to the large, uh, large drop in the pressure distally to the stenosis, and reimbursement of the boot fall uh, from the contralateral part through the uh, collaterals that uh, we, we describe. Uh, so uh, uh, the gradual decrease, which is uh, mandatory uh, for this model uh, in the severity of the stenosis, will lead to the progression of the uh, near occlusion from the near occlusion without to near occlusion with full Cops. This is the theoretical model, so uh, uh, there are two mandatory things. First of all, is the gradual decrease in the uh, undergrad fall, which means actually slow progression of the stenosis. And the second thing, uh, uh, the circle of wheels and uh, the collaterals must, uh, um, must work normally, so uh, there must be not uh, any uh, uh, any type of um, anomalies uh, on this uh, uh, level. 
just in order to uh, make some um, mm, mm, uh, point between the coronary versus carotid uh, uh, lesions. In case of uh, coronary uh, lesions, uh, I will uh, point only single non-infarction uh, coronary lesions. There is no direct relationship between uh, the degree of the stenosis and the uh, uh, risk of uh, some uh, event, in this case myocardial infarction for the uh, uh, patient, but what we know about the, the uh, carotid stenosis, there is a direct relation between the degree of the stenosis of the vessel and the risk of uh, some cerebrovascular event in uh, this uh, uh, patient. It is very interesting what is the mechanism of tear and stroke every cerebrovascular incident uh, in this patient, patient with uh, near occlusions. Um, probably uh, what we know is that a near occlusion can progress to total occlusion, so uh, this is probably uh, mm, uh, most suspected mechanism uh, in uh, patient, but it's very interesting that uh, uh, I actually found only one, only one um, publication that compares a series of four patients with near occlusion with full co-ops, which are uh, actually angiographed before and after the incident, without any treatment, different than uh, optimal medical treatment. And actually, what the author found is that um, uh, none of these four patients uh, has a progression of near occlusion to the complete occlusion. So probably the embolic and, <coughs> excuse me, hemodynamic uh, mechanisms are also involved in the, in the um, uh, pathophysiology of the cerebrovascular events uh, during uh, uh, these patients. Um, actually, uh, mm, return back to the NASTSET and uh, EC trial uh, before, uh, it is um, uh, very important to point that a very small number of the patient in these trials uh, had um, uh, near occlusions. Uh, only uh, 264 cases of near occlusions are uh, included in this trial, and only 16 of the patient had uh, a real near occlusion with full cops of the distal uh, intra, um, internal carotid artery. Actually, these trials didn't um, prove any um, benefit from the uh, antarterectomy um, uh, for the patient with uh, near occlusion, but um, the data is so insufficient for uh, stati statistical analysis. So, to be honest, this trial can not give uh, a, light, a light spot on the uh, um, question if it's necessary to intervene or not uh, uh, these arteries. Actually, uh, in uh, 1983, the work by uh, Ringenstein and colleagues, uh, which uh, focus um, uh, on the surgical treatment of subtotal, subtotal uh, car carotid artery stenosis, uh, Four at night patients, nine uh, patients with near occlusion with full co-ops, uh, co and um, uh, they uh, actually just follow up this patient. They give optimal medical treatment, but nothing more. So the author uh, uh, reported that six of them, six of nine patients, for a very short period of time, three months, uh, have a worsening in the uh, ne neurological deficit, and in particular, two of them have uh, crescendo transitory ischemic attacks, two have amaurosis fugus, and two patients have um, uh, the lesion progressed to total uh, with some kind of uh, neurological uh, deficit, additional neuro neurological deficit. In uh, 1989, uh, other clinical study, uh, studies trying to um, make some um, change in, game change in uh, the, the treatment of near occlusions. Uh, actually nine patients uh, with near occlusion in uh, this study undergo surgical treatment uh, and um, uh, three uh, had a recurrent ipsilateral stroke. In 2015, group of 10 patients with uh, near occlusion of tutu uh, with full cause or um, um, uh, just um, mm, followed up, and 40% of them uh, have ipsilateral stroke for just one month of uh, follow-up. The first large meta-analysis uh, for the patient with near occlusion, which actually head-to-head um, -head directly compares optimal medical treatment with coronary artery stenting and optimal medical treatment with antarterectomy, 
actually re reports incident ratio uh, with 1.6 uh, uh, for coronary artery stenting and uh, incident ratio similar 2.2 of, uh, in case of antarterectomy for such patient, which is uh, statistically, um, um, statistically significant finding that the prognosis of these patients is better than uh, the, uh, with uh, surgical treatment compared to the uh, optimal medical treatment. Other meta-analysis published in 2020, uh, which is based on a 33 publication from the period of 2025 and 2020, we report the incidence of the stroke after antarterectomy uh, about 1.5%, incident of stroke after carotid stenting 1.8%, but in any case, this is probably more than six times more than incident of stroke after only drug therapy, which is 8.4%. Uh, this is the largest meta-analysis uh, that uh, compares head-to-head -head optimal medical treatment with uh, other treatment of um, uh, carotid arteries with uh, full collapse. Uh, the authors have to also report that uh, there is a um, statistically significant um, difference in the terms of stroke rate after any surgical treatment or stenting and the year of the publication. So the, the, the incidence of stroke progressively dropped between 2005 till 2020, which is the probably sign that uh, um, the, the procedures becomes less um, uh, invasively. Here is uh, one, of, uh, one of our patients uh, with uh, right-sided hemiplegia for um, approximately one day, um, one in ineffective fibrin releases in the acute phase of the, uh, of the uh, stroke. Here you can see the actually near occlusion with uh, the thrombus involved also in this case. So uh, the uh, lesion was uh, crossed with run through hypercode uh, uh, guide wire and a fine cross microcatheter. After that, um, uh, the uh, uh, protection with, um, after that the Paladin uh, balloon was uh, used uh, because the lesion contains uh, thrombus formation itself and the implantation of one exact stent was done nine um, millimeters, nine, uh, seven, 40 millimeters. So this is the final result in this case. With uh, NICS-4 at 30 days after the, the, the incident. Uh, about the conclusions, uh, uh, we know that near occlusion carries a worse prognosis uh, than uh, uh, any severe uh, occlusion of the carotid artery artery. Uh, the near occlusion is directly related with the cerebrovascular incident and uh, the treatment of these uh, lesions carry higher risk of complication um, as hyperperfusion, hemorrhagic stroke, extravasation compared to the treatment of severe but not near occlusion. Uh, uh, the clinical trials that are cornerstone for the treatment of carotid artery stenosis uh, didn't include uh, uh, enough patient to give us uh, statistically uh, relevant data about uh, what will be uh, the treatment of these lesions. And uh, the recent data showed benefit from uh, stenting or surgical treatment compared with uh, conservative one. So uh, probably in the future, uh, the recommendations uh, and guidelines will be, uh, the indication will be extended. Thank you. If you allow me just a comment, uh, Dr. Polomsky didn't show, but uh, in these 68 patients, we compared the 68 patients, so near occlusion group, compared to the non near occlusion, so uh, uh, typical stenosis up to 90%. And uh, this uh, fear about hyperperfusion, hemorrhage, and, and so on, uh, higher mortality, higher complication rate, in fact, didn't do true. We had no any difference. We don't have no one hyperperfusion, no one hemorrhage. And uh, in fact, it's definitely feasible. We are doing, in fact, uh, in case we, uh, we make a statistics, 
about 5% of our carotid activity is due to stenosis with near occlusion, but uh, like mentioned here, without full collapse. So uh, we, are, we are treating such kinds of patients with uh, uh, only uh, capacity of uh, accepting the new flow. So uh, probably this is the reason not to, having, uh, not to have uh, hyperperfusion. Because uh, uh, in case the vascular uh, activity is totally blocked, in, in this situation, we have a real uh, risk of uh, hyperperfusion. But in case uh, we have a good uh, vascular, uh, vascular reactivity, the, the risk is uh, not, not so high. And we are doing the procedure since 10 years. So I believe there are some patients with a real indication. I guess we all agree that a uh, patient with uh, critical stenosis has to be treated with near occlusion uh, it depends whether the uh, blood coming to the occlusion is reaching the brain. Exactly. So maybe it's a phenomenon and maybe even if at the time of the um, uh, diagnostics we don't see any contrast coming into the brain, mm -hmm. it uh, no, doesn't it's... mean then two hours later we may have it. So maybe there is good potential for embolization nevertheless. Because otherwise, we will rely only on hemodynamic principle to improve the perfusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is very tricky to predict uh, whether the hemodynamics will change after the uh, opening the vessel. Yeah, there are some uh, methods, some uh, MRI and CTA perfusion, that are trying to predict uh, what will happen in case the, the carotid is open. And there was a commentary a editorial about five or six uh, years ago by uh, Jay Yadav that uh, uh, in case the vascular capacity based on the CT MRI perfusion is maintained, this patient has the potential to have a benefit from the, from the intervention. But what I'm saying is that uh, if you keep it simple, if you see some flow, we have to open it. Yeah, okay. in order to pe keep well, it really simple, it's true. It's uh, more or less true. I see, uh, Donald, Donald, what is your opinion as a surgeon? Do you uh, sometimes operate uh, near occlusion carotids? I think it's a very, very important topic, and I'm very pleased that you've put this onto the agenda, Evo. And the late British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, had recurrent mm. strokes in the presence of total occlusion of both of his carotid arteries. Hmm. And perhaps, or perhaps not, he had subtotal occlusions, I, I don't know. But it's cerebral vascular insufficiency rather than embolic disease and is extremely well treated if you can get more blood up to the brain and the patient's symptoms are transformed. So I do remember um, that many years ago, Dr. DeBake and Dr. Dietrich used the external carotid artery and they, in the presence of total occlusion of the internal carotids, they would surgically Bypass. improve a narrowed origin of the external carotid artery to show, just as you have seen, the collateral flow through the external bypass. carotid artery towards the brain. And, and, and later on, um, yes, that, that's true, Klaus, but later on, um, I did a small series and published it with Dr. Dietrich of stenting the origin of the external carotid artery in the presence of total occlusion of both internal carotids, and the patients all did extremely well because of this, and one of them was transformed. So um, I'm a great fan of this topic. It's not aired enough, uh, and well done, and a great presentation. Thank you, Donald. Thank you very much. Some more? I guess it's time to move forward. Yeah, some more comments? I guess not. Okay. Everybody's convinced <laughs> to start treating all the clues now. Jack. Okay. <laughs> Jack will speak about a risk stenosis. That is uh, really a problem in all the vascular medicine. Risk stenosis after intervention. I'm 
very happy to be with you today in front of this prestigious moderation. And I uh, would like first to thank Ivo Petrov for his kind invitation and friendship. I'm also very happy to see my good friend, former president of ICVS, Dr. Donald Reed. Donald, how are you doing? Good, I think. I'm good, thank you so much, Jack. Great to see you. Carotid instant restenosis is defined by 70% of tenosis in the inner diameter. This uh, problem appears at the rate of uh, 5 to 12 percent in the different publications I've read. Could be a big problem in the evolution of your patient. Mrs. Uh, Tekieli, as early uh, as, early as uh, 2019, say that the optimal management of a severe carotid instance stenosis remain unknown. So let's go in the subject. But first, if you are leading one day, please take some time to look behind you. This is important of the history. In France, carotid enterectomy is a gold standard, as you know. And we do a large number of these cases in the French public and private institution. But first, because he's present with us, Dr. Professor Claude Mathias, Klaus Mathias, from Muster at the beginning and now in Hamburg, was the first man doctor to do an angioplasty in the carotid. It was in 1977. You were a young doctor at that time. A little bit younger, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. And then you go on 10 years after, or 12 years after, and you did the first carotid stenting. So I would like to con congratulate you. <laughs> personally. In France, Jacques Terron, maybe some people know, know, uh, know him, and I think Klaus, you know him, he did an artisanal uh, preparation to do the first stent, striker stent uh, in this occasion, with a protection. But people were not so convinced at that time, but he, he was a pioneer. Dr. Buckley, that we miss very much from the ISCVS say, in any case, the indication for carotid angioplasty with stenting must be decided after multidisciplinary discussion with a vascular surgeon in particular. I agree with that. We all know the authorized carotid stents. There are at least in France four models, many other in the world. Anyway, we need neuroprotection system in quite all the cases, quite all the cases. And you need also a good and very good intervational suite as yours, Ivo, because you are very well equipped with, to, to, to be able to perform a good cerebral angiography at the end, and digital angiography, and also IVERS in a command for the doctor. Remember that more you do, better you are. And you see, when you start, the damage can be high. So you have to work with a proctor and a, an older doctor to be trained and become better after 200. It's a lot. Just an example. I did this case uh, uh, some time ago. It was a long eccentric arteriosclerosis ulcerated symptomatic stenosis. And we, we treat it by uh, a wall stent. 
But six months after, what happened? Is it an antimal hyperplasia or is it a restonosis? This is the problem. Something is inside the artery. In fact, I did work on the predictors and I looked to the literature. Preferentially during the first year, strangely, uh, with a diabetes patient, smoker, when you have a neoplasm or leukemia, I think it's because of the inflammation. Or if you keep a residual stenosis after your, your angioplasty, or a, a small stent diameter, or if you use multiple stents, not to do. So in fact, for this problem, you have two different strategic options endovascular or surgical. But remember the multidisciplinary decision-making considering the speciality involved in the initial procedure. The endovascular option and management are restenting, but maybe it's a lot of material inside, reballoading, be careful to the embolic problem, Drug eluting balloon, I've seen that in the literature. I don't know if it's working in the, in the carotid, maybe. Drug eluting stent, in any case, self expanding. And the new comer, the mesh and cover stent, road saver and cigar. Why not? But it's still on experience. The surgical mass, uh, management is very simple and very clear. Stent extraction, endotectomy, or carotid bypass in some difficult cases. Let me speak uh, with you of one of my recent case reports on a young patient. He was a smoker with a good profession, but a smoker and cannabis. He had a leukemia, the history of a leukemia, hypertension, and serial pneumothorax treated with drainage. The, the initial angiography show uh, a, a, a severe rat common carotid stenosis distally, treated immediately because of the situation with a cast with needle no luminous stent. The problem, eight months later, so within the first year, a very tight stenosis was developed. Very tight. That I confirm with an angiography because of the, uh, I just draw on, on the, the, the angiography to let you, there is a little chenal. So we, we join the, the situation of your previous uh, talk. we took an immediate decision making for surgical decision, considering the severity of the obstruction. And look, I did clamp and open the artery, and look this bloody stent, <laughs> full of material, obstructing with the neotentibal hyperplasia, the, quite the totality of the stent. Yet eight months after, inside and all along the stent, we were very surprised to do that, but happy to do the surgery. We did the completion of the endatectomy. Look, we leave the, 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 the surface uh, clear, clean and we extract, after the stent, the native ateromatous plaque, and finish by a dacon patch arterial closure as classical. Important of the team approach, and the echo duplex can control, and you see that this patient was controlled with a clear diameter on the surface that we treated. It 
was uh, 10 months after the operation, this control. And you see a very good pulsation. The patient is happy. He was surrounded by his doctor and his surgeon. And this shows a good, a good outcome, hopefully. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Reed in Glasgow insist on the quality of screening with uh, inside a multidisciplinary approach with a concerted decision making, use a regular medical follow up for uh, early reintervention is necessary and please control the risk factor. I thank you for your attention. Great talk, thank you, Jack. Very instructive. Some comments, Klaus, Vasco? Yes, there are, uh, are different uh, therapeutic options, was pointed out. I suggest that next year you organize a talk about treatment of recurrent disease after surgery. Okay, agree. <laughs> In fact, probably the audience, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons the endovascular intervention of carotid to, to appear was the wrist stenosis after surgery. So uh, uh, nowadays, in the late data with the new technology, the uh, wrist stenosis after carotid stenting is a quite a rare situation. Uh, unless, unless it's a not proper indication, for example, we discussed already, uh, Professor Matthias uh, mentioned that uh, for uh, uh, critical calcific stenosis, it's not a good idea to implant a stent uh, in case it's not uh, well open with a balloon. So uh, in circular calcium, this is uh, probably one of uh, the biggest predictors of uh, instant wrist stenosis. And we had uh, such, a, such a situation several months ago Unfortunately, the patient uh, was a doctor, medical doctor. He had really a critical stenosis two times. And uh, on the last uh, incidence, we used, uh, we have discussed yesterday, Vasco, uh, we have used a shockwave balloon yeah. with finally excellent result. So in, uh, in case we uh, don't disrupt the calcium, it's more than clear the, the stent uh, can be open. I just want to say that uh, I, I fully agree that if, if we have uh, so much uh, material inside the stent mm -hmm. and we have a surgical solution, we're happy because uh, it is solution. But the real problem is with the recurrent uh, stenosis after irradiation therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is usually not a surgical case because the tissues are very uh, different. So what's your suggestion if we have a post-radiation uh, post stenosis and it keeps coming back? So, do you see any solution of this problem? The case I show you was to aware the audience on the inflammatory mm -hmm. system of some patient. This patient was probably a bad candidate because of his history. If you have a radiation stenosis, even recurrent, and though, you know, it's always and though, because if you cut down, you will have a problem, even if you are a good surgeon. So radiation, endovascular. Mm -hmm. Donald, do you have some comment, opinion? I, I like your presentation, Jack, again. It's an important topic that is often ignored. Thank you, Donald. And I feel that it's not necessarily, re it's not necessarily re-stenosis, but the same stenosis that wasn't detected at the time of implantation. And so it's very useful to use two directional angiography imaging or intravascular ultrasound at the time of the initial stent to make sure that there is a very good channel through. And then you're less likely to get a re-stenosis. But you've got a Good result there surgically. Dr. Matthias mentioned a topic for next year of recurrent stenosis following surgery. 
Well, Ali Abu Rama is really the authority on this. He's the current president of the Society of a great deal of evidence to show that the correct treatment for that, of course, is carotid stenting. So those are my comments, Ivo. Donald, I will be happy to speak with you later, maybe tomorrow Good. or next week. With Perfect. pleasure. Thank you. Perfect, Jack. Good for you. Thank you, Donald. Thank you for joining us. Even online, well, my, your, my, your participation is crucial. We miss you. It's a huge, huge pleasure. Yes, well, I'm very, very sorry not to be there this year. Thank I've been you. at every single meeting until now. Okay, uh, I guess it's time for the next speech, which yeah. will be about uh, optimizing medical management in peripheral vascular disease. Please, Yvonne. In fact, we finished uh, with the program of uh, this session regarding aortic arch and carotid, supraortic vessels. And we are starting the TEVA-sponsored uh, session that is uh, related to optimization of uh, treatment of peripheral vascular disease. So, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, um, all we know that uh, atherosclerosis is a systemic uh, disease. And uh, because of that, uh, peripheral cerebrovascular and coronary artery stenosis is uh, quite much prevalent. And uh, not only that, but uh, the overlapping between the three vascular territories is significant. Uh, it's uh, more than clear because this is the cardiovascular continuum. So you know, we don't have uh, separated uh, vasculature to the brain, to the heart and the peripheral arteries. Everything is related and connected. And you see that uh, in uh, some publications, the overlapping of two zones is reaching up to 6%. And uh, overlapping of three zones is uh, reaching in, in some series uh, uh, 12 and uh, 15%. The, uh, in fact, uh, there is a direct re relationship uh, between the vascular bed involved uh, and the prognosis. The more, the, the more diffuse, diffuse is the atherosclerosis and the more vascular beds as, uh, are involved, uh, the higher the event rate and uh, it's uh, multiplied. It's uh, not summarized, but it's, uh, it's multiplied. The main challenges uh, are that the two-third uh, of uh, peripheral artery disease patients had polyvascular disease, and even without knowing, you know, without uh, uh, taking into, uh, into consideration. And the therapeutic strategies uh, in many cases uh, have uh, to involve also the other territories and uh, uh, absolutely by person into the guideline when we have uh, patients with one vascular territory proven pathology, there is advisable to have a screening of the other uh, vascular pathologies. And uh, it's, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, following uh, from, the, uh, from the trials that are showing that uh, peripheral vascular disease uh, may, uh, often, uh, in fact, uh, doesn't allow us uh, uh, and to the patient to be symptomatic. We know very well that uh, uh, limited uh, by claudica uh, claudication, walking claudication patients, they cannot have uh, angina because they don't have walk. They don't have uh, uh, the possibility to exercise themselves. Uh, in the REACH uh, registry, uh, it was very well shown that the peripheral artery disease group is not a beneficial group. So be uh, because it resulted that uh, the majority of, of patients uh, that are considered beneficial of peripheral vascular disease, they die from stroke and myocardial infarction. So into the trials, it will definitely shown that uh, about 75% of the peripheral vascular disease patients uh, die from cerebrovascular or coronary uh, incident. And the more symptomatic the, the, the peripheral vascular disease is, uh, worse the prognosis is. So, it's uh, definitely very important to prevent uh, the, uh, the atherosclerosis uh, because, uh, in peripheral vascular disease and to treat the atherosclerosis because all the three vascular territories are sharing the same risk factor. So we have to keep uh, in mind that and uh, uh, we have to give uh, uh, the proper medication, so uh, like statin 
ACE inhibitors or uh, other angiotensin uh, receptor blockers and antiplatelet therapy for all kinds of vascular pathology that is described, carotid, peripheral, or coronary vascular pathology. And the cornerstones of uh, prevention and treatment are absolutely the same. Uh, more than obvious, uh, uh, they share, this kind of patients, they share the same risk factors like uh, high uh, cholesterol level, arterial pressure, uh, 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 sp uh, the smoking, and uh, also prothrombotic state. So all this, uh, this situation has to be uh, treated on, on the, same, uh, the same way. Let's take a look uh, a little regarding uh, vasodilators. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, treatment like tilostazole, that is a very interesting uh, medication combining antiplatelet and uh, vasodilator mechanism, uh, has a crucial role, especially in patients with peripheral vascular disease. Uh, there are also uh, some uh, data regarding uh, uh, cerebrovascular and coronary, but in peripheral vascular disease, it's uh, absolutely proven uh, with no doubt that uh, the uh, silostazole uh, can improve uh, uh, symptomatically the patients uh, with peri peripheral vascular, vascular disease. And uh, in, uh, uh, different, uh, in different ways. So uh, the tilostazole is increasing the walking distance, distance like shown here, uh, twice daily of uh, 100 milligrams of uh, tilostazole. And they, uh, since more than 20 years, uh, is known uh, this medication. There are many trials and uh, also meta analysis. Uh, uh, taking into account the role of tilostazole regarding symptomatology of uh, patients with, uh, uh, with peripheral vascular disease. And uh, there are some uh, comparison with uh, other medication like pentoxifilin, and uh, uh, it resulted that the, the, the data are favoring uh, the treatment with uh, uh, tilostazole compared to pentoxifilin, uh, pentoxifilin like shown, uh, shown here. And uh, um, of course, uh, I mentioned already that tilostazole has also some antiplatelet activity, but uh, uh, into the guidelines, uh, we, uh, we have to apply into the, the following the guidelines in uh, patients that are symptomatic with peripheral arterial disease. Uh, typical uh, antiplatelets like uh, clopidogrel. This is shown into the guideline. Uh, you see that uh, aspirin or clopidogrel is uh, 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 definitely with a very good indication, especially for symptomatic patients. You remember probably that uh, the more the uh, symptomatic patient, the higher the risk of thrombosis is. And probably this is the reason uh, to have a very good uh, indication class for symptomatic patients with peripheral vascular disease, and especially in patients uh, who received some kind of uh, intervention. So after intervention, surgical or endovascular, this uh, indication is even increasing uh, the, the, the level after carotid stenting or peripheral stenting or uh, not, no doubt after coronary, coronary uh, stent implantation. And uh, this is uh, the same extraction from the guideline, again advocating the uh, antiplatelet uh, anti and uh, uh, with uh, reducing the maze, the measure uh, adverse events and uh, not only the uh, simple adverse events, but also keeping uh, from amputation and uh, 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 increasing the, the walking distance in, in this situation. The, uh, in fact, the new agents like uh, Ticagrelor uh, uh, that tried to show a superiority above uh, uh, classical, let's see, classical antiplatelet like uh, uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. In fact, they, uh, they showed uh, equipoise but not superiority. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very important. So still, the low dose of aspirin, like shown here, and uh, clopidogrel, uh, so mono or uh, double antiplatelet therapy is still the, uh, let's say, the classic. Uh, the classic. And uh, here is uh, very interesting to show that uh, there is uh, some uh, synergistic effect uh, um, between uh, tilostazole as a vasodilator uh, medication and uh, double antiplatelet with aspirin and uh, clopidogrel. 
So there are many data showing uh, that uh, the tilostazole has a very versatile effect on the patients with, uh, uh, with the claudication. And uh, as shown here, you see uh, this publication in uh, different years uh, have shown that uh, there is a significant uh, decrease of, uh, of the risk uh, in, the, in the group of patients uh, on, on treatment, reducing not, uh, uh, improving not only the walking distance, but also reducing the uh, clinical, clinical events uh, and uh, uh, absolutely significant with uh, statist statistical significance. Also, uh, uh, what I mentioned, uh, amputation-free uh, survival is also different between the placebo and, uh, and uh, tilostazole, like shown here in uh, this graphing during the, the time. So the longer the tilostazole is taken, the, the higher is uh, the probability to have beneficial effect regarding the reduction of probability of, uh, of uh, amputation. Uh, similar, another trial showing that uh, the amputation rates after lower extremity revascularization. So, um, uh, 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 some remark, you see that the tilostazole has also, in our experience, the tilostazole has uh, 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 its uh, uh, role not only in uh, uh, revascularization naive patients, but also after revascularization, both uh, surgical or endovascular, the tilostazole is beneficial. And uh, why? The, uh, one of the reasons is not only because of the vasodilation, but because in many trials, uh, I know at least, at, at least 10 trials uh, since more than 15 years, there were data regarding the prevention of risk stenosis. So uh, there are many, many trials and some meta-analysis uh, showing that uh, the uh, uh, the utilization of silostazole in, into the oral treatment uh, is uh, reducing the risk of uh, risk stenosis, and uh, it's uh, definitely proven on the peripheral uh, vascular, uh, vascular level. And uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, forest plot uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, outcomes. You see different uh, uh, several publications uh, uh, speaking about uh, the beneficial uh, beneficial utilization of tilostazole, uh, not only on uh, on uh, uh, amputation-free survival, risk stenosis, but even some si uh, signal uh, not reaching statistical significance, uh, but even uh, regarding uh, mor mortality in this case. On the basis of available evidence, uh, uh, hopefully you are convinced, uh, adding silostazole uh, to antiplatelet therapy, so utilizing both, uh, we can uh, improve symptomatically our patients with peripheral vascular disease. We can improve the walking distance uh, to uh, uh, keep them from amputation and also to reduce the probability of reintervention, reintervention and, uh, and uh, restenosis and reintervention. Lipid lowering therapy is uh, uh, during uh, uh, in the trials during many years it was uh, definitely uh, shown how important uh, and uh, this morning uh, uh, you saw how important is the uh, LDLC uh, reduction in order to improve uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 prognosis of the patients. And uh, um, it's uh, absolutely logic that uh, the lipid lowering uh, therapy uh, is uh, into the guideline on a very high level of evidence. And uh, uh, we saw that uh, uh, in case we don't uh, succeed with statin uh, and uh, with higher dose uh, intensive uh, statin therapy, we have to go following the uh, uh, following uh, the the. The, the rules uh, and, uh, and, and the chart of the European Society of Cardiology, we have to utilize additional agents uh, like uh, azetimibe or PCSK9 inhibitors in order to reduce the LDLC levels because this is definitely improving the, uh, the prognosis of the patient. This is the good news that uh, 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 in patients with uh, high cholesterol level, especially the LDLC reduction uh, during the time and the longer the reduction is, uh, is true, the better uh, the prognosis is. So, so we can rely uh, following uh, uh, these uh, uh, rules of the guideline. 
uh, this algorithm going into the algorithm, so we have a second and third option, uh, especially for high-risk patients like uh, diabetic, uh, uh, F, uh, FH, familial hyper, uh, hypercholesterolemia patients. We have to add the third agent, uh, uh, which are the anti-PCSK9 uh, inhibitors that uh, are several now. Uh, on the market. So this optimization is very important uh, to be added to the previous medication in order to have uh, uh, better prognosis like shown uh, into the REACH uh, reach, uh, uh, registry how important it is to follow the guidelines. And it's um, clear from the trials that following the guidelines uh, is improving the prognosis of the patient. So it's, uh, we have to be evidence-based, uh, um, uh, let's say, stimulated in order to improve the, uh, the, the prognosis of our patient. The other risk factor is uh, the uh, blood, uh, in fact, the hypertension, the arterial hypertension. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, some ambiguous in the, in the peripheral vascular pathology. We have some uh, kind of uh, J curve. So definitely we have to treat the high and extremely high arterial pressure. But uh, like commented in uh, many publications and in, in many guidelines, it's not a good idea uh, to go uh, uh, below 110 millimeters of mercury for peripheral vascular patients because uh, we are reducing on a such a way the perfusion, the peripheral perfusion of these patients and we can uh, uh, decrease the walking distance. So we have to have in mind uh, regarding this J-curve uh, effect and to keep the, the arterial pressure of the patients between 120 and 140 in order to be on the best uh, side of the, of the treatment. So summarizing, uh, we have to have uh, complex therapy on the peripheral vascular patients because in most of the cases it's resulting that uh, they are complex patients uh, with uh, involvement of uh, other vascular beds uh, and with the utilization of the uh, uh, control of the arterial pressure, vasodilation and uh, antiplatelets uh, and of course revascularization in the, in the patients uh, with uh, indication, we can improve the prognosis of, uh, of uh, our patients. And thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. Uh, I would just like to invite uh, Professor Cervenkov to join us here at the stadium. And I suggest I give my talk and then we have a short discussion about the medical. Yes, and uh, after that, uh, Professor Matthias, because I will uh, have enough time sure. to go for the live. Professor Velchev, floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, so I think uh, Ivo did uh, the hard job and I have an easy task because I only need to convince you that you have to tailor the risk to your strategy and, uh, in other words, uh, to tailor the hammer to the nail. And, uh, okay, that's my disclosures that uh, even if it's a Teva symposium, this is my thoughts and I will share it with you. I will not draw on this uh, slide just to show you that the number of uh, many, many studies which are uh, examining the role of the anti-aggregation regimens in the treatment of uh, coronary artery disease. But nowadays, uh, our guidelines are based on uh, two very old trials showing that acute coronary syndromes, the more potent new anti-aggregation regimens have an advantage compared to clopidogrel. So what's the current paradigm? If you, have, if you have acute coronary syndrome, you have to treat it with double anti-aggregation uh, therapy for 12 months with or without intervention, it does not matter. And uh, despite this double anti-aggregation therapy, we still have quite a big uh, number of patients dying or experiencing heart failure at the end of the first year. And both uh, uh, European and over the ocean guidelines says that we have to prefer prazugrel and ticagrel over clopidogrel if we don't have atrial fibrillation or valve disease. But you can see here that we have a lot of interest which sparkled in the last uh, few years uh, about uh, um, a renewed role of the clopidogrel. 
Why is that? It's because in most of the time, what we're trying to mitigate is the risk of stem thrombosis and thrombosis of the native plaques. And we're doing some intervention, modifying the risk, and nobody wants the intervention to be like a trampoline, which just pushed the patient in another trouble, as they say, out of the wood and out of the water into the frying pan. And of course, we have a lot of things that happened for the last 10 years because we have new stands and better medication for plaque progression control. And again, we're treating uh, aging population with more comorbidities. And um, of course, we have a lot of studies now showing that different parts of the world have different uh, genetics that maybe what's appropriate for Europeans is not appropriate for, uh, for example, Asian people. Since long time, we know that uh, bleeding in acute coronary syndromes equals mortality, and uh, especially if you have a um, STEMI, then uh, if you have a bleed, then mortality is quite higher. And uh, this risk is getting high early on. If you have a bleeding, first 30 day risk of mortality is uh, quite high if you have no bleeding, but even to the first uh, few months, this, uh, this risk will be much higher if you have bleeding, uh, never defining what's the, um, the site of the blood. So we know that both bleeding and thrombosis have a time-dependent risk, and they result in mortality. And we know that if you want to treat uh, properly our patient, we need to define which are the high risk for bleeding and high risk for thrombosis in order to reduce mortality. At this slide here, I want to show you that this risk may be a time dependent. And if you see the early stage after stent implantation, it's definitely a uh, risk from atrial thrombosis and the stent thrombosis is much higher. But during the year, is going down and the risk of bleeding is a plateau. I won't, don't want to say that the risk of bleeding is low early on, but just that the balance is different. And of course, we have a, a, a number of uh, predictors for a thrombotic risk, like uh, biology of the patient, for example, a chronic kidney disease or diabetes mellitus, a history of prior thrombosis, smoking, and of course, we have a lot of angiographic predictors depending on how severe is the disease and how, uh, is, uh, how long is the stent that we're using. Of course, we have a lot of predictors for bleeding. And the problem is that some of these are overlapping. For example, if we have a chronic heart failure, it increases both the risk of uh, thrombosis and the risk of bleeding. So what shall we do? I think what we shall do is uh, the art of medicine, and that's a dynamic risk adjustment. In the patient's history, we have to consider breathing, thrombotic risk, but also comorbidities, the side effects of our treatment, because if the patient is non-compliant, it doesn't matter how do you treat it, it will not take the drugs. And of course, in the country like ours, also the price is something that we have to consider. So now we come to the concept of de-escalation. Uh, the concept of de-escalation means that we try to use a very potent antiplatelet regimen early on after the acute coronary syndrome, and later we are moving to the less potent regimen because we don't want to have bleeding, and we try to be on the safe side. We have few options. We can move from the double antiplatelet to a single antiplatelet. Of course, we can switch from more potent uh, anti-aggregation drug to a less potent but proven like clopidogrel. And all these methods are tried in a different uh, studies. And um, I can tell you that um, almost all of them are showing that uh, the escalation have its benefits, but I will continue presenting the data for the strategy concerning the escalation, changing from double antiplated with uh, a new anti-aggregation potent uh, medicine to uh, well-known clopidogrel. Of course, in some patient, you will need to escalate the treatment and not de-escalate. Because when you see the patient after stent thrombosis, you don't want to repeat this event. So the, uh, de-escalation is uh, an option only for the patient, 
when you consider the risk for bleeding to be prevailing over the risk of thrombosis. And the question is how to do it, when to do it, and what's the best strategy. And please remember, this, it's a dynamic risk. So what is true first week after the uh, acute MI is not true maybe six months later. We have a few randomized clinical trials testing the strategy of de-escalating uh, from uh, tecagrel to clopidogrel or from prazogrel to clopidogrel. And what is important that all this uh, randomized clinical trial do this de-escalation after one month of treatment. So all they prove that it is safe, and some of them are showing uh, even a net clinical benefit because of much less bleeding. And why we don't have to do it early on? Because always if you de-escalate, you will have this increase of platelet aggregation. It's inevitable, and we don't want it to be very early on. And we have some data coming from the registry that if you decrease uh, the level of anti-aggregation early on, you will see this uh, uh, rocketing of the thrombotic event, especially if you do it in the hospital. So please, if you want to de-escalate for a reason, don't do it early on. Wait one month and then de-escalate. We have, I will uh, draw my attention on two trials, topic trials. It's um, a trial which was uh, de-escalating after one month of clopidogrel, and the other arm is continuing with the uh, Tiger or prazogrel. And um, this trial is not using any adjustment according to the, to the laboratory measurements of the platelet activation. What we see, if we uh, just switch to the less potent data aggregation regimen with clopidogrel, we have very nice effect and this very nice effect, as expected, is mostly because we have less bleeding and less major bleeding. But I think that uh, we all convinced that this matters. We have also a trial coming from Prague, in which trial which is specific because most of the switches here are done for the economic reason. So the Czech guys are very pragmatic and they say, okay, why pay more money if we can uh, switch to a, a less expensive drug? And what they prove that with this situation, you don't have any punishment. If you do late uh, switch because uh, you want to save some money, it's still safe. And we have also a tropical trial, uh, which is doing the de-escalation based on the plated reactivity. And maybe it's uh, the safer approach, because what they do, they were trying uh, just to find the patients who are good reactors to clopidogrel and to leave them on clopidogrel, and the patients who are not uh, good enough, they think uh, you should skip to Prazogrel, and they say, uh, they, you see they have the same curves and uh, topic trial, so this strategy is even more secure and works, and you have, of course, less bleeding, but no more thrombosis compared to the less potent regimen. So, okay, why do it first month, why not six months, why not third week, we don't know. Actually, we extract these data from the clinical trials, and that's the data we got. So the recommendation with the new generation Draculotic extent, which are very thin struts with our improved technique now that at least for the first uh, month after the PCI, we should stick to this um, regimen with uh, more potent anti-aggregation. And later on, it depends on the biology of uh, uh, our patient, on the uh, total length of the stent that we use, we can consider de-escalation in order to level the bleeding and thrombotic risk. And maybe in the future we'll have to uh, think uh, more uh, during this first year and not just prescribing um, the medication and say to the patient, please come back in one year, I will switch your medication to the less potent one. We have some new data which are not published showing that uh, this is true, even more true for the patient from the uh, Asian region which are relatively a different genetic high, uh, background and uh, low body mass index, I think it's not something that uh, will surprise us. So my final slide, why de-escalate? Why de-escalate? Because uh, you have a big risk or even you have some bleeding, because you have a history of intracranial hemorrhage, and because uh, you feel that um, 
patient biology is uh, such that a risk of the bleeding prevails. Of course, we have to reassess this uh, probably every other month. And not all patients can be de-escalated. Please de-escalate only patients which are stable and when the biology and uh, uh, the data and the common sense are telling you that the risk of the thrombosis of the stent and the thrombosis of the nating vessel is balanced. And now we have this recommendation, which is already in the 2020 European Society guidelines, that this strategy of this escalation is viable after you are doing a thorough assessment of the patient risk. So thank you so much. That's it my <laughs> final. Both presentations are open to discussion. Any comments? Thank you, Professor Velchev. Next presentation is... Zoran Tenkov. Yeah. Zoran? I guess Zoran is not here, so maybe it's your turn. No, now it's my turn. Yeah, I guess so. So the next speech, we are a little bit changing the program, will be about complication. It's, it's always uh, a nice speech to listen yeah. to. Because we learn most of the complications in an attempt not to repeat them. That is called experience. Yeah, so no, I'm a small man, so get it down. Yes, so I call it better look twice, and you will see why. Yes. So we have this year the 44th anniversary of 77 was the first coronary angioplasty. And I, I had also my first publication there. You see it here, yes. Didn't make me too much friends at that time. And I can tell you, yes, with now more than 40 years and more than 5,000 carotid angioplasty, I thought that I have seen nearly all types of complications related to this procedure. TIAs, joke, cerebral hemorrhage, uh, permanent blindness, carotid dissection, seizures with too much contrast material, lost parts of devices, yes, broken stents, failed aneurysm, retroperitoneal bleeding, prolonged hypotension, shock, myocardial infarction. There is always a chance for something new. Prof, be so kind and come to the Angel Lab. It is really good when you get an unplanned call. Do they want it twice? Do they need help? Do they have a major problem? The story. 48-year-old man, symptomatic left ICA stenosis, with positive uh, brain signs with diffusion-weighted MR imaging, ultrasound, uh, systolic flow velocity, Yes, short lesion elongated ICA. You see here his MRI with the lesion. And he has a, a very short lesion. But you see there is also a king of the elongated uh, internal carotid artery. Short dialogue. When I arrived at the Angel Lab, yes, my question. Patient has a stroke, bleeding. No, the patient feels well, but have a look at the angiogram. Fluoroscopy. Oh, I see you have placed the stent. Uh, wait, I will inject a little bit of contrast material. Hmm, the stent is still there, but, but the stent? Yes, that is the problem. Nice stent placement, but the stenosis is still there. And the stented filters are in the external carotid artery. So life is solving problems once uh, Sir Papa has written 
down a, a German philosopher who lived in London. Yes. Yes, used materials in that case up to now. They used a filter wire, a precise stand, and a, a balloon. Yes. And you see it again, yes. Looks very nice, but what to do next? Carotid surgery, endovascular repair. So, because you know, we know that also from cardiology, where you have bifurcational stenting. So I thought, yes, why not do it also in the carotid? That was the concept. But, yes. So first I passed with a choice PTX support, so a little bit stiffer or fortin wire through the stent meshes. But I was unable because I had the idea perhaps I can cut the struts of the stand with a cutting balloon. But I was not able to advance the cut balloon through the stand meshes. I only pushed the distal end of the stand in the direction of the internal carotid artery. You see it here. So, dilatation of the stand meshes. So I started with a very small balloon and went up step by step with larger balloons, even with a very large six millimeter balloon. And then I was really able to bring in an exact stand. I used the exact because it's a fairly stiff, rigid stand. I don't want it to have a soft stand which perhaps collapses where it goes through the stand meshes of the precise stand. And yes, we opened that up to five millimeters. So you see now a bifurcation and stenting. You see also a little bit of spasm there, but it was a good flow and the spasm later on resolved. So how it looks like at the end. Yes, you see the two stands now, placement of the exact stand and dilatation. Yes. Lessons learned. Look for a good projection of the bifurcation. Check your steps before you do something. Know how to fix problems by endovascular techniques. Never feel too safe. There's always a chance to do something wrong. And I've also seen a life case once, yes, where they went up and everything looked back, uh, looked good until they performed an angio. And they had entered not the left carotid artery, but the left vertebral artery which had its origin in the aortic arch, which about 4% of the people have that. So they also brought up everything there, but it was the wrong artery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, philosophy talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I uh, wish to everybody never to have this kind of complication. Yes. But <laughs> I'm sure it happens. <laughs> but yeah, there's always a chance for something going wrong. Yeah, at least I would say for me, because I um, saw this complication years ago, it prevented at least three of my complications. <laughs> because <laughs> after your speech, I started checking every time before I'm uh, opening the filter, I'm checking whether it's in the right artery or not. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, so we are uh, ready for the live case. We're going for the live case now. Okay, do you have a connection with uh, City Clinic? We can hear you, guys. Be careful. <laughs> Okay. Ubojdam do pojka. I'm just going to ask whether he will be presented. Just I will ask him. 
Значить, тут видачні древа не забавно. But we see them. I guess they don't hear us. Something is already prepared and they are doing something. The presentation is not there. No? The presentation is no. Uh, do we have a connection like voice connection with the cat lab? They, can they hear us? Yes, they can. They can? Okay. They're just uh, having a jugular puncture? What? Иво, чувате ли ни? Чувате ли ме сега, Баско? Да, чуваме. Минаваме на английски. Окей, окей, ми свичам на английски. Във факта, ние правилно ще бъде ready да покажем ви един сегмент кейс to the, my presentation regarding the chimney pathology. You probably see now a wire that is entering the aneurysm, the arch aneurysm, so, and now it's entering the ascending cord. We can register that. So, Ivo, that's uh, a dissection or aneurysm of what we are treating? It's a typical sacular aneurysm of the aortic arch. Uh, but, in fact, uh, my colleagues are ready to present for you the case. Okay, that's relieving. Thank you so much. We are waiting for the presentation. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Boychev. I'm going to present you um, today's case. Uh, it's a 72 years old okay. male. Uh, mm -hmm. with hypertension, um, smoker, uh, first admission to the hospital, and our main uh, reason to admit him was uh, shortness of breath and new onset of Lars' voice, also chest pain at rest for the last month. Uh, he had a negative stress test a few months uh, back, so uh, with the medical documentation we had, we saw a dilated aortic arch, uh, and we proceeded with the 
CK angiogram, uh, which was remarkable for a uh, huge aneurysm of the aortic arch. Uh, it was starting just after the uh, left subclavian artery, and it was the reason for his uh, Hoa's voice. So we planned an uh, intervention on him. Thank you, Thank you. Here you can see some of the dimensions of the aortic arch. We had several treatment options. Uh, the first one was open surgery, total aortic replacement with implantation of the supraortic arteries. Uh, the other one was a uh, hybrid intervention with the branching of the supraortic arteries and the implantation of stent graft. And the third one, the one we are going to do now, was total endovascular aortic arch repair. And the plan for today is total endovascular repair with chimneys, uh, two chimneys from the supraortic uh, vessels, one in the brachiocephalicus and one in the left common carotid arch, uh, artery. And uh, the, something that we, I didn't know was the fact that the patient had truncus bovinum. Uh, after the chimneys, we're going to implant uh, stand graft in the ascending aorta and uh, followed by coiling of the left spinal artery. Now I think we can proceed with the procedure in the, in the angel, angel room. Can you tell us what kind of stents you intend to use for chimney and what kind of stent graft you're using for the arch? Yes, definitely. As I commented during my presentation about the chimney intervention for the arch pathology, we are intending to put uh, endurant it's in fact a stent graft from Medtronic utilized. I'm changing now the subclavian sheet. Okay, we are, you probably saw the subclavian sheet 12 French that is already on position. So this will be the, the route to put the endurant graft 16 millimeter from the brachiocephalic trunk uh, to, the, uh, to the ascending aorta. And for the left carotid, for the left carotid, in fact, we punctured, just a second, for the left carotid, you see, over there, we punctured the, the left carotid uh, uh, retrogradely, like I have shown. And we have already the seven French sheet on place. You see the wire is going again, okay, and making a loop on the aortic valve. So we have two wires that are looped over the aortic valve, and they will, in fact, accommodate the two chimneys. In the left carotid uh, will be a Bentley, Bentley that will be 8 by 57 and most probably in order to have enough distance we are going to put telescope in one more because there is no more than 57 in order to have good position into the proximal landing zone. Okay. And in fact, it would be good to enter the left ventricle in order to have good support for the aortic graft. What I'm trying to do now. Sorry, I didn't get it. You are putting uh, stent grafts in the uh, arch artery, so you're putting a bare metal stent. No, we are putting both stent grafts and endurance on both on both sides. We are putting stent grafts. Okay. We are putting stent grafts, and uh, yeah, this is the idea to provide the chimney for the brachiocephalic vessels for supplying the brain. 
okay. I'm in the left ventricle now, and we are going to place here the the Lunderquist that will support the aortic arch uh, graft. Okay, so we are leaving the pigtail into the left ventricle until we are positioning the, the stand grafts, the stand grafts uh, for the ascending aorta to the brachiocephalic vessels. Now we are going to proceed with the endurum, 16 millimeter by 70 or by 90, 90. by 90, in order to be deep enough into the ascending cord in order to provide good, good landing zone. And we have uh, uh, for Angio, for Angio we have uh, uh, we have placed a second femoral approach. In fact, uh, we have six vascular accesses, six vascular accesses, both femoral, one carotid, the left one, one subclavian, the right one, and one radial, the left radial artery because we are planning again to occlude the, the left subclavian artery because it's originating from the aneurysm. And uh, if not occluded, it will fuel the aneurysm and of course it will be not, it's not a good idea. We can show the puncture of the subclavian artery. Yeah. Who think uh, one we can, You see, it's uh, in fact, uh, we, we placed Yet, here is, you see, this is the sheet into the subclavian artery. In fact, we are used from the AAA treatment to put the grafts sheetless. So we, in fact, uh, yeah, it's an uh, it's interesting maneuver. Uh, so we are using the pigtail from the right radial artery in order to, and the, the, the head of the pigtail is within the subclavian artery, and we are using the head of the pigtail as a target for puncture, in order to facilitate... In safety. Yeah, for safety and, and uh, easier way to puncture it. So we are changing now the sheet for the endograft. from the subclavian. Okay. Fortunately, the graft is quite flexible. Please keep the wire. Yes. Yeah, and this is the proof that the end graft is quite flexible. Okay, not bad. Yes, okay. We can make an angio in order to take a look at the bifurcation of the subclavian and carotid in order to have the distal landing zone. Let's go for uh, RAO, just uh, codon. Right codon, right codon, and we are going to inject the contrast uh, in order to, to take a look from here or from, from, from here is better, from the radial approach. Okay, we are going to inject here. Ready? Yes. Go. Okay, we are, we have to go a little more deep, quite deeper. We are, going, we are going more colder in order really to take a look at the bifurcation. Okay, ready? Yes. It's a little better, but still not enough. That's More or less here. Again. No, 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 once again. Ready? Yes. 
Go. Inject. I think right, now it's good. probably yes, probably one millimeter more, but we can do it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's very good. It's good. It's uh, on the carine. In fact, the marker is sitting almost on the carine. So we are going to awesome. proceed with the Bentley, Bentley. graft from the carotid. Then and after positioning the two stand grafts, we are going to proceed with the main, let's say, aortic one. So we are putting the 8 by 57. This is the longest from Bentley, the so-called big graft. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Like that we spoke probably not that we are going to make an angio. Okay, let's go. We are going to proceed now with the aortic graft. You probably saw that the Bentley graft is all already there. The only detail that we have to decide to retract it a little within the carotid because we need at least two centimeters of the graft to be within the carotid in order to provide good sealing of the flow. Okay. So you see the wonder twist wire is uh, in the leg ventricle. You probably know this is the most supportive one of the all supportive wires. We are putting now a large sheet. It's a 20 French? Yes, 20 French. It's a 20 French sheet, femoral sheet, on the Lunderquist. Valery, znam. Ще бъде за кратко, спокойно. Айде, готов си. Браво, това беше. Окей, you see the, the patient is under conscious sedation. Yeah, we are a little bit impressed by having a patient not under general anesthesia. Yeah, it's uh, under conscious yeah, I sedation. never did that, uh, only with local. I must say. Yeah, uh, abundant, abundant local plus uh, conscious sedation. And he's, uh, uh, he's behaving very well, absolutely fantastic. Okay. And the Lunderquist is stiffer than the Amplets? Yes, stiff. Lunderquist is, I would say, quite stiffer than the Amplets. Amplets. So, we are going to proceed now with the aortic graph dedicated for the arch. And uh, I would like to ask Ivo Andreev to look behind the screen of the IT guys. There is a box with the model. With the model of the pathology. This is crucial. You saw probably because of the excellent wire, in fact, the endograph, the aortic endograph went quite smoothly. So we have to precise now the level of the Bentley. I think the aortic graft is not bad. Somebody want to touch it? 
take a closer look. <laughs> yes, uh, we call that a jumping uh, audience. <laughs> <laughs> not only elongated or not jumping. Well, we are going to check now. Because the hemodynamics is perfect, everything is stable, we are going to check now uh, a, a temporary pacing uh, from the left ventricle wire. In case it's successful, we, we will not put venous temporary pacemaker, but we are going to make rapid pacing during the aortic graft implantation through the wire of the left ventricle. Perhaps we should explain that you need rapid pacing, otherwise the blood pressure will push up the it's a, it's endograft a, and then it's not placed exactly in the position you need it. Exactly, this is great point. So this is the zone of the highest possible pressure. This is the ascending aorta. And because of that, we need quite a low pressure, around 40, 60 of systole, in order to have stable implantation of the aortic graft. You yeah. yeah. aren't you afraid that uh, if you have this pressure that low that the patient may be having, for example, a seizure during the rapid pacing? Uh, yeah, it's a good, good point. Good point. We didn't have to this date such a problem. It depends on how long you intend to keep the pressure low In fact, for the, seconds? The aortic stand graft is not, very, it's not very long, so I can guess in probably 10 seconds we will open it. So oh, okay. uh, it, would be, it would be good. So let's try the pacemaker. Uh, put on uh, 120. Like this. SSO. SSO. Like this. The capturing is not good, so probably we are going for a, a temporary pacemaker from the venous access. Okay, let's go for a yeah. Both. We are going to put just a femoral uh, five frame sheet in order to pace, to temporary pace the. during the implantation. And kissing. It's very then, important for the kissing. Uh, what Dr. Stankov is emphasizing is very important not only during the implantation itself of the aortic uh, graft, but also during the kissing maneuver, because it will be triple kissing, so balloon in both brachiocephalic vessels and uh, within the aort. So let's go with, uh, I just put a venous, venous sheet, femoral, and uh, hopefully in several minutes. Let's uh, look uh, behind, uh, yeah, okay. In, okay, do I belong to? Mm 
to this. We can try now. We have now hard arrest. We are still in the atrium, so the pacemaker is working, but they belong. So it's a paradox. Uh, puncturing carotid, no problem, but. <laughs> Moving through the tricuspid <laughs> looks more difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think now we are better place. Job, do it right. Да, ну просто четырс. Much better. Сто шесть. Сто Fantastic. Fantastic. Pace. Pace off. Pace off. So we are ready with the pace. We are ready with the aortic graft. I would like to, to make an angio. Yes. Let's not do that. Push the non noise. Press talk. No, there's the clean thing at all. There is a huge kink of the iliac artery on the right side. And because of that, we have chosen the left for the main body of the aortic graft. Okay, we have now the pigtail on the aortic valve for angio. Okay, in order to take a look at the ascending aorta, ready? Yes. Go. Okay, we have to be a little further down, something like that. And also we have position now the endurance from the brachiocephalic trunk and the chimney. No, it has to be more into the carotid because otherwise we don't have to. Yes, he has to go down far here because the aneurysm is in this elongated arch. Yes. That means what? Okay, not bad. Okay, we are going to open the left carotid chimney now. It's quite deep into, into the carotid, so yeah, it will be quite stable. Okay, the left carotid chimney is open. So, we can put now the next tent for the... Probably, the I would like to try once again the position of the endurance. Colder. 
But you told us that you will extend the left carotid artery chimney so to bring it with the second endograft exactly. closer to the, the, to the ascending order. Absolutely right. We are going to telescope it. Yes. Not bad. Okay. Okay. Ready the station, sir. It's necessary to put the second plan stand from the left carotid artery. Okay. Let's go. Let's go with the stand. Now, do you have a certain reason why you have chosen the Bentley and not something else? Yes. Price. And because the gore grafts are not available in, in Bulgaria. There it's not. We are not an interesting market for them. And the Bentley, that's a big graft. Uh, you open that up to eight millimeters or what? Uh, uh, in fact, we implanted the 8 one, and now we are going to telescope with the 10 millimeter yeah. in order to put the beak into the snow to yeah. have better ceiling. Това е Бентли в другото момент. Да, да. Да не го избутам. Great. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's much better. Yes. Back to the space. Okay. <laughs> In the meantime, we have removed the pacemaker from the left ventricle. Face off. Face off. Very fast. I have the impression that the aortic endograft moved a little bit back. Is that true or not? You are absolutely right. And because of that, we are putting the pacemaker now gently on 120 to have some reduction before going for total opening. Yes, going to the left. It's great. I think it's not bad. Yes. Probably we are going to need an injection. Okay. 
Yes, definitely the chin to the left carotid is there. And also the right one is just on the bifurcation, I mean the distal. So we are ready to start. 160. Now. Now. I'm going to only free flow. Oh, no. Thank you. I love that you do this, but I want to see you. Do you have a lot of them? Okay. Pace off. You probably saw. We can repeat that. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. We are going to put a 12 millimeter balloon now for the endurance uh, graft in order to make the triple kissing. So now we are going to interchange the endurance graft that was implanted sheetless in order to have smaller hole. We are going to put the 12 French sheet and to position the 12 millimeter balloon. So we are putting now the twelve millimeter balloon. Okay, we are removing now the delivery system. Keeping the nose cone. Okay. Okay. Vice French would do this, yeah? Okay. You will watch the ACT that you want to have during this procedure? In fact, we are using in, in the general case 5,000 heparin. Only 5,000. Yeah. And heparin isoline for flushing. It's perfect. Perfect, yes. Yeah. Now we're going with now we are going to put the big femoral sheet instead of the aortic graft delivery system. Valeri Kaksimunche. Bravo Geroski. Super. The patient is absolutely asymptomatic. So we can suppose he has good carotid flow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
the dilator of the big sheet, sometimes it's quite difficult to be removed. Okay, so we are going to put a reliant balloon within the aortic graft. And uh, the other two balloons are already on site. And we are going to be ready for rapid pacing, triple balloon kissing. After that, uh, left supply occlusion <laughs> and final lunge. And close everything. <laughs> and close uh, uh, seven holes. <laughs> For the left subclavian, you will use an amplet or plug, or what do you use for no, the... Uh, for the left subclavian, in fact, we are planning to have uh, proglide uh, on both uh, subclavian arteries and the carotid. I have read that stitch-based closure devices are better for the brachiocephalic vessels. Push-pull. Push-pull. We just, at that moment, we did the so-called push-pull in order to facilitate the balloon movement into anti-grade. Let's go for 120 of the pacemaker in order to have some reduction. So I'll, we'll, Densitometric method. So I think we can now clap the hands, yes. Very. 
very impressive result. Do we lost the connection? We, we don't hear anything. Oh, I don't know if they can hear us or not. But it's very impressive how they can yes, construct yeah. the arch. Yes, when I asked, I was not concerned with the excess sites, how they will close the, the, or the puncture sites, but uh, how to occlude now the left subclavian artery, mm -hmm. which is still connected with the aneurysm. Uh, so when you have cross flow from one side to the other, then you have also but it looks a like reversed a flow in the subclavian, yes? You think it's reverse? At least I, I have a feeling it's not, it's an integrated flow. Here are, yes, that uh, I would like to see the Andrew again if the left subclavian is still contrasted. Because normally when you place the endograft across the orifice, hmm? yes, you place uh, then you block uh, the orifice of the mm -hmm. left subclavian, but here this left subclavian is in the aneurysm sac. Uh, yeah, the, so the question he, is he wants to preclude out of the, the left subclavian, subclavian. And, and for that you can use an amplitude plug or other things. I don't know what he they has available and what they will use. Amplitude plug is very fast here. We only to bring it in position. I see they are doing there something. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I think yes, it looks like something like that. Yes. So. What is the size of the catheter that you need to deliver the amplitude plug? Yes, yeah, because it's a larger amplitude plug. Yes, uh, six or eight French. Six French will be enough. Yes. There are different plaque sizes also, yes. depends on that. Uh, well, it's also the question what is available in, in, in Bulgaria, yes. I have no idea. Yeah, theoretically you can also coil it. Mm -hmm. so, but not with the coils we have seen for the brain arteries, but with these large coils which you can use there. Yes. And but the question is why they don't remove all the gear from the other arteries if everything is fine, so why keep the pigtails inside and everything? No, the only point that I criticize is that they keep their hands too often in the X-ray exposure. So they have to check if they still have some hair on the back of the hand. You know. <laughs> Yes, radiation exposure should not be underestimated, yes, because when you look at the fluoro time with such a complex procedure, you have at the end of fluoro time about, yes, 40 to 60 minutes, yes. And uh, I can tell you, because I'm doing Andrews now for more than 40 years, 
for the ladies is interesting. I have no, no hair anymore at the lower limb because at former times, yes, the apron ended somewhere here, yes. So <laughs> <that, laughs> the hairs are gone. <laughs> so therefore, and Okay, so now we can hear you again. The connection was lost for a while. Probably somebody unmuted us. So you place now a coil there at the yeah. RF? Yes? At the origin of the supply artery. Okay. But I see that the flow is quite. Powerful. Yes, we already discussed it. If you would use an amplitude of black or coils. Yeah, we have discussed as well. To put an amplitude. Okay. Next coil. Let's go next. <laughs> next. Yeah, yeah, didn't go down. Died twice and twice. 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 Yeah. Okay, super. So we are going to put now a really big, big coil. I don't know, no. Yes, and there are different coils, so there are some coils only metal, but other coils are, have also fine filaments to, yes, some yeah, bars. to increase Absolutely. the thrombogenicity. So those are detachable, I guess? Yes, yes, they are, all, yes, they are uh, some are detachable, some you push through the catheter and then they jump out. When Gutenberg invented printing in the 16th century, yes, he could not know that we now have 3D printing and can produce such a thing. Yeah. So one part of the coil or the coil is close to the aneurysm or already in the aneurysm sac and the other one exactly. is at the level of the origin of the vertebral artery and pleurothyroid trunk. Thank you. 
we see that there is a, a, new, a new coil coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It started to compact. Okay. So we are going to put one more. Uh, they're not nice. Hmm? And uh, most probably we are going to push finally down with a pigtail in order to be really on the orifice of the subclavian artery. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Eva, do you foresee any problem removing the pigtails which are pinched along the uh, grafts in the brachial artery? Tell me again. Do, do you foresee some problems uh, taking out the pigtail, which is pinched in the trunkus? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that, uh, the, it gel. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. 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 In fact, uh, we uh, almost never had such problem. Yeah. And uh, we are going now with the pigtail. Ostem alko. To drše tuka. Yes, you can also straighten it by another guide wire sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You go in with the guide wire and uh, so it's a bit more stretched and not so tight curve. Okay, we are proceeding now with the pigtail, pushing the coils. Super. Okay, we are going to utilize now a long pigtail in order to have longer than the guiding cutter. We are using a six French guiding cutter, right Jatkins guiding cutter. And Okay, we'll see this.
Siro na budaco. He's trying to compact the calls with the Yeah, he wanted to push the calls together. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, you see it. Yeah. It works, but he will not be able to push it down to in the, in the aneurysm sack itself, because there is already one call there. And I would leave it at this. I think it's most probably enough, but we can yes. check. Okay. Yes, well, I also recommend to check on it. I have the impression it's enough. Yeah. Valerin, ne dišaj molite, ne dišaj. And it also needs some time until it occludes, yes? So there is a it's little bit better, of... It's much better, you see? Yes, there is a little mm -hmm. bit of... Dišaj I, I think when you wait another two hours, it, it will be Definitely, occluded. yeah. It's very poor, Definitely, though. it's much better. I don't see the vertebral artery anymore here. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, and they're on place, you see, they don't move distally, yes. so it's fine, it's absolutely fine. And it's no problem, even when, when it's not occluding, yes, it can be done in a couple of weeks. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, uh, what I wanted to comment you, that uh, in fact we can uh, uh, make uh, on a second step uh, arm plus a recluder without any problem. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, as I guess, uh, we are ready to close uh, all the holes, and, uh, and that's it. So you have everywhere proglide systems. Yeah. Uh, and the endograft uh, only, was was twenty French, of, uh, twenty French at the groin, or no, twenty four the, French. No. Yes, yes. Yeah, on the twenty French, we are going to close with Manta, the femoral. Yeah. And yeah. we are going to close the carotid access and the both supplement uh, by provide. And femoral with angiosil. And the femoral, the additional femoral uh, with angiosil. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we now give you some applause again so you know that. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are very impressed. Yes, it was really a very complex procedure. Thank you so much once again. And uh, uh, we can, by the way, we can check the pressure. We can check the pressure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is aorta. 97, 114, okay. Mm -hmm. And now I will measure the brachycephalic trunk. Here is the brachiocephalic trunk, absolutely the same. And now the left carotid. And this is the left carotid. No gradient at all. It means the chimneys are working. Okay, good, fantastic. Okay, we are going to remove the gel pigtails. They have two. Stop. Super. Now, can our open cloth division? Shoot this, no? Super. Do you know what that is? 
Mm, the orthograft is with very good opposition. I had some resistance during removing the pigtail. It means it's over the landing zone on a perfect way. I don't know. Now this is the other. Okay, great. And we are ready for Manta. For Manta. Okay, let's start with the large bore. Manta, Manta, Valeri, натискаме. Не искам да те приспиваме повече, защото завършвам. We can ask, yes. Somebody uh, is not familiar with the closure devices and want to see that. Ah, okay, great. This is good because question. it's now dinner time. Okay, so uh, and so it, therefore it, it, that question. Yeah. If we, when you agree, we will close the session. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the manta because it's let's say newer. Uh, let's uh, uh, show the manta. So the locator is already within the artery and this is the plug this is the plug so now with a click the anchor is already inside <coughs> so and we have measured in advance the level so the level of opening the plug inside the artery it's uh, five centimeters in this case so we now anchoring already because we have see here a red marker i'm waiting a little the collagen of the upper anchor outside anchor to activate and finally we make push pull in order okay and you can see now probably you see Yes, it's you can see that. 20 French. 20 so French success. Yes, it's not, not bleeding not and it worked. No bleeding. Yeah. So after assuring that it's not, not bleeding, we are removing the wire and we are cutting here. Yeah. And that's okay. it. Okay, Ivo. That's it. Thank you once okay. again for the nice demonstration. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much for sharing this very complex case with us. Uh, both impressive and for me something quite new. I never saw this uh, even in publication. So thank you once again. <laughs> Our applause. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, waiting for you at the dinner. So thank you so much. And now yeah. I okay. guess it's yeah. time to conclude this session. Yeah. And okay. Galadina is uh, waiting for all of us who want to have some wine. Uh, they, uh, and you, sir. Awesome, French. Some carotid, she's a